So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto was neglected by his family and adopted by Ichiha. Part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And you want the next part of this video? Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 1. The Results of Neglect Naruto Uchiha. The Prophet with the Cursed Eyes Seven years after the Kyubi attack, a tiny shadow was sprinting down the vacant streets turning at random intervals panting roughly from the constant strenuous activity. The only way of actually telling there was a presence moving along the streets was thanks to the lights that casted a shadow as the presence moved past them. The shadow finally came to a halt in an isolated alleyway trying to capture its fleeting breath. That shadow outline took a few moments to capture its breath as it basked in the silence that permeated the immediate vicinity. As the minutes crawled on by, as did the position of the moon's light. Underneath of the heavenly body's glow the shadowed silhouette was instantly dissipated, revealing just who it was. The shadow was now replaced by a boy no older than seven years old, whose jet, black hair seemed to radiate in the moonlight. Even though his eyes were half-lidded due to exhaustion and mental fatigue, his azure blue eyes still glowed brilliantly in the dead of the night. His face was covered in dirt and small cuts that were dried over by blood, thanks to running all over the village all night. His most prominent facial features were three dark whisker birthmarks on each one of his cheeks. His skin was fairly well tanned most likely from his constant movement. He wore a white shirt that had multiple stains and tatters. His cream-colored slacks had holes on the knees and thighs, showing their deplorable condition. His white shoes had holes on the insides as the soles hung down. The tired Ravenette's breathing hitched when he heard the stomping of numerous pairs of feet and loud voices nearing his position. The demon went this way. The day is the day we finally rid ourselves of that plague. Yes, now we can finish what our beloved Yandame started. That last exclamation really got the frenzied mob's blood pumping, as images of the Yandame Hokage entered their alcohol-influenced minds. The young boy could feel the stampede getting closer and closer as he watched the loose smaller objects rattle. Naruto inched back into the furthest darkest corner of the alley and curled up into a ball. Naruto shut his eyes and prayed to anyone that was listening to spare him from the torture of the fox hunts that always occurred on his birthday. The things that occurred to him ranged from being stabbed in the eye to being bludgeoned by any number of blunt objects. Last year however was by far the worst out of all of the fox hunts. The mob discovered that when set on fire his skin would regenerate before the fire would actually kill him, so he needed to stay there as a human bonfire for two hours. They continued the treatment until Naruto begged them for death, but then as usual, the Anbu stepped in and drove the mob away and took him to the hospital. Only for him to lie in the bed and heal on his own since the doctors refused to heal him. He still wondered why he never went unconscious. Naruto was shaken from his thoughts when a shrill shriek alerted the bloodthirsty mob to his location. Naruto looked up to see that the mob had already positioned itself at the only way into or out of the alley. Naruto's facial expression curled into one of disgust as he smelled the alcohol reeking off of the fox hunters. There was a woman with pink hair at the head of the mob who was giving him the nastiest glare he had ever seen. He couldn't understand why she hated him so much he had never done anything wrong. It was like the matron at the orphanage all over again. We finally cornered you, you damn demon. The pink-haired woman screeched out which made Naruto slap his hands over his ears. The crowd was so intoxicated that they didn't even wince when the pink-haired ringleader spoke in an abnormal decibel, which was saying something considering just how loud her screech was. I am not a demon. Naruto yelled back, definitely disputing the woman's false claim. Naruto inched back until his back hit the cold stone wall. He had nowhere left to go this time. He knew he couldn't count on the Anbu who were supposed to be watching him to help out. Yes you are. You killed our loved ones, you monster. The woman shouted at the cornered boy as her anger kept growing. Her eyes only saw her at as reminders of all she lost breached her mind, making her anger grow exponentially. Now she finally had the chance to cleanse herself of the demon plague. I'm no demon lady. My name is Naruto Namikaze Uzumaki, and I have never killed any of your loved ones. Naruto exclaimed honestly because he was only seven he couldn't kill anyone even if he wanted to. He had never even met these people outside of these fox hunts, so he never met their families. The only people that would speak to him were a few of the Anbu, the Achirikas, and the old man. Why, why did the villagers hate him so much? It just didn't make sense to him. It was now that two men sporting Chunin flak jack vests walked out of the mob and stood in front of the pink-haired lady. They both had shaggy black hair with matching grey, soulless eyes that only added to their evil facade, or at least they appeared that way. They both wore smug grins that promised unbearable amounts of pain for the demon in front of the two hidden leaf shinobi. It was now that Naruto realized that these two were actually twins, something he missed in his earlier panic state. 
It doesn't matter who you are anymore, demon, because soon you'll just be a pile of smoldering ash. They bellowed smugly and in perfect unison. If the situation had not been so dire for Naruto, he would have sweat dropped at the ridiculousness of the two goons in front of him. Naruto released one last exhausted sigh as he finally gave up on his attempt to explain himself. Naruto shut his eyes and bit down on his tongue, since there was no way he would give them the satisfaction of hearing his screams of pain. The sadistic twins broke into a fit of chuckles when they noticed the demon's pitiful actions. Already giving up, are we little demons? The one on the left taunted his victim as he grinned evilly. Both men went through the hand signs for the grand fireball jutsu to make good on their promise of death. Then they noticed that a man had moved in between them and was also looking at the demon. They both turned their grey eyes on the mysterious man with curiosity. The man was tall and lean with a short beard, mustache, and sideburns that ended by pointing upwards. He wore a golden cross pendant around his neck that hung down and rested on his chest. On his head was a wide-brimmed black hat decorated by a large white plume on top of it. He wore a long black coat that was left open and it blew with the wind and he wasn't wearing a shirt underneath. The collar and sleeves of the coat sported a flower pattern over the red fabric stitched into the coat. His light purple pants were held in place by a decorated belt and tucked into his large boots. There was a large ornately decorated blade strapped onto his back vertically. The blade was at least seven feet in length from tip of the grip to the point of the blade. The hilt of the blade was a golden cross guard with golden bars extending to the left and right. The handle of the blade was wrapped up with white tape and had a blue bead as the pommel of the hilt. The long blade was midnight black with a very prominent sheen running along the bottom. Overall the blade in its entirety looked like a large black cross. The most noticeable feature of the man was not the blade on his back, but the golden yellow eyes that made them look like those of a hawk. The man released his extremely lengthy blade slowly and without shifting his gaze. Naruto had not seen any of this thanks to having his eyes shut. The twin on the right looked at the magnificent black blade and whistled in appreciation as he gazed at it. That is an impressive blade you got there friend. I can't wait to see it cut that demon, that was when the man's angry hate-infused monologue was cut off literally by the unknown blade wielder. The unknown swordsman with a singular fluid motion separated the leaf chunin at the stomach. The torso and the legs each fell to the ground with separate thuds at the moment of contact. Basking in a bath of blood were the man's intestines which were emptied from where his stomach once was. The brother of the now corpse cried out in equal parts shock and anger as the sudden actions finally settled in. You bastard, why would you do that instead of killing that demon? That was the last word the man would ever utter as the mystery man brought the midnight black blade up and separated the second twin's head from his shoulders. The head fell to the ground and rolled over to the front of the mob, looking at the people there with the same shocked and angry expression telling them he never saw the attack coming. The people at the front of the group each took a step back in fear, except the pink-haired ringleader. The mob looked down in shock at the head that was staring back at them, each with fear lingering in their eyes. A few of the more weak-willed members turned a sickly shade of green and quickly made to exit the alley to empty the contents of their stomach thanks to the grisly scene and the effects of the alcohol. The pink-haired leader moved her mouth to speak but paused when she felt cold steel pressed against her neck. I believe there was a certain law passed in this village prohibiting anyone to speak about a certain event seven years ago. The punishment for breaking said law is death. A death you will be glad to grant you. The man's voice echoed throughout the silent alley, but despite his calm tone, each person could feel the threat behind those words. As if agreeing with its master's words the black blade known as your gleaned. No one in the mob said a word or even moved a muscle as fear paralyzed them when they all gazed fearfully at the blade. All of the poor excuses for human beings were rooted to their spots as each person viewed their demise in the reflection of the blade. It may have only been a few, but due to the thick tension it felt like hours of unbearable silence. Finally when the man with the eyes of a hawk lowered his blade, they let out a breath they were consciously holding in. With that one word command the mob dispersed in a hurry, trying to funnel out of the suddenly too thin alleyway, fearing for their meager livelihoods. The swordsman watched impassively as the rats scurried away. He moved to the two corpses and removed their bodies from Naruto's line of sight to avoid traumatizing the young boy. He turned back to see the raven-haired boy still against the wall trembling. Reaching out he placed a comforting hand on top of Naruto's head, but Naruto flinched in response. The man's stoic expression cracked for the first time since he had entered the village, since this boy who he knew was so terrified. It was his first time in the Hidden Leaf Village, since his Minato Namikaze was nominated as Hokage, and here his son was being treated like this. He could only ask why when he met the boy's father. Also if he recalled correctly today was Naruto and his sisters, Naomi and Narumi's birthday. This also brought more questions to the legendary swordsman's mind. It is quite an alright young one. I will do you no harm. I promise. Mihik's voice was smooth and calm. Naruto felt this man, Mihik's hand rustling through his black hair and letting his eyes slowly open up so he could gaze up at the man with the eyes of a hawk. 
Naruto continued to look into the taller male's eyes, seeking out the anger, disgust, or just emptiness he always saw when gazing into most of the people he had always seen. When he couldn't find it no matter how deep he looked the boy eased himself from under the man's hand so he could look at him unobstructed. Excuse me mister but what is your name? Naruto asked in the most polite tone he could muster, afraid that if he spoke the wrong way he would be assaulted by the swordsman. Mihik smiled softly at the polite raven-haired boy and cleared his throat so he would be heard clearly. My name is Mihik Dracul Young Naruto and I am actually a friend of your family. At the mention his keen eyes could see the young Namika's Uzumaki tense at the mention of his family. Is it not your birthday? If so, why are you not at home celebrating with them? Mihik questioned Naruto in the same soft tone of voice not wanting to rattle the scared boy. Naruto shuffled in place as his eyes found the road to be the most interesting of places at this moment in time. Well since it is our birthday they took Naomi and Narumi out to eat and get ready for the party. Then you. Minato told me to go to my room. Which I did but after a few hours I came out and then I was on my way to the forest, then the villagers found me. Naruto admitted in a soft yet still bitter tone. Naruto personally wondered why he couldn't bring himself to call Minato his father, but shrugged it off for something that would pass without much more thought. He was only seven after all such things were beyond his scope of comprehension. That doesn't sound like the Minato and Kishina I know. Kishina was ecstatic when she learned she'd be having triplets. That didn't change when I helped Minato fight the Kaiubi. When I visit them I will ask them about Naruto without telling them I know where he is. Hopefully their neglect hasn't cost them a son. Mihik recalled Naruto's subconscious correction on how he addressed Minato. If they fail my test then I shall train the boy until the academy years are over and send him back to the village. Mihik had yet to train or even name an apprentice, someone who he could train and teach some of his skills to pass on to the next generation. Naruto follows me. I will take you somewhere that you will be safe from these people. Mihik strained to say the word as in reality they were nothing more than monsters blinded by hate towards what they are using as a scapegoat. Naruto shuffled over a little closer to Mihik when the elder man and the boy walked through the shinobi district. This was where most of the fox hunters lived since they were Chunin and Genin mostly. Naruto hoped that Mihik was strong enough to deal with the people who seemed to live just to hate him. That tension soon faded as the pair entered the clan district where they were mostly neutral to his presence. Neutral to him except the two most arrogant of Konoha's clans, the Hyuga and Ichiha, two of the four noble clans. That was why he got nervous again when they entered the Ichiha compound where the red-eyed humans all glared in their direction. Mihik just ignored them unless they started to glare at Naruto, then he flared his killer intent at them. The discerning eye of Mihik Dracul picked up on their tense behavior and high state of alert, but decided to think on that later. Naruto smiled softly when he saw the familiar house in the center of the compound. Mihik stepped up and knocked on the front door gently as he and Naruto remained in a comfortable silence. There was the sound of a few hurried footsteps before the paper-thin sliding door slid open to reveal a stoic teen. The teen had deep black eyes that matched his hair which was worn in a ponytail, his bangs were short. He had on a black shirt with the Ichiha clan symbol on the back with bandages around his ankles and black sandals. The teen's black eyes widened when he saw who was standing before him. This was Itachi Ichiha the eldest son of Fugaku and Makoto Ichiha. He was surprised because first off there was a swordsman even more renowned than the seven swordsmen of the mist in front of him. Secondly, the person he was getting ready to see was already here in front of him. Itachi Nai. Naruto exclaimed happily as he launched himself at the teen's shins and clung on to the teen. Itachi looked down at Naruto with a curious gaze before he matched the infectious smile on Naruto's face. After getting Naruto to let go of him, Itachi turned to look at Mihik and silently motioned for them to enter. As the two walked by him he shot a glance at two Ichiha conversing while looking his way with their Sharingan spinning. Responding with his own blazing glare, Itachi slid the door closed and walked to the living space where Naruto and Mihik were sitting. Mihik waited until the young Ichiha had taken a seat next to an absolutely beaming Naruto before he addressed him. It is good to see you again, Itachi. I assume all is well in your training. Mihik inquired with an assertive voice that made Itachi stiffen slightly as he was gazed upon. Shifting with unease Itachi mustered the courage to look at his one-time sensei, whose eyes had always unnerved him. This was the man who had taught Itachi all of the basics of what it meant to be a shinobi. He taught him to master basic techniques and also how to control his emotions. However that only applied to negative emotions which always reared up on the battlefield and would cause an early death. Hi sensei I have made sure to always keep my basics sharper than they were the day before. As well as reigning in my emotions when the case calls for it. Itachi responded in an even tone that was nearing monotone. Itachi released a breath he didn't know he was holding once he saw his old sensei nod his head in approval of his choices. Itachi then looked at the curious Naruto who was trying to piece together what they were talking about. And what are you doing here Naruto-kun? Itachi asked the young boy curiously, even though he most likely knew the answer already. 
At the mention of why he was here Naruto visibly deflated into the two-person couch with a forlorn expression. Th they told me to wait in my room for something I didn't do while they took Naomi and Narumi to get ready for the party. I left and tried to get to the forest before it got dark, except the fox hunters were out early. Naruto started to tremble with frustration and anger at how his so-called family treated him. Itachi frowned, already aware of the neglect that Naruto had to deal with which he and his mother tried to fill. Wrapping the boy in a hug, Naruto began to slowly calm in his surrogate brother's embrace. Mihik waited until Naruto was calmed down by the Ichiha next to him before he tried to talk with the boy. Now while he normally would never condone such emotional outbursts, he could understand why Naruto was like this, but he couldn't understand how it felt. He was living in the world's kindest village, he was the son of the Hokage, he had two sisters who were minutes younger than he, and he was the jailer of the soul of the Kaiubi no Yoko. This boy should be considered a saint not a plague. If his parents wanted to lose his love he wouldn't interfere, but that didn't mean he wouldn't help the boy out. Naruto, how would you like to train under my guidance much like Itachi did once upon a time? Mihik asked when Naruto caught his gaze and waited patiently for the boy's response to his offer of apprenticeship. Naruto looked up with shock, no one had ever offered him such a thing before in his short life. Even his so-called parents rejected training him, stating that Naomi and Narumi would need it more than he would. His azure eyes quickly changed from a look of bewilderment to one of pure determination. Naruto clenched his hands and nodded at the swordsman. Mihik allowed a small smile to spread across his face when he saw the fire in Naruto's eyes. Very good Naruto, I want you to go and write a letter to Minato and Kishina and tell them you are leaving. When you are finished give me the letter and I will deliver it and place it in your room. Naruto nodded in response and Itachi told him that there was paper and a pen in his room that Naruto could use to write said letter. Naruto excused himself and left the room to go and write the letter of departure. Itachi turned to look at Mihik once Naruto left the room. Mihik Senpai I also recommend that you let Lord Third and my mother know about Naruto's departure. They are among the few that will be there that actually care for Naruto. Itachi admitted rather sadly that a boy who had such a burden to carry would be shunned. Well Naomi had the Yin Chakra and Narumi the Yang Naruto carried the soul and consciousness of the Chakra monster. They got the power while Naruto received the hatred of the beast. Itachi only wondered when Naruto's expertly crafted mask of happiness would crack into the impassive and detached boy he knew was underneath. And to those aside from those who care for him. I will remember that however I need to ask you what is going on in this village at the moment. First Naruto is being hunted like he is a game animal, and all of the Ichiha are very tense, almost anxious if I had to describe it. I am sure you know what is happening to Weasel. Mihik instantly noticed how Itachi's posture became much more tense than it was before. Mihik raised his hand indicating for Itachi to calm himself before speaking. Itachi's rather volatile reaction only served to intrigue him more. It seemed the village had gotten a little rotten in his time away. My father has convinced the Ichiha to plan a rebellion. He has used the isolation we put ourselves in and the animosity from the civilians to fuel their hatred. They wish to change the fact that an Ichiha has never been Hokage. Father knows he can't possibly challenge Hokage-sama in combat, so he is trying to get other clans to engage in a civil war against the Hokage. Itachi could only question how his clan could fall so far to the point of trying to destroy the leaf, his home. He personally decided he would always be Itachi Ichiha of the Hidden Leaf before anything else. I am the Hokage's information pipeline to the working of the coup, but still Hokage-sama and Lower Third are trying to negotiate with our leaders. Unfortunately the Ichiha elders are so blinded by their blessed eyes to see they would fail. We are still coming up with a plan in case the talks fail. Itachi informed his sensei knowing he wouldn't spill the S-class secret of the Ichiha rebellion. Even if he wanted to, he could never lie to the man, it just seemed that his eyes could even see through his jinjutsu. Mihik took all of this information and nodded his head in acceptance. If the Ichiha will not compromise then I can see only one true solution to the problem. That would be the extermination of the clan. If I know this council like I think I do they will probably try to have a scapegoat, probably another Ichiha. I know you have the skills to do so. This is only a prediction of course, but if it does happen I want you to come to this place after the proceedings. Mihik pulled out a slip of paper from his jacket and slowly handed it towards the team, still maintaining a blank facial expression. Itachi took the piece of paper wondering what it could read. Moving his eyes downward and scanned over the paper and what it read, earning a raised brow. This is in the land of iron is it not? Itachi asked not entirely sure about the location and its reach having only read up on the land a few times. It was a completely neutral country that didn't allow any shinobi in its borders without extreme priority. It was also filled with warriors called samurai who didn't use chakra in the same way that shinobi do. They used it to insulate their swords, and it is said that is where shinobi learned it from wandering ronin. Yes it is. I plan to take Naruto there to train without the annoyance of hunting parties when they eventually notice his absence. The samurai will not allow any shinobi on the land. 
I know their leader Mifune, and I am certain that he will allow me to train Naruto there. That is why I want you to assist in the boy's training. Mihik explained his plan for Naruto, and Itachi had to admit that Mihik was indeed very sharp. Despite how they treat Naruto once his disappearance would be noticed they would no doubt try and recover him. They couldn't even brand him a missing nin because he was basically a civilian. Itachi looked up and nodded silently, stating he would be there. Meanwhile while the two soon-to-be senseis were speaking to each other, Naruto was sitting there staring at the empty paper in front of him. He had been in this position for a few minutes now just holding the pen. His thoughts were moving at a mile per second as he tried to write but just couldn't. Why is this so difficult? Just tell them that you are moving on. It's not like they will find out for a few months. Just do it Naruto. Naruto screamed at himself in his mind. That was until he recalled what happened today on his birthday of all days. Flashback, Naruto was sitting in his room thinking about the day ahead and if he would be included in the festivities. He had learned that if he stayed in his room, he would usually avoid the trouble that was always dumped on him when he left his sanctuary. Naruto smiled looking forward to seeing Hiruzen, Mikoto, and Itachi, since they were the only ones who would bring him gifts and his own small cake. Naruto knew he might have given up and ran as far away as possible if it was not for those three people, the only ones he could consider precious to him. Outside of his room stood one of his sisters Narumi, who was standing there wanting to knock on her brother's door but just not able to do it. She had taken to noticing that whenever the family went out they would never take Naruto. When they were training in Tojutsu she could never find her elder brother. Even at dinner it would only be her, Naomi and their parents at the table talking and being happy. She couldn't even remember the last time they had spoken to each other. That made her heart hurt thinking that she could have pushed her brother away without even knowing it. I hope it isn't too late. Narumi hoped with all her heart she was about to finally knock when she heard something. Oni chan. Narumi turned around to see her sister running up to her with a large grin on her face as she was literally bouncing on the heels of her feet. Narumi smiled at Naomi's excitement, she was always the most energetic between the three of them. Or was she, Narumi didn't know Naruto's personality and that only made her heart hurt more. Hello Naomi chan, what's up? Narumi asked politely with a warm smile on her lips, even though she already knew what she was going to say. It was obvious she was excited about their birthday and all of the new stuff she would get from everyone. It also made Narumi wonder if Naruto ever received any gifts on their shared birthdays because she never remembered him being with her and Naomi. Her thoughts were broken when she heard the sound of something shattering. Narumi saw the pale face of her sister as they looked down at one of their mother's favorite faces in pieces on the floor. That was when Naruto's door opened and out stepped the black-haired boy and looked at the two of his sisters, but before he could question the two on what happened they heard stomping on the stairs in front of Naruto's room. Ashina had heard the sound of something breaking and quickly went up to where she heard the noise. Reaching the top step she immediately looked on the floor where she saw one of her favorite faces sitting there completely broken. Her eyes then trained themselves on the first person in her view, Naruto. What did you do? Ashina screamed at her son, her eyes alive with anger as she glared heatedly at Naruto. Naruto simply stared at the woman who was supposed to be his mother with shock at what she just said. She was blaming him who was clearly just in his doorway when Naomi was right next to the table where the base once sat. What? Was the only thing Naruto could think to say still completely surprised by the entire situation in front of him. Naomi and Narumi each stood there silently surprised for their own reasons that were quite similar. Naomi was shocked because she thought for sure she would have been caught and held guilty for the accident, but instead Naruto was getting in trouble. Narumi was shocked because how their mother could so readily blame Naruto without even asking what happened. Both girls had one thing in common. Neither of them had said anything in their brother's defense, leaving him to take the blame. I don't want to hear your excuses Naruto. You know what, just go to your room. I don't want to see your face. Kishina screamed harshly at Naruto and without even giving him a chance to defend himself, she turned to her daughters with a motherly smile. Come on girls let's go get you two ready for your party. Ashina stated before taking off down the steps with excitement evident because of the thought of shopping. This also left the three siblings standing there in an awkward silence. Naomi gave Naruto a small smile, while Narumi gave him an apologetic look for not standing up for him. Naruto got them both in his field of vision and gave them both a blood-chilling glare that made the both of them flinch. Naruto walked back into the darkness of his bedroom and slammed the door that rattled the pictures hanging from the wall. Narumi stood there staring at the closed door and was about to go and talk to her brother, but then her hand was caught in a firm grasp. It was Naomi who started pulling her down the steps with a huge grin. Come on one each and it is time to get ready for the party. Naomi exclaimed in joy as she dragged her sister along with her. Narumi's view of Naruto's door was fading and she frowned as she got a terrible premonition about her brother. Naruto-kun. Naruto was laying face down in his bed screaming angrily into his pillow after his confrontation with his mother. It always was like this when it came down to his sisters and himself, he was being punished and then rewarded. 
he questioned if this was what family was, it couldn't be what a real family was. It took Naruto about 30 minutes before he stopped trembling with anger and frustration. Naruto wouldn't allow himself to shed a tear because of his so-called family's treatment. Looking at the window Naruto walked over to it and opened it after sparing one last glance at his room. Naruto left through the window and took off into the village. Flashback end but that memory fresh in his mind any inhibitions he had about writing the letter were quickly squashed as the tip of the pen scribbled furiously along the paper. As the words continued to grow Naruto felt a sense of relief sweeping over his body. He stabbed the pen down one final time before sealing it in an envelope Naruto let a satisfied smirk cross his impassive face now that it was done. He glared at the envelope, and in that heated glare, his azure eyes flashed red for a moment, and in that moment Naruto's red eyes gained one black tomo in each eye. Standing up Naruto walked back towards the living space where Itachi and Mihik were engaged in a much calmer conversation, walking straight up to Mihik Naruto dropped the envelope in his hand. Mihik nodded and Naruto moved to sit back down near Itachi who started to talk with a young boy. Walking out Mihik made his way towards where he knew the Namika's family compound to be. Mihik walked down the path inside of the courtyard to the main home of the family of Namikazes. Many flowers were shining brightly in the moonlight, showing just how well they were taken care of, unlike the sun. As he got closer he could hear the sounds of people laughing and celebrating the two princess guardians of Kanoha. Or that was what they were shouting at the top of their lungs. Stepping into the open front door he was greeted by numerous shinobi and civilians, all scattered around the decorated foyer. Mihik was sure that most of these people were here for the sole reason that their efforts would be noticed by the Hokage. Politics always disgusted the man of honor. Looking around he ignored the gaggle of children that ran past him in favor of glancing at the people dressed in ceremonial kimonos drinking sake and joking with each other. He was not able to locate Makoto, nor was he able to spot Hiruzen which made him frown slightly. Hearing his friend's laughter from the crowd Mihik turned to his left where he saw a smaller, more intimate group of people. Minato and Kishina were sitting behind Naomi and Narumi who each were wearing smiles, though the discerning eye of the swordsman could tell that Narumi's was a little more forced than genuine. It seemed that they were the light of this party that people were trying to revolve to but were currently being forced away, probably because they were currently opening gifts. Naomi was almost a replica of her mother in terms of both appearance and behavior, to the point where it was eerie. Naomi's hair was a vibrant shade of red and was straight as a line, the red hair fell just past her shoulders. Her violet eyes were currently shimmering with happiness, just like any seven-year-old's would be in her position. She was dressed in an elegant red kimono that made her look like the child from a family of nobles. There were smaller golden accents to emphasize the brilliant shade of red that she had on for the party. Narumi was also looking every ounce as elegant as her sister did in what she was wearing for the party. The kimono that Narumi was sporting was a very light shade of blue that looked very much like the sky on a clear day. Narumi had similar accents to those of her sister, the only difference being that they were silver. Narumi had long, straight hair just like her mother and sister. Only hers was blonde and slightly longer than Naomi's. Her eyes were blue, not the same blue as Naruto's, no they were like the sky as well. Her eyes were hiding something that made Mihik wonder, but brushed it off. The first person that he had seen give them gifts was Kakashi, Minato's last living student, he was wearing the traditional shinobi garb even at the party. He walked up with an eye smile as he handed each girl two medium-sized boxes that were wrapped. Eventually the two girls got them open to reveal a couple sets of kunai and shuriken. He told them that they would eventually learn shuriken and how they would obviously need shuriken to do so. Both girls gave him a thank you and moved their gifts to the side to make more room for the others they were to get. Two people stepped up to a happy family next and they were none other than the two loyal San and Jureya and Sanadi. Each of them were carrying a scroll in their arms that they handed to each of the children. Mihik watched as the two children signed both the slug and toad contracts. He listened as Jureya explained that the elders of each clan discussed it and agreed to let the children sign both contracts. Naomi had no qualms with signing both contracts without question, while Narumi was slightly more reserved about the whole thing. Mihik turned away and went to walk up the steps to Naruto's door. Opening the door Mihik's face remained stoic however on the inside he was surprised at what he saw. Naruto's room was quite literally the definition of Spartan. The room was not decorated anywhere, not even painted, it was simply the wooden panels that made up the walls of the room. Taking a step into the room the floorboards creaked under his weight, the sound of which echoed showing just how scarcely furnished the room was. There was a bed, a small one, but it was there. It was a simple mattress that had a pillow across the top of it, but there were no sheets or blankets to accompany it. Moving over to a small desk near the window, Mihik placed a letter down next to a dwindling candle which he assumed Naruto used for a light source. With one fleeting glance Mihik left the room and closed the door and was greeted by two people. The first was the last Hokage of the Hidden Leaf and the God of Shinobi, here is in Saratobi dressed in formal clothing as was reasonable. 
the second person was Makoto Acheha, the matriarch of the Acheha family, and one of the few people in the village who treated Naruto like a human being it seemed. This was very convenient for the hawk-eyed man, since he wouldn't need to search for them in the mobs of people. Hiruzen gave Mihik a warm smile that was almost grandfatherly in nature. Oh if it isn't Mihik-kun, I haven't seen you in ages my boy how are you? Mihik gave the old Siratobi a slight itching of the head, acknowledging that it had indeed been a while since he had seen the man. The last time the two had met Mihik was asked to assist in a rather high-priority mission during the war. A few people had been suspicious since he was a wandering shinobi, but when Minato gave him a vote of confidence that suspicion was eliminated for the most part. It has here is in Sama. I have been quite well thank you for asking. Mihik replied in a respectful tone, and before Harazin could respond, Mikoto stepped forth with a glare trained on Mihik. May I ask what it was you were doing inside of Naruto-kun's room Mihik? Mikoto asked, her voice dripping with venom, for as far as she knew he would treat Naruto the same as the villagers did. It was bad enough that his family would either ignore or scold him, he didn't need someone seeking him out in his own room. Mihik knew he needed to calm Makoto down before her killer intent alerted everyone at the party to their location, if that was to happen, then his and Naruto's exit from the village would be much more difficult. It is much easier to leave with someone no one is looking for. Please calm yourself. Mikoto-san Naruto is perfectly okay at this moment. Mihik replied in hopes of calming the increasingly agitated woman. Mihik held a sigh of relief when he saw Mikoto was calming herself down but was still tense and waiting for an explanation. Naruto is with Itachi right now at your home Makoto-san. If you two would follow me back I will gladly explain why. Hiruzen and Makoto glanced at each other for a moment before they turned and gave Mihik two curt nods of their heads. Mihik nodded as well, and the three shinobi walked down the stairs and made their way out into the night. Just before Mihik made it out of the doorway he felt a small tug on the hem of his coat. Slowly turning around the swordsman saw that it was Narumi who had tugged on his coat. Narumi shrunk under the intense gaze of the man's hawk-like eyes, but gulped down the lump in her throat. Taking a deep breath she looked up at the much taller man. See can you give this to Naruto please? Narumi's voice was shaky, and so were her hands as she opened them to show a small black box resting in her palms. She couldn't even bring herself to call Naruto her brother, because never once had she or anyone else treated him like their family. She didn't even know if he would accept her gift after all he had no reason to care about this family. Mihik stared at the girl before he looked at the box. It was clear that she wanted to make amends with Naruto, but he wouldn't pressure Naruto into accepting or denying this olive branch. It would be Naruto's choice to make and be alone. Mihik nodded and took the box and put it in his coat before walking out of the lively house, leaving Narumi standing there looking out into the darkness. Makoto sat on Naruto's left with Itachi flanking Naruto on his right, while Mihik finished recalling how he met Naruto earlier, as well as explaining his plan to Naruto, Makoto and Hiruzen. Mikoto and Hiruzen kept their killer intent in check so that they didn't frighten Naruto with it but were furious with what they heard. Mikoto suddenly felt like using her extensive skills to trap a number of foolish civilians in a Jinjutsu. Hiruzen was equally as furious but that was also directed at his successor and his two students. Naruto was just glad that someone would finally begin to train him to defend himself. That sounds like quite the plan Mihik, but what will you do on the off chance they find you before you make it to Tetsu no Kuni? Mikoto was worried about the boy that was her son in all but blood. Mihik spared a glance for Naruto who did not seem to be worried in the slightest before looking back at the worried Ichiha and equally worried Itachi and Hiruzen. He was glad that Naruto had some sort of love inside this rapidly rotting village that was once the golden standard for shinobi. Mihik leaned forward and focused back on Mikoto who asked the question originally. Both Naruto and I believe that no one will find the note for at least a month or two since we left it inside of his room which no one beside him enters. This will give us more than enough time to enter the land of iron. Everyone nodded since that was more than likely true. However on the off chance the note is discovered before then we will only have to avoid leaf tracking teams which won't be too difficult since I know how they operate. Minato won't risk letting the information that his own son is missing because not only will it hurt his reputation outside of Konoha but Iwa and Kumo will surely try and hunt Naruto down as well and that is something he can't risk. We will be leaving soon so I believe you two have gifts for Naruto here. Hiruzen came forward first and pulled out a scroll from his loose hanging robes and handed it to the young boy. Seeing the confusion on Naruto's face he decided he would clarify what its contents were. That Naruto-kun is a scroll that is not only the cage bunshin as well as a number of for each element. Miha-kun will teach you your element and the benefits of the cage bunshin. I know you'll make me proud. Hiruzen smiled when he saw the happiness flood across Naruto's features. Naruto reached forward and hugged the elder shinobi with all he could muttering thank you into his robes over and over. After the warm moment between the boy and his surrogate grandfather, Mikoto pulled out a scroll of her own and handed it to Naruto with a motherly smile on her face. 
Naru Khan this scroll has a number of chakra control techniques and my personal notes for the substitution. While it is not as flashy as the other ninjutsu out there, the basics can be just as effective. The Kodo lectured Naruto softly as she knew what she was talking about since she was often called the goddess of substitution. She smiled when Naruto nodded his head enthusiastically, then she pulled out another scroll which confused Naruto. This scroll is from Shisui Kun, it has all of his notes on the Shunshin. He told me to tell you he is sorry that he had to miss your birthday and expects him to be just as good as he is with Shunshin. Naruto smiled a megawatt smile and mentally thanked Shisui before locking Makoto in a warm embrace, once she was all too happy to return. They held the embrace like that for a few moments. Naruto enjoyed the warmth Makoto had around her person, while Makoto played with his black hair with a motherly affection. A small group of people also celebrated Naruto's birthday with a small cake which made Naruto tear up just a bit. Everyone had a good time as they talked and laughed even the stoic Itachi and Mihik cracked a few smiles during the proceedings. All in all it was the happiest Naruto had been in years and he knew that he wanted to preserve this. As long as he had his precious people then all the hate and ignorance around him no longer mattered. It was close to midnight as Mihik and Naruto walked towards the village gate wearing white cloaks with a black stripe down the arms disguising them. Mihik suddenly pulled out a small black box and handed it to Naruto. Naruto was confused since he knew it wasn't from the man himself, so he did all he could and opened it. Inside of the box was a small chain with a little ornament hanging from the metallic chain that glimmered in the moonlight. The ornament was made of two that crossed over each other at their tips. The one kunai on the left was a pure white, while the kunai on the right was a jet black. Under the kunai was a red Uzumaki swirl that was connected to the loops on the kunai handles. The initials UN were engraved into the Yuzumaki swirl in black and white to match the above. Naruto lifted the chain up and watched the ornament swirl in the air as he unfolded the note underneath it and read it silently. Naruto-kun, I know we haven't talked much or ever, but I really want you to have this. We haven't treated you like family and I want to make that right. I know you have no reason to accept this, but please keep it, it would mean a lot. Narumi Yuzumaki Namikas. Naruto looked at the note then to the ornament twirling in the air from the chain as he held it between his fingers. It was that moment that the two passed a garbage bin just outside the gate. Naruto paused as he looked between the gift and the garbage bin. Mihik paused as well knowing this was something Naruto needed to do. Naruto's eyes morphed into the Sharingan unknown to both he and Mihik as he looked at the gift and the garbage one last time. He had made his choice. Chapter 2. Duel in the Twilight In the center of the village hidden in the leaves stood the Hokage's tower proudly in front of a mountain with the faces of four legendary shinobi carved. The first face was the face of the Shadai Hokage, Hashirama Senju, who with the work of the clans in the area, banded together during the time of the warring clans to create the village of Hidden Leaves. He amongst these clans was the Achiha clan and their most powerful member Madara Achiha. These two powerful shinobi were opposites in almost every facet of the word, but it was those differences that created an eternal rivalry that spread into the two clans. All of that tension came to a head in one final clash between Madara and Hashirama, in a place now known as the Valley of the End, which cost the legendary Achiha his life. Some time after that battle which rocked the shinobi world down to its core, Hashirama chose his successor for the position of Hokage. Hashirama chose his brother Tabarama Senju to be his successor for the mantle of Hokage. Tabarama too had grown up with Hashirama and Madara in the Warring Clans period, and due to numerous conflicts and his own personality, never was able to trust in Achiha. It was this lack of trust that created many domestic problems between the Hidden Leaf and the Achiha. In an effort to appease the Achiha Tabarama had founded a police force in Kanoha and left it to the Achiha in a way to keep their power in check. Tabarama met his end during the First Shinobi World War, where he sacrificed himself fighting Kumo's Kankaku force. On that team that Tabarama sacrificed himself to protect and entrust the future to was a young Hiruzen Siratobi. Hiruzen was Tabarama's prized pupil and a ninja of extraordinary caliber, it was for these very reasons that Tabarama named Hiruzen the third Hokage just before his death. Under Hiruzen's watchful eye the Hidden Leaf was guided through two more world wars and its Hokage grew in fame with the village itself. As Hiruzen's skills continued to advance he had become known as the God of Shinobi, a title that had not been used since Hashirama Senju's time. Hiruzen's teaching abilities were world class. Hiruzen taught three powerful shinobi how to be shinobi, and these three were Jiraiya, Tsunade, and Arachimaru, who later became known as the Sanin for their exceptional skills. Taking the losses of the third shinobi world war onto his shoulders, Hiruzen decided to atone for that mistake by stepping down much to the village advisor's disagreement. Hiruzen named Minato Namikas, a pupil of his student Jiraiya as the fourth Hokage, due to his strong will of fire, a belief Hiruzen held in high regard. Minato had made his name in the war by eliminating scores of Awagakur shinobi with just Horatian and Rasengan. The effects of the Horatian earned the man the moniker of the Kairoi Senko, which was all the enemy saw before their life was no more. 
it was not only his power that earned him the title of Hokage, but also his infectious personality that drew people to his powerful presence. It was this man who was sitting in the seat of the Hokage behind a desk in his office with his eyes shut in a contemplative silence. Minato appeared to be a tall, fair-skinned man who did have bright blue eyes and spiky, sunshine blonde hair. Minato had jaw-length bangs framing either side of his face. His daily attire consisted of a standard Konohan in uniform with two thin bands each on both of his sleeves, a leaf green flak jacket, blue forehead protector, and blue sandals on his feet. He had also taken to wearing a long, white Hayori over his leaf uniform that had an orange flame pattern around the base of it. Minato was lost in thought, ignoring the ever-growing mountain of paperwork that was gathering upon his desk. It was the day that almost destroyed his entire family in a matter of moments. He learned that day just what it meant to feel pain for something that was out of his control. All he could do was send out the village's best tracker units to search for him, he couldn't even ask other nations for help because of the implications it would have not only on Konoha but Naruto. What was odd was that the sky didn't show any signs of darkness. In fact it was a bright and sunny day almost as if it was glad to illuminate what they saw. That was five years ago. Flashback, Minato and Kashina were left speechless at what they were just told, because if it was true, then it just turned their whole world on its axis. Minato was left to stare at his sensei, Jirei with a mix of disbelief and worry, but just couldn't find his voice. Kashina on the other hand was livid, her hair was swaying like Kaiubi's nine tails. The reason was that her hair was resonating with a tremendous amount of anger welling up inside of her body. Can you repeat that Jiraiya? I am not exactly sure I heard you correctly the first time. Jiraiya took a deep breath and with a serious face, repeated himself not quite believing what he was about to say either. I said that the prophecy has changed. It now says he with a vision shall recreate the world as he sees fit with either peace or chaos. It was only a few days ago that he was summoned to Mount Mayabakizan by the two toad elders. When he questioned them on why he was so suddenly taken away from his research, he was whacked over the head by both Fukasaku and Shima. After that they had taken him to the Grand Elder where he told them about the new prophecy. Sensei you must be kidding. We did all we did because you assured us that either Naomi-chan or Narumi-chan was the child of prophecy. Now you are telling us it might be Naruto. Minato was slightly worried because he was aware of how little they interacted with their son, but they needed to make sure that Narumi or Naomi were prepared for what would be pushed on their young shoulders. Minato was also glad since this would give him time to spend with his eldest child, his son, and help him grow into a great shinobi, but also a great man like the Naruto in Jiraiya's first novel. I am not joking with you Minato. I believe that they are speaking of Naruto in the prophecy, so with that in mind is Naruto here at the moment. Jiraiya asked the two parents because if he was then they could start the training now. Now that Jiraiya thought about it he didn't recall spending any time with his godson, and that actually bothered him. There was no way he was too indulged in the prophecy that he would ignore Naruto was there. If only he knew how wrong he was earlier in time instead of now a month after the three Namikas's birthday, but it was far too late. Kashina was about to respond, but that was cut off when the door to the room they were in slammed open, and an excited Naomi ran in, followed by a more calm Narumi. Two chan Kachan, can we start training today, pretty please Naomi all but begged her mother and father, ignoring the toad sage, causing him to mumble about disrespectful brats. Ashina looked to Minato silently asking for an answer to the question posed to them. Minato nodded since this would be a good way to train all of their children, and he really wanted to see what Naruto was capable of. Yes we will all be training together today, since you will be starting the academy soon. We can't have those other clan's children get too far ahead right? Will you be helping Jiraiya? Kishina asked, ignoring Naomi's excited shout of yes in favor of staring down the toad sage, telling him he better say yes or else. While Jiraiya struggled to manage a coherent response, Narumi raised an eyebrow at the fact that Kashina used the word all. Did that mean they were going to include her brother? She really hoped so because the last time she heard her brother's name was when that man with the sword was talking at their birthday. Does that mean that Naruto-kun is going to train with us this time? Narumi tried to hide the hopeful tone in her voice, but she really wanted to spend time with her elder brother. She let a large smile across her face when she saw both Kashina and Minato nod their heads yes. Naomi was ecstatic that she would get to train with her Nai-san. For some reason when she didn't see Naruto at the party she wanted to train with him or at least talk to him. Anything she was about to say was cut off when there was a poof of smoke in Jiraiya's arms, revealing the toad contract. Well let's go see Naruto so we can get down to business and start shaping you three into feared shinobi. Jiraiya exclaimed in a childish tone that got three giggles from the girls and a shake of the head from Minato, who had a fond smile on his face. The group of five each made their way to Naruto's door with their own thoughts, each revolving around Naruto and each being hopeful about the encounter upcoming. Making it there Minato was about to open the door when his hand froze the moment he came to a realization. I don't ever remember coming in here before. That can't be a good thing. 
Pushing back his apprehension Minato opened the door and the five people entered the room. The group simply stared at the room in a mixture of shock and disbelief, even though the room had very little to stare at. Minato and Kashina looked around at the bare room that was just barely adequate for a human being to live in. Jiraiya noticed the thick dust that seemed to settle in every corner of the room, telling him no one had been here in quite a while. Narumi and Naomi were comparing this room to theirs and suddenly felt very guilty about how their brother had to live. That was when everyone had the same exact thought although unwillingly. Naruto is not here. Minato was the first to break from the trance everyone found themselves in at the side of his son's room. His eyes spotted an envelope sitting on top of the dusty desk being curious of what it could be, he sat down in the chair and opened the letter hoping for answers. His eyes slowly grew wider the more he read Naruto's letter. That is when he realized just how bad of a father he had been. No. Minato whispered as he read the last few paragraphs, though it was easily heard through the dead silent room. Minato's voice drew everyone over to him, and they each began to read the letter over his shoulder. Ashina brought a hand up to her mouth to try and cover the horrified gasp that threatened to escape from her mouth. Tears welled up in her eyes as she continued to read on wishing she could stop, and as she went on, she questioned how she could call herself a mother. Gureya was so shocked that he dropped the toad contract as he read the letter three times over just to make sure his eyes weren't playing tricks on him. Naomi and Narumi were openly crying and silently speaking their brother's name. That was when the notes started to break at the corners as Minato unknowingly started channeling his wind chakra in anger. Naruto's not told of all the beatings he would receive from the villagers on his birthday and how they would call him the demon child or Kaiubi. Naruto told them how he would often end up at the hospital for weeks on end as he recovered only to be visited by Hiruzen or Makoto while they didn't show up once. He even told them how some of the beatings went where they ranged from having his nails pulled out to stabbings and bashings. And. Naruto survived because the conscious had a small amount of chakra and would heal him while unconscious. Naruto then told of how the Anbu who would watch him as they did all of the Hokage's kids would only stop the fox hunters when they were moments from killing him, which left him on the Shinigami's doorstep. He told them how the only Anbu who would prevent the beatings were Weasel and Nico. The only reason the room wasn't flooded with enough killer intent for the whole village to feel was because of the children's presence. Then came the last paragraph of the letter, which broke the hearts of each of the family members. It told them that Naruto had left of his own accord to find somewhere safe for him to live, and he was not sure if he would ever come back to the place he called a hellhole. How could this happen? How can I call myself a mother? Kishina asked openly, sobbing as she thought about what Naruto had gone through. Minato quickly stood up and wrapped his wife in a hug as she sobbed in his chest. Minato too questioned how he could call himself a father when a father was supposed to protect his child, something he didn't do. Narumi and Naomi were embracing each other, crying their eyes out as Jiraiya tried and failed to calm them down. It was official that this was the worst day of the Namaka's Uzumakis's lives, yet the sun continued to shine. Shining for Naruto's liberation. Flashback end. Minato was broken from his thoughts when he heard a knock on the door to the Hokage's office. Come in. Minato ordered watching the door open and his wife, daughters, student, and Sasuke and Sakura entered the room. Kishina gave her husband a bright smile, one mimicked by Naomi and Narumi though to a lesser degree. Akashi gave his sensei his usual eye smile while reaching for his Icha Icha book, which was penned by Minato's sensei Jiraiya. Mission report. Minato asked even though it was a command and he already knew the results of the mission since it was nothing more than menial labor. H and I don't see how cleaning a training ground is a mission. Sasuke said aloud, crossing his arms and closing his eyes, though Minato ignored the arrogant Ichiha in favor of looking at Kishina and Kakashi. Actually it seems that the only one who responded to Sasuke was Sakura who said so cool practically drooling over the Ichiha. Kishina and Kakashi both nodded telling their Hokage that the mission was successful and there were no complications. Minato was about to reach for the demission folder and Naomi caught this. She couldn't handle taking another D-rank mission and Sasuke's infinite arrogance was literally driving her insane. Dusan, can you please give us a C-rank mission? I just can't take these chores anymore. Minato saw that each of the genin gave small nods, agreeing with his daughter's words well aside from Sakura, who looked unsure about the idea. Minato saw Kashina and Kakashi nod their heads believing they were ready for the slight upgrade to their workload. Letting out a sigh Minato grabbed the C-mission folder and skimmed through it before pulling out a request and handing it to Kashina, who stepped up to accept the details. Your mission is to escort a bridge builder from the land of waves back home and protect him as he builds the bridge connecting the island to the mainland. You will meet your client in two hours in front of the main gates. Dismissed. Naomi whooped in joy and quickly took Narumi by the hand and led them off with Kashina following laughing at her daughters. Akashi quickly left in a shunch in the minute the word dismissed was said leaving Sasuke to walk with his fangirl hot on his heels. 
Minato let out a sigh and wondered if he had any normal shinobi in his service, as if on cue, he heard shouts of youth from behind the doors. A figure wrapped in a grey cloak was walking calmly through a path leading to the village hidden in the leaves. The figure wondered why there would be a path that would lead into a village that was supposed to be hidden. Just as quick as the question came, so did an answer, and that answer was arrogance. Over the years Konoha has become incredibly powerful with the Yellow Flash, God of Shinobi, two of the Sanin and Shinobi such as Kakashi and Gai, they became the most powerful village. Titles like such often led to overblown egos, and Konoha was no exception. Why am I coming back to this place? Then images of a few people flooded the figure's mind, along with iconic places such as the Hokage Monument and Tower, along with the business district. Right, I wish for the village to stand despite its unsavory characters. Hm I sound like Madara did before he fled from the village. I guess he and I are more alike than I thought. Naruto thought with an amused smirk as his eyes flashed red under the hood he had covering his face from peering eyes. Naruto may have had no love for its people, but Konoha was still his home, and he would not let the likes of Kumo or I would try and destroy it. Itachi sensei must be getting into my mind more than I like. But is that a bad thing? Naruto asked himself since leaving all those years ago, Naruto learned many things from Mihik and Itachi. His favorite was that stoic appearance. It was like second nature now to Naruto, and he quite liked it that way now people couldn't read him well aside from his senseis. Seeing the large gates of Konoha passing by him as he walked, Naruto let his three Tomo Sharingan fade, leaving cold blue eyes hidden by the shadow of his hood. Naruto decided he would keep his Ichiha blood secret until he determined that it was the right time to reveal it. Naruto caught sight of something that made Naruto wonder if Kami herself just loved to see how much she could make him miserable. Coming his way was Team 7 with Naomi and Narumi talking with each other clearly excited about something. Naruto then recognized Itachi's younger brother being followed by a fangirl while brooding. Bringing up the rear was Kakashi and his so-called mother. Naruto didn't even flinch as he walked by Sasuke who he was a few inches taller than thanks to a growth spurt due to Mihik's dieting. Or at least he tried to walk by him because at the last moment the Ichiha bumped into Naruto's shoulder. Watch where you are going, you loser. Sasuke exclaimed as he turned around to glare at the unknown figure's back. Sasuke's angry shot stopped the rest of Team 7, who were now looking between the man in grey and Sasuke, wondering what they should do. Naruto just kept on walking. He had more important things to do than play with a spoiled child. Hey didn't you hear me? Sasuke, obviously not ready to let the issue drop, Kakashi was about to intervene to stop his new student from doing anything stupid. Sasuke acted first though caught up to Naruto's retreating form. Sasuke planned on teaching whoever it was under that cloak that they do not disrespect an Ichiha, with that he gripped Naruto's shoulder stopping his movement. Looks like you need to be taught a lesson, idiot. Sasuke said rather arrogantly while smirking at the back of Naruto's head. The ears of abuse made Naruto really dislike any form of contact that Naruto did not allow, and Sasuke was about to learn that the hard way. In an instant Naruto had gripped Sasuke's wrist and flipped him over his shoulder driving him into the ground. Without so much as a glance back Naruto continued to walk away leaving Sasuke to seethe on the dirt road. Managing to scramble to his feet, Sasuke glared at Naruto with black eyes filled with hatred for the person he had just met. That's it no one disrespects an Ichiha like that. We are the strongest clan in history. I'll kill you. Sasuke bellowed out in anger and rushed at Naruto's back with his fist cocked back. Naruto who heard the shout didn't react until Sasuke was a few paces away. That was when Naruto spun around and nailed Sasuke in the chest with a powerful kick that sent him back to his team. Sasuke was saved by Kakashi who caught him sparing him any more pain from a hard landing he was sure to take. Team 7 was checking to see if Sasuke was alright, Naruto continued to walk away from them continuing on as if the encounter never happened. That was Itachi sensei's brother. I am not very impressed, but I guess he did get him to accept hatred. You were lucky Ichiha normally I would have killed you for that, but that would make getting into the village next to impossible, since he is one of the two remaining Ichiha. Deciding to save time and get the meeting with quicker Naruto vanished in a murder of crows, leaving only a black feather. Team 7 turned to look at where the figure in grey was standing, only to see that he was no longer there, and all that was left was a black feather. Kishina and Kakashi were staring at the oddly familiar feather with interest. Naomi and Narumi were wondering just who that was because from height he seemed to be around their age. Azuna was laughing at the brooding Ichiha for getting his ass kicked while wondering if he could hire the figure in grey. Sasuke thought he had scared him off something Sakura verbalized getting silent groans from everyone else. With the encounter with Naruto behind them they left for Nami no Kuni with one thought. Who was that? Minato was discussing with his predecessor Hiraz in Saratobi about recent events that happened in Karigakur. Apparently a woman named Mei Terumi had united the Bloodline users into a rebel army to fight Igura, the Yande Mizukage who was exterminating the Bloodline users. 
they had come to Kanoha to ask for assistance three years ago, and after a long council meeting, Minato had to inform May that the Leaf could not assist. The most recent news was what was unsettling to the cage and former cage. It appears that May was able to find most of Kiri's seven ninja swordsmen, and that was the last report they had received. Both Hiruzen and Minato knew that if the rebels had won the war, then the Leaf had a potentially new enemy, which was something they did not need seeing, as Iwa was still less than neutral to their presence. Having another potential relationship like Kanoha did with Iwa, with Kiri was something that Kanoha couldn't afford. Even with Suna's aid if Kanoha was to go to war, they would have to face Iwa, then Kiri would no doubt assist, not to mention what the prideful rakage would do. Even as strong as Kanoha is, it could not withstand a multi-front war with two villages with a chance of a third. Any more discussion was interrupted by a murder of crows flocking together in the center of the Hokage's office. Hiruzen and Minato's eyes widened because they knew only one person who used crows, and that was Kanoha's second most wanted criminal Itachi Uchiha. Kanoha must have become very lax if I am able to enter the Hokage's office just like that. The calm voice came from under the grey cloak that stepped from the crows. Hiruzen and Minato were confused now since this was clearly not Itachi, but this also made them weary since they didn't notice the man until the crows suddenly burst into the room. Nico, well I appreciate what you have done for me earlier in life, it would be better for your health if you remove the sword from my neck. Naruto said calmly, but the threat was not missed by the shinobi in the room. His words were so calm it actually made the anbu behind him, who was indeed Nico, flinch slightly. Naruto was about to react when the blade was not moved, but that was stopped when he saw his father suddenly get to his feet. Naruto could clearly see that he was not happy with what was happening right in front of your eyes. What is the meaning of this? Who sent you here? Minato demanded his voice full of the authority that made him feared as a powerful shinobi. He was not happy that someone could so easily stroll into his village through the detection barrier and nonetheless show up right in front of his eyes. Naruto didn't even flinch at the tone of the powerful shinobi in front of him since he knew all he needed to do was flick the hood of his cloak down. Naruto's face showed nothing but cold indifference as he stared down what could be called the most powerful man in the world. I guess you wouldn't recognize my voice. It has been five years since I have been here and much longer since we had any kind of conversation. Naruto mused as he reached up and pulled his hood off of his head. Minato fell back into his seat when he saw Naruto's face. It was more narrowed out than he remembered from when he was younger. His black hair had grown longer and had almost dropped over his right eye. His eyes that were once warm when looking at him now felt like small icebergs. It hurt his heart knowing that it was his negligence that caused his son to be like that. Then Naruto what are you doing here? Minato asked in shock at seeing the sight of his son who he had not seen in five years. Minato always thought that if Naruto came back it would be because he was forced not because he came here willingly. Naruto could see that Hiruzen was equally surprised considering his pipe was resting on the floor in front of his feet. Naruto couldn't see Nico's face, but there was a very small trembling in the blade that only he could see. As much as he enjoyed watching Minato going through emotional turmoil, he was growing tired of being in the man's presence. I came back to Kanoha to become a shinobi. Naruto stated simply as he moved the blade of Yugao from the nape of his neck, an action the purple-haired Anbu didn't fight. Naruto kept an impassive gaze as he watched Minato's face become hopeful. Naruto decided he would crush that hope right now before it grew any larger. I chose Kanoha because it was the most logical option, seeing as Kumo would try to experiment on my body to see if I had it because of your actions. Iwa would certainly kill me the moment they found out about our relationship, even if it is only because of blood. I do not know enough about Kiri to make an informed decision because of their foolish war. Suna would just hand me back to you because of the alliance and their own lack of power to hold me. Do not think that I came here because of any other reason than that it was the most logical. Naruto finished his reasoning coolly, making Minato's face drop in sadness. Hiruzen seeing that the younger cage was in no shape to respond decided to intervene on his behalf. Well I am glad you are back I would like to know where you think you should be classified as. Hiruzen asked, trying to find information on the enigma known as Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. Naruto was smiling inwardly at the man who was like a grandfather to him, but he still would not let anything out unless he deemed it necessary. Turning his head Naruto kept an impassive look on his face, but Hiruzen could see the smallest spark of warmth in there that widened the smile already on his face. I believe I should be ranked as a genin like all those my age. Naruto stated simply as he looked at Hiruzen then to Minato who had regained himself. He could see the confusion on their faces, no doubt expecting him to try and boast. Naruto silently called them foolish for such thinking. Information could lead to any shinobi's death and he was by no means an exception. I have not been trained in this village so promoting me to anything else would create animosity between myself and the other shinobi. Or they will see it as Minato giving me a promotion and not myself earning it. Naruto clarified his reasoning, managing to do it without admitting he was related to the Namikas. 
Minato was saddened that Naruto refused to call him father, but if half of what that letter said was true, he had no right to ask Naruto to do so. Getting Naruto to be a shinobi wouldn't be too hard considering he was his son, and hopefully this could be the start to trying to build a relationship. That can be managed by Naruto, but I need to ask you to take part in a spar so I can see your capabilities. This is my one requirement. Minato stated firmly as he watched Naruto's hand reach behind his back where took note of the handle that was covered by a guard and handed a small charm hanging from it. That is acceptable. Naruto said simply standing there with his arms crossed over his chest and an impassive gaze. Naruto had already assumed he would need to do something along those lines to gain entrance into the village. Knowing that his opponent would most likely be a jounin he revealed his crows and he would show his kenjutsu prowess. Before that do you know of any apartments available at the moment? Naruto inquired not once breaking from that calm, almost condescending tone of voice. Minato was about to protest the decision and state that his son should live in the Namika's compound. Naruto cut off the predictable response with a raised hand. Since I am to be a shinobi I also am considered an adult and you have no right to decide where I live. My question remains. Minato silently cursed those long-standing rules since he knew Naruto was right about that and there was nothing he could do. I believe there is an empty floor in a complex in the red light district. Minato said evenly trying to see how Naruto would react to living in such a shady place. Minato sighed when Naruto didn't even raise an eyebrow to the information presented to him. I believe Nico here can escort you to the building since here is insane and I have business we need to discuss privately. Naruto reports to training ground 7 in 5 hours for your test. Naruto didn't even nod his head. He turned to Yugao and looked at her expectantly for a few moments before she realized he was ready to go with the two shinobi who had left the room. Yugao and Naruto had been walking in what was an awkward silence for Yugao since she had quite a few questions for Naruto. It had been years since she had seen him as a young boy and knew here he was completely different. She was only 14 during that time, so the Anbu had her watch over the village pariah. She wanted to know where he went for so long and just how much he changed. How are you Naruto? She finally managed to say something and cursed herself for something so stupid. It only got worse when she saw Naruto's eyebrow rise when she asked her question. I am well. Naruto replied clearly not interested in putting too much effort into the conversation. Yugao half expected that kind of answer if Naruto's interaction with the Hokage was any indication. Sparing a glance at her one-time charge Yugao decided to try again to get Naruto to engage in a conversation. Why did you leave Naruto? Yugao was more curious than anything else, after all he was the Hokage's son. He could have had anything he wanted and he would have got it. Yugao was glad to see Naruto had not reacted negatively to her question, he actually kept walking with the same facial expression, making her wonder if he was even listening to her. I left Kanoha to learn how to protect myself. Naruto answered telling the truth, since that was his reason. It was true that Itachi and Yugao did protect him when he was younger, but that was then. Now he could only rely on himself for protection and to do that he needed to get stronger which he did. Naruto had not fooled himself into believing that he was almighty, no Naruto knew he still had much more growing to do. His eyes alone had much more potential than they were letting on. Naruto made sure he would make use of this potential to further his ambitions. The two were now firmly in the red light district and were seemingly oblivious to their surroundings. Well Yugao was because she was busy trying to figure out the new Naruto walking with her. Naruto was highly aware of the people around them going about their daily lives, but he chose to ignore them. Naruto knew that Yugao wanted to learn more about him and decided to help her out in what would seem to be an indirect way. The Hokage will no doubt come to see my test. If anyone had a grudge against him this would be the perfect time to act, no matter how foolish it would be to do so. Yugao turned her head to look at Naruto to see what he meant by those words, but his face gave away nothing. What did he mean by that? Could he be planning to attack Yandame sama No he knows that no one in this village would do so, not to mention Hokage-sama's power is only rivaled by Lord Third. Wait he is telling me that I could watch over Hokage-sama as well as see his battle. Thank you Naruto. That was when the two shinobi arrived at the door to Naruto's flat. Turning to face Yugao with his door to the back Naruto looked into the slit eyes on the mask. Thank you. Yugao. Naruto thanked her before entering his new home. Yugao stood there in front of the door in shock staring at nothing as she tried to make sense of what just happened. Not once during his time with the Hokage did he say thank you. And this new Naruto doesn't seem to say things just to say it. Yugao left in a leaf shunshun to return to her duty of guarding the Hokage, but there was a small smile on her facial features behind her mask. The time limit given had passed for Naruto to take his test, and still Naruto was sitting on the center training post in training ground 7. It was only a few hours from dusk, yet Nato's body language only showed calm despite his opponent seeming to be late. Naruto decided to review his time back in Kanoha which was rather pleasant. 
no one bothered him inside of his new flat even the Anbu who were no doubt watching him were keeping their wits to themselves. On his way to the training ground he did not receive any glares, he even got a few smiles mostly from children, but there were a few from some of the adults. Naruto knew he was only on the receiving end of those smiles because they did not know who he was. Naruto had shed his grey traveling cloak since he was now in the village. Underneath he had a grey zip-up vest with a hood and short sleeves. The vest held an interesting design of nine magatama around the neckline and they were crimson in the collar. Naruto wore black anbu pants with short boots that went up to his ankles. The reason for that was many times in battle Mihik stepped on his toes, calling him an idiot for having such a glaring opening. His hands were clad with black fingerless gloves to protect his hands, a common practice for swordsmen. It seems that they are here. Naruto thought since he could feel a chakra signature in the forest in front of him. He recognized the signature as Yugao's signature, he had become quite accustomed to it since she was the only person he had had extensive exposure to. If Yugao is here then the Yande man the old man are probably near her. No surprise I can't feel their signatures, they aren't Hokages for a reason. Naruto concluded as he continued to sit in a meditative position atop the training post. That was when a second chakra signature flared up in the woods behind him for a moment. That was when a fireball came from the same part of the woods that Naruto felt the chakra burst coming from. The fireball quickly engulfed Naruto's seated position and expanded slightly, swallowing up the entire training post. The ball of flames shrouded the poof of smoke that emerged when the fireball contacted Naruto. Each set of eyes in the premises were trained on the scorched post where there was no sign of Naruto or even a training post. The real Naruto who was sitting in the forest stealthily made his way to a tree behind where his clone was sitting and saw a shinobi sitting there crouched and focused on the field. Yes I am still here. Naruto whispered softly, making the shinobi in front of him tense since he had not detected Naruto's presence. Before he was even able to react Naruto kicked him from his perch and knocked him into the open training field where he dropped down soon after. Naruto saw that his opponent was a tall man with dark, spiky hair, and he was wearing red-rimmed sunglasses which Naruto found useless, considering the sun was going to go down soon. The man was wearing the standard leaf jounin garb with a leaf headband that was tilted to the left slightly. Naruto decided he would get straight to the point since he didn't feel like wasting any more of his time with this useless test. Naruto reached behind him and pulled out his blade that was hidden by his cloak earlier. The blade was a finely crafted katana with a handle wrapped in a black fabric that had diamonds cut into the fabric, showing the white handle underneath. The handle also had a hand guard encompassing it on each side to prevent damaged hands. That also let the charm be clipped on, so it was resting on the back of his hands as he gripped the handle of his blade. The blade was made of chakra conductive metal where the top of the blade was jet black. The bottom of the blade was a snow white color and where they had met it was a shade of gray, much like the coat of a wolf. This was the blade known as Twilight and it was a gift from both Mifun and Mihik. Naruto watched with an impassive face as the wind blew his hood down, revealing his cold blue eyes to the special Jounin Aoba. That was when he saw Aoba pull free his own katana that was completely black from blade to the hilt. While intrigued by the black blade Naruto moved to engage his opponent, bringing Twilight down in a slashing motion which was blocked by Aoba. Aoba tried to push back on Naruto but found that countered as Naruto let his katana slide lower on the black blade and forced it up. Planning on forcing his advantage, Naruto flipped Twilight horizontally and went to stab Aoba, but the sunglasses wearing ninja was already out of his reach. Okage Sama's son is very skilled with his blade, perhaps I should have not challenged him with my own blade. Aoba rushed forward and re engaged the younger raven haired boy in another kinjutsu exchange. The two blades clashed with each other over and over, sparks showering from each point of contact. Both Aoba and Naruto knew that Naruto was getting the better of the exchange and was forcing Aoba back. When Aoba made a mistake in lunging too far with one of his sword swipes, Naruto scored a hit by cutting Aoba across the right arm, making Aoba hiss in pain. Aoba jumped back and looked at Naruto for a moment to see what seemed to be a bored look on his face. Taking his actions as accommodating Aoba glanced down to examine his new wound and he was pleased to see that it was a light cut. It looks like I won't be able to best him in a kinjutsu duel, so why not add a bit on ninjutsu? He hasn't even performed a hand sign yet. Aoba observed not believing that Naruto could do ninjutsu, but what he wasn't aware of was that Naruto just did not wish for that information to be revealed. Meanwhile in the woods standing and watching the fight were Hiruzen and Minato, with Yugao hiding in a tree near them, also watching Naruto's performance. Each of the three Konoha shinobi were amazed at Naruto's skill, especially Yugao who specialized with a blade. Naruto-kun's skill with that katana is exceptional. Hiruzen commented with no small amount of pride in the young man in front of him. If he had to guess Naruto's skill was high chunin to low jounin level. He wondered just who could have taught him such skills, the only people he could think of would have been the samurai of Tetsu no Kuni. 
Of course there was Kumo, but they would no doubt kill Naruto if he asked to be trained by them since he was Minato's son. Yes his sword skills are very well refined, though he hasn't shown any ninjutsu or jinjutsu skills to accompany his kenjutsu. However he is keeping Aoba in a close quarters combat scenario to prevent him from using his ninjutsu while pressing his advantage in the field of kenjutsu. Minato concluded his analysis and could say that was at least a Chunin level of thought. Minato was sure that Naruto could be Chunin if he wanted to, because he could also see the way he carried himself was that of someone who had seen battle. Minato just wondered how much he had seen. Yugao was silently watching as Naruto skillfully countered each of his opponent's attacks and scored more than his share of glancing blows. She could tell Naruto was holding back since it was nothing more than a spar. Amazingly, he is doing all of this with just the base kenjutsu style. He has yet to use any techniques and he has a clear advantage. Yugao thought watching as Naruto kept Aoba on the defensive. Yugao made a note to have a duel with Naruto when she had some off time to see just how skilled he was because it was clear to her, an experienced swordswoman, that Naruto was holding back. Yes Naruto-kun is very combat aware to keep Aoba from using whatever advantages he may have over him. He would make an excellent chunin, but he seems to be content with being a genin. I guess that doesn't matter though since the chunin exams are coming up in a few months. Irizin replied with a small smile since he couldn't wait to see who he considered to be a grandson excel like he knew he would. Hirazin knew Naruto was hiding his skills from them, even if it was to your own village deception was still a shinobi's most powerful weapon. Yes and we will be hosting these exams. Minato confirmed Hirazin's statement with a nod of his head as his thoughts drifted to the Chunin exams. The blonde cage wondered how many teams would be sent to Konoha from the other villages. It would make sense for them to showcase their shinobi to show they were stronger than the other village's shinobi. They made note to expand the stadium they had built already to accommodate what he assumed would be one of the largest exams in history. Minato sighed softly when he imagined the paperwork he would have to do. There has to be some way to defeat the monster known as paperwork. Minato thought desperately. This kid is ridiculous. If this wasn't just a spar I would have been dead many times over. I guess it wasn't wise to challenge him with a sword since it has been a while since I used my black blade. Planting his hand in the dirt, Aoba used his leg to sweep Naruto's legs out from under him. Naruto reacted late and was clipped in the ankle, making him stumble midair which Aoba used to his advantage by slamming a fist into his torso. There that was the space I needed now I can use my. Aoba held a hand sign after going through a small chain of signs. Scattering thousand crows technique. Aoba pointed his finger and hundreds of crows flocked around Naruto cawing and flapping their wings, covering Naruto's vision impaired with loose feathers. Naruto remained calm as he stared at the crows closely as Aoba continued to blind his younger opponent. This will make my black blade strikes next to impossible to see let alone dodge. Aoba thought confidently as he tightened his grip on the black hilt of his black blade. Aoba paused momentarily as we watched Naruto remain stationary as he stared at his flock of crows. Why isn't he trying to escape or at least bat the crows away? Ah now it makes sense. These are not crows but blackbirds. Naruto stated plainly as he turned to where Aoba was last. He couldn't see Aoba, but if he could he would see the shocked visage on his face. Naruto was curious as to why Aoba called them crows, since only Itachi and himself had signed the crow contract. Upon closer examination of these so-called crows Naruto could see that they were actually smaller than a crow and had a colorful patch under their wings. Naruto could only assume he used the word crow to strike more fear into opponents, since crows were known to be scavengers, an interesting plot indeed. I will show you crows. Naruto started making a few hand signs with one hand and crows started to emerge from his body and chased away the smaller black birds. That was the useful aspect of the crows, the smaller summons were actually murders of crows and not a singular one and required small amounts of chakra to call. Naruto stood there calmly as his crows chased off the blackbirds, leaving black feathers to fall around him, leaving him in a ring of black feathers. Naruto stared impassively, his eyes devoid of emotion as Aoba started with wide eyes behind his sunglasses. No one had ever been able to see through that technique before. Naruto did just that but also disabled it. I have had enough of this. Naruto stated to himself as he started to channel his chakra through twilight, but instead of glowing blue like the usual form chakra would take, it was gray with small flickers of red. He didn't want to reveal too much, but he needed to end this before he was forced to reveal a few more of his tricks. Naruto readied his hand and with a single flourish of his hand, the chakra shot from the length of his blade and expanded out horizontally. Aoba, Minato, Hiruzen, and Yugao all were looking at the way of gray chakra with the small red flickers with surprise. That is the technique of the samurai. Ami no, severance from the material world. Naruto's technique went unheard to everyone else, simply because he said it in a low whisper, as to keep it away from their ears. Not that Aoba would have heard it anyways as he was too busy trying to avoid the massive wave of chakra. 
Aoba's only option was to fall onto his back because he didn't even have time to drop on his hands and knees. That was what Naruto needed. Brushing forward Naruto pointed twilight at Aoba's neck with the same cold, empty look in his cerulean eyes. Submit. Naruto said it wasn't even a demand since he knew the shinobi was not foolish enough to say no. Aoba simply nodded his head, swallowing a lump in his throat. Nodding his head approvingly Naruto removed his blade away and strapped it back onto his back and looked up. He saw Minato, Hiruzen and Yugao each standing on a tree stump looking at Naruto. Those three trees were not the only ones cut clean through. The cut went through ten trees in both directions, and at least three rose back into the forest. Naruto waited patiently as the observers walked forward, and Minato dismissed Aoba. Naruto could see the pride in Minato's eyes, and he wondered how the man could feel any pride for someone he cast away like a piece of used paper. Naruto what was that technique? Minato asked, hopefully being able to get Naruto to tell him something concrete. Naruto had not shown anything except crows and a skill with his katana, and he just needed to know more. Maybe all that time with Kishina and his daughters was starting to change his personality. Naruto let one of his eyebrows raise. Did he really expect Naruto to just give away his information? He may have hidden it with curiosity, but he was still fishing for information, Naruto's information. Naruto personally had no plans to share anything with this man, especially this man. It was a chakra flow technique. Naruto stated what they all obviously saw. This way he was able to be vague and say he answered the question. Yugao watched as Naruto spoke with Hiruzen before going to Minato and receiving his leaf headband which was placed on a black fabric. She was amazed by the cutting strength behind Naruto's attack and knew that he had his own style of kenjutsu. All of this only made her want to duel with the young shinobi even more than before. She briefly entertained the idea of asking Naruto about his style, but killed that idea since Naruto was much more guarded than the one from his childhood years. But maybe if she got to spend more time with him then she could try to ask. Maybe not. I will take my leave now. Naruto stated simply when he received no disagreement Naruto's body disassembled into a murder of crows, each cawing loudly as they flew away. The two cage and one anbu stood there in the field at dusk as a small wind blew across the field, staring at the spot Naruto was occupying. Each went their own way, their duties for the day done with, and many differing things to think about. Some of these thoughts revolved around Naruto's return and some did not. All that was certain was that things were bound to get exciting in the Hidden Leaf Village. Naruto was laying on his new bed inside of his new home and was simply staring at the ceiling, his blue eyes still containing that cold glimmer. Even though this new home was just as empty as his old room when he lived with the Namikazes he felt much more at home. Naruto was resting with his hands folded behind his head and twilight leaning on the bed, just in case one of those foolish villagers tried anything against him. Naruto's eyes glanced at the door to his bedroom, but what he saw was all of the doors in his new home. I need to brush up on my Fuenjutsu. Naruto reminded himself since he had slacked off on his training in that art. The first step in my plan is complete. I now have a village to protect me from the other villages. Now all I need to do is grow here in Konoha while keeping an eye out for internal threats. Then once I have the power I desire I will begin to exterminate these threats. For Konoha. Naruto said mentally before falling asleep Itachi's influence showing clearly in Naruto's thoughts. Information. Ami no, divine sword dance. Naruto's kenjutsu style created during his time and Tetsu no Kuni under the tutelage of Mihik and Mifune who made the sword to accommodate the style. The style uses the samurai saber technique as inspiration. Naruto uses his own chakra to manipulate the effects of his attacks, such as shape and spatial effects. Chapter 3. Roaring Waves. The business sector of Kanahagakur no Sato was lively and bustling with people each trying to find the best deals or a place to eat lunch. It was a place that was alive until the dead of night with those who were searching for something. People were chatting and exchanging money for goods with happy smiles on their faces when they found their desired objects or a disheartened expression when their search was fruitless. The people were going through an age of economic prosperity thanks to the accomplishments of their village's cage. Kanoha's economy was the classic case of a trickle-down effect. Minato Namikaze was a shinobi of extraordinary caliber with an even greater legend pinned with his name. It was these accomplishments that brought the minor shinobi villages to Kanoha's doorstep for the creation of economic trading between the various parties. With those trading agreements the influx of goods came and more products and the demand for Kanoha products to bring to new markets. This gave people new creature comforts to purchase and hopes to impress people or just live comfortably. One thing was certain though, and that was there were happy smiles on the faces of the civilians. The atmosphere around the village hidden in the leaves could be called jovial. There was a pair of ice-cold blue eyes that could see through all of this happiness to see the true nature of the people around him. Under this facade of glee and celebration, Naruto could see what was truly lurking there. It was greed and malice just like Naruto was subjugated to all those years ago when things weren't going so well. 
that was when the village was recovering and their hate drew them to the nine-tailed demon fox, or in their eyes Naruto. Even the children at that time who knew not of the pain caused by the fox ignored him and left him in isolation. It was for that blind hatred and abandonment that Naruto had lost all attachment to people of the village, aside from a select few. One visible eye staring impassively as he walked and another hidden by the black hair hanging over the eye Naruto watched these people go on with their insignificant lives. Naruto's figure must have given him an air of professionalism, since the adults would give him smiles as he walked by, which he ignored. The only time Naruto showed any form of reaction was when a group of children around the age of seven or eight stopped in front of him and gave him bright smiles and small waves. That was the time Naruto nodded to them with the faintest of smiles on his lips. Those children had not done anything to contribute to his misery, and for that reason he would acknowledge them. People who had yet to be corrupted by hate have been protected from the world by their upbringing. Now Naruto didn't believe that meant they were sheltered. No, that just meant they had yet to see the true evil that the world could dish out. Natural death while sad did not fill a person with hate. Only the actions of another could create such strong feelings in a human being. If someone lost a loved one or thing thanks to the actions of another or a group their heart would no doubt bear hatred. Naruto just happened to channel his hatred for the betterment of what he held dear, instead of the path of the Avenger. Naruto continued on his stroll through the village's business sector, silently making his way to his original destination. Naruto, after about 20 more minutes of walking at a relaxed pace, made his way into the Achiha district. Naruto gazed around and pictured hundreds of Achiha littering the streets, some nervous about their coup and others living innocently. Naruto could only imagine what the former Achiha clan were thinking when they thought they could get away with something like a revolt. I can tell you what they were thinking. They thought that their eyes made them a force of nature. It was that thought that made Itachi kill them all, for their foolishness. The Ichiha would have had to first mobilize enough assets to defeat Minato, and as much as Naruto disliked admitting that alone would be challenging. Then they would have had to deal with Hiruzen as well before they took over the seat of Hokage. Even if they managed to deal with those two cage, then the Ichiha would have to battle with the other clans in the village to assume control of Konoha. That would be no simple task for another hidden village, let alone one clan. Itachi's way of killing the Ichiha was the most peaceful way of settling the issue of the Ichiha uprising. If he did not then the village would have been tossed into a civil war, killing many civilians. Fools so easily blinded by power were not meant to wield power, and that included the former Ichiha clan. Naruto also grouped Minato into that grouping, since he allowed the civilian and council push around him, the Hokage around, when they were meant to be simple advisors. Naruto found it amusing that out of all of the Hokage, that he respected was the Senju brothers Hashirama and Tabarama. Naruto respected their power however he by no means liked the two legendary senju. It was impossible for a senju and an Ichiha to like each other, but respecting each other was another story altogether. Naruto walked right up to a large clan house and knocked on the door and waited patiently for a response. Naruto allowed his focus to drift to the numerous empty buildings that were towering over the area, casting shadows of the past on the hollow ground. Naruto internally mused how long it would take for the council to try and raise the Ichiha district just so they could make more money. No that would be the reason they would give, but in truth they would do that to try and wipe away the stain the massacre left on the village. Perception is reality. The soft sound of light, approaching footsteps knocked Naruto from his internal observations on the village. Naruto only had to wait a few more moments for the door he knocked on to open up. The person who had opened the door was Makoto Ichiha, one of the few people Naruto would say that he cared for in the village. Makoto had not changed much since Naruto had left. She still had long black hair and black eyes. To Naruto she appeared to have gotten shorter, but that was thanks to the growth he went through during his time with Mihik and Itachi. Naruto's normally frozen blue eyes held an affectionate warmth in them, as Mikoto gasped before pulling the younger one into a motherly hug. Naruto slowly wrapped his arms around the Ichiha woman returning the embrace. Itachi had told him that he was allowed to spare both his mother and his younger brother. At first he was to just spare Sasuke, but it seems the Kishina was able to convince her husband to keep her best friend, Mikoto alive. Naruto was glad to see the woman who was his mother in all facets of the word during his childhood unlike Kishina. Naruto found himself being pulled into the house without a word being said, not that he minded Makoto bringing him in. Soon Naruto and Makoto were sitting on a couch in what appeared to be the living room. The smile Makoto was giving Naruto made his heart warm with happiness and joy. Hanging around with two stoic, serious men like Itachi and Mihik will often cool if not freeze one's emotions. Naruto took no time in returning Makoto's warm smile with a smaller yet equally affectionate smile. When did you get back to Narukun? Makoto asked, barely able to contain her excitement from seeing her surrogate son. I just got back yesterday, but I couldn't visit you because I had some business to take care of with the Hokage. Naruto replied in an even tone since thinking about Minato often drained him of any positive emotions he may have been feeling at the time. 
He planned on visiting Makoto if he had the time, but yesterday just did not allow it. He thought of sending a cage bunshin, but decided he wanted to talk with Makoto in person. Using a clone to talk with Makoto felt just wrong, but that was only because of who it was. Naruto would have no problem with sending a shadow clone to address Minato or the council. That is okay. I am just glad you are finally back. Makoto chirped happily, giving Naruto's hand a gentle squeeze. In reality she was more than glad she was elated that Naruto had finally come back. Her relationship with Sasuke had all but deteriorated as more time passed after the massacre. Sasuke was so set in getting stronger that he dismissed Makoto's credentials, believing she was nothing more than a housewife. Apparently Sasuke was not aware that Makoto was on par with Kishina in terms of strength, and those two were plenty capable Jounin. How was your training? Makoto asked excitedly. Naruto went on to tell her how he and Mihik left the village that night and started their journey for the Land of Iron. Naruto told Makoto how Naruto had taken his first life in the Land of Lightning when he and Mihik had come across a settlement of bandits. Naruto told her how Mihik said that killing someone under his eye now was a better choice than having him doing it later and freezing up something Makoto agreed with. Naruto then recalled his time in Tetsu no Kuni and how he created his own sword style under the eye of Mifune and Mihik. Naruto then told Makoto about how he had three natural affinities which were fire, wind and lightning. Naruto remembered how Mihik and Itachi referenced those three affinities as the three affinities of destruction. Naruto told Makoto how while improving his wind style ninjutsu with Mihik, he learned his fire styles with Itachi. Mifune and Mihik assisted in accompanying those styles with his swordplay. Makoto's smile grew wider hearing Naruto's admission getting over the initial surprise of Naruto having three affinities she offered to help Naruto train his lightning affinity. This brought a small smile to Naruto's face, since he was just going to grab some scrolls to train, but learning from someone with more experience was always far better than reading it from a scroll. Hum Naru-kun now you are going to show me just how far you've come with the scrolls Shisui and I gave you. Mikoto said happily as she pulled Naruto from the house to the wide backyard behind the house. Naruto took a moment to admire the natural beauty that the trees and flowers seemed to give to the training area. There was even a small pond at the far end of the field for what Naruto guessed was water-style ninjutsu. Naruto blinked away the days he found himself pulled into by the nature around him. Naruto focused on Makoto who was standing across from them. Well then show me how far you have come Naruchan. Naruto did not visibly react to Makoto's rather obvious attempt to get under his skin with that insulting suffix. Instead of showing agitation, Naruto brought his hand over one of the crimson magatama on his zip-up vest. There was a small plume of smoke before Naruto found himself with a handful of shuriken. Naruto chucked the five black stars at Makoto, not waiting for results. He held a hand sign and vanished in thin air. Makoto avoided the spinning stars of death easily and glanced to her left where Naruto had reappeared. Naruto quickly threw more shuriken at Makoto. Makoto, who did not have her own ninja tools, could only avoid the projectiles instead of deflecting them. Makoto caught a small flash of smoke from the corner of her eye and turned her head to look at the smoke to see that it was already gone and Naruto was there. Makoto reacted with a kick aimed at Naruto's chest which Naruto could not avoid thanks to his attempt to rise up before the kick was thrown at him. Naruto crossed his arms in front of his chest, using his forearms to absorb the impact behind the kick. Naruto slid back from the force of the kick and started to shake the tingling in his arms away. Your shunshin was nearly flawless, but your substitution could use some work. Now Narukan shows me your elemental Makoto's request was cut short when both she and Naruto focused in on the puff of smoke that erupted in between the two. When the smoke blew away it revealed an Anbu crouched facing Naruto. The Anbu was dressed in the standard Anbu attire with a bear mask. Naruto just knew he wasn't about to like what this man had to say to him. Namakis-sama, Hokage-sama requires your presence immediately. Bear's tone was calm yet insistent. Naruto frowned for a moment before it washed away under a look of boredom that took over Naruto's face. He wondered if Minato already had something for him to do already. Naruto glanced over to Mikoto to see her nodding her head, understanding that he had to go for the time being. Naruto, not even bothering to acknowledge the Anbu, held a hand sign and vanished in a shunshin. The bear-masked Anbu quickly followed suit in a hidden leaf shunshin to return to his duties. Makoto sighed softly before walking back into her home. Naruto formed from a murder of crows inside of the Hokage's office, alerting the man who was his father to his presence. Naruto figured just showing up in a shunshin would end poorly for him, since it was unwise to startle a cage. Once fully formed Naruto found himself looking at a smiling Minato Namikaze. Naruto just stared at the man with an impassive gaze as he brought his arms up and crossed them over his chest. Naruto was irritated that he had to leave one of his favorite people for one he had nothing positive to say about. Minato's smile faltered, realizing that Naruto was not going to say a word until addressed. I have received a request for backup from Team 7. 
it would appear that their mission to escort Tazuna, the bridge builder to the land of waves, has taken a turn for the worse. On the way to Nami no Kuni they were attacked by three swordsmen of the Hidden Mist. Zabuza Mamachi, the demon of the Hidden Mist. A former missing nin from Kurigakur who wields the Kubikurabj, but was reported to be wearing a Kiri headband without the cut across the Kiri insignia. Accompanying Zabuza was Kushimaru Kurayar. We were under the impression Kushimaru had fled from Kiri, but that seems to not be the case. There is also another, a boy around your age who has pointed teeth and blue hair. There is no intel on this boy. Minato relayed what Kishina and Kakashi had given him into a report. Normally I would send another Genin team to back up Team 7 however the other teams are already out doing missions in the fields. That is why I will be sending you to Nami no Kuni, alone. Minato added to see if Naruto would show anything similar to an outward reaction, but Naruto did not even bat an eyelash. Naruto continued to stare at Minato with one cold eye visible and the other hidden by his black hair. I am safe in assuming that you know where Nami no Kuni is. Naruto just nodded his head slowly to his cage's question. Minato waved his hand dismissing Naruto who took his leave immediately via Shunshin, since he had all he needed. Naruto was walking through the streets of the Nami no Kuni, and it reminded him of how he was forced to live when he was a child in Konoha. Most of the food the vendors were displaying were rotten or on the verge of rotting. All of the buildings looked like they were on their last leg, and one good, strong wind would knock over the buildings. Each of the towns Naruto had passed on the way looked much like this one. Naruto found a rather modest-looking pub and figured that he could find what he was looking for there. Opening the doors Naruto took note of the oppressive atmosphere lingering in the pub that engulfed him as he stepped in. Naruto silently listened to the quiet conversations that were going on around the bar. Naruto continued to hear the name Gato in each of the conversations he listened in on. Naruto went through all the information he had learned during his travels with Mihika Natachi. Gato is the business tycoon and shipping magnate. Founded Gato Company and is apparently occupying land of the Great River, along with Nami no Kuni. Possible that he hired the Kiri Shinobi to remove Tazuna whose bridge would break his monopoly. Yeah apparently Tazuna-sen has hired some Shinobi so that he can finish the bridge. That was why he had all those extra people with him. I am just glad he lives at the far east end of the village. That way I'll be safe if they get caught in a Shinobi battle. That last exclamation got a round of cheers from the other patrons. A few of them didn't look too happy with what the unnamed man said. This told Naruto that these people were probably bridge workers under Tazuna's lead. Naruto moved from his spot leaning near the entrance and walked out of the bar since he heard all he needed. It only took Naruto around 10 minutes to get to the end of the small village and that was just because he took his time. Naruto came up to a rather modest two-story home and knocked on the door. It only took a few moments for someone to open the door and greet Naruto. The person who greeted Naruto was a woman with long navy blue hair and a pink shirt and was looking at Naruto questioningly. Hello my name is Tsunami. May I ask why you are here and who you are? Tsunami asked politely as she kept the door partially open shielding part of her body. Hello my name is Naruto and I am here as the reinforcements that the team called for. Naruto explained in his normal bored tone, but there was a politeness mixed in there with the usual monotone. Naruto watched with bored blue eyes as he saw Tsunami's naturally guarded posture visibly relax and her smile brightened. Tsunami stepped to the side and let the door open for Naruto to make his way into the home. Naruto stepped inside of the margin with his hood over his head. He could hear the loud chatter of his sisters and mother in the other room with a more masculine voice laughing. He assumed that was the bridge builder, Tazuna since Kakashi was not quite as scruffy. May they send you all alone? You're no older than the others with Kakashi-san and Kashina-san. Tsunami said with no small amount of surprise that Naruto alone was the reinforcing force Konoha had sent. Naruto chose not to reply to Tsunami's statement since it was clear the woman was ignorant to the shinobi world. In the world of the shinobi there were children younger than Naruto and stronger than Kakashi who was a high rank shinobi in his own right. That wasn't the woman's fault though since Nami no Kuni had no shinobi force stationed within its borders. The only thing they had resembling a military was the daimyo's personal samurai guard. Naruto and Tsunami walked into what appeared to be the dining room where everyone seated took notice of the two. Tsunami took her seat again, and Naruto simply stood behind an empty seat with his hood hiding his face. Team 7 plus Tazuna were all staring at Naruto curiously no doubt wondering who it was. Narumi noticed the handle of twilight and the charm hanging from the grip. Narumi's hands flew over her mouth as she gasped at the same time Naruto pulled his hood off of his head. Kishina, Narumi, Naomi, and Kakashi all had wide eyes as they gazed at the different yet familiar face of Naruto. Sachi. Kishina cried out happily as unshed tears pooled in her eyes, looking at her son who she had not seen in five years. She got up from her seat ready to hug her son, but that was stopped by Naruto who held his hand up. Naruto's cold look got even colder when he looked at his so-called family. His frigid visage made Sakura, Tazuna, and Sasuke all shudder, while those he was looking at froze in place. 
Kashina brought her hand up over her heart which suddenly started to clutch in pain. It felt like she was being stabbed by the blade on her son's back, it felt horrible. Do not even bother trying to attempt touching me because I will react violently to any non-allowed physical contact. Also I am not your son, Kashina you lost that right long ago. Naruto said coolly as he stared at Kashina with eyes as cold as steel. Kashina felt like she would break down in tears right then and there, Naomi and Narumi were not in any better of a state. Sakura, Tsunami, and Tazuna looked between Naruto and the others, confusion evident on their respective faces. Sasuke was just sitting there silently thinking about the confrontation with the swordsman, not caring in the slightest about the drama before him. Bakashi looked at the Namaka's Uzumaki females and could see they were near their breaking point and hoped he could say something to stop this tense confrontation. Now Naruto I am sure you don't mean that. After all, Kashina-sama is your mother and Naomi and Narumi are your sisters. Kakashi explained with a lazy drawl as he looked up from his itch at itch book cried at the. He too was glad that his sensei's son had returned, but what he was saying was just not something you say to your mother. Naruto's cold azure eyes stared at the mask wearing Jounin with cold indifference. It does not matter. This is not the place to discuss personal matters, we are on a mission. However, do not tell me what I mean by scarecrow. Naruto warned the smut reading shinobi with a cool tone that made the man cringe ever so slightly. I have been briefed on the mission already so tell me what your plan is. Naruto continued on a more neutral tone, getting over the irritation speaking with Kashina caused him. Naruto had not even bothered to sit down at the table which could be seen as rude, but not Naruto, no, he saw it as unnecessary. Bakashi closed a book once he saw Kashina staring at him murderously, and with a nervous chuckle, he turned to face Naruto. I am going to work with Sasuke and Sakura and tree walking. Kakashi stated simply getting curious glances from the two genin mentioned wondering just what he meant. Naruto had to fight back a scoff when he heard Kakashi say that the pink-haired girl and the self-proclaimed great Ichiha had yet to master the simple tree-walking exercise. Just what had the academy and Kakashi been teaching the shinobi and using that word was a stretch at best. Naruto turned his cool, penetrative gaze on his two sisters, who had yet to say a word since he had arrived. Naomi and Narumi couldn't help but squirm under the brother's chilling gaze, and what was worse, he wasn't even glaring it was just a stare. Narumi initially thought that Naruto had forgiven them when she saw he had her gift, but that quickly changed when Naruto spoke to their mother. Naomi had hoped to speak to Naruto, but one look at her elder brother had stopped her dead in her tracks. Naruto turned his gaze to his Jounin superior, Kashina, which let his sisters release the breath they were not aware they were holding. Kashina stared back at Naruto with a forlorn expression for an uncomfortable amount of time to everyone else, besides the mother and son. Kashina snapping out of her somber trance, looked at her daughters then to her son, and smiled faintly. I am going to teach Narumi-chan and Naomi-chan how to stay on the water's surface even when it gets stormy. You're welcome to join us. Kashina offered hopefully a hope shared by her two daughters, who were all looking at the same person hopefully. Naruto looked at his family and was not surprised that they were further ahead than the other two. However they were still behind him. I have no need for that training. I will watch the house. Naruto stated plainly and turned to leave the room when someone voiced their opinion. Even if you are the Hokage's son you are still weak. That's why you act like you already know this stuff. Just so you can show off. Team 7's Ichiha stated ignorantly as he stared at Naruto's back with a smirk on his face. Naomi and Narumi were openly glaring at the Ichiha for insulting their brother like he just did. Sakura was glancing between the two worryingly because while she was Sasuke's number one supporter, Naruto was the Hokage's son and something about Naruto that made Sakura very nervous. Naruto slowly turned around to regard Sasuke who was still smirking arrogantly at him. Then a quick flash of amusement invaded Naruto's usual cold blue stare. Oh is that so? Then perhaps I can beat you down. Just like I did yesterday. Naruto suggested with his own smirk as he watched the Ichiha's face twist with agitation. Naruto was amused to see how easy it was to anger what he saw as a spoiled brat. He no doubt remembered how easily Naruto defeated him. Naruto thought that Sasuke was about to leap over the table and try again, but fortunately for Sasuke, Kakashi acted first this time and calmed him down. Naruto turned back around and left the house jumping onto the roof and adopting a meditative stance as the other genin went out to perform their chakra control exercises. Bakashi had taken Sakura and Sasuke out to a forested area behind the house and stopped allowing Sakura and Sasuke to inspect their training ground. There were very tall trees in front of them with no branches sprouting from the sides. They didn't have any more time to admire the trees because Kakashi had thrown a kunai in front of each of them. Bakashi, feeling their questioning looks, looked up from his smut and explained. Here is what you need to do to complete this exercise. Kakashi then slowly walked towards the tree then without even breaking stride, he walked straight up the tree and paused about halfway up the trunk. To complete this exercise you must apply the correct amount of chakra to the bottoms of your feet. Use those kunai to mark your progress. 
The cash he dropped from the tree he glued himself to and walked over to a smaller tree behind Sasuke and Sakura to supervise their training. Sakura leaned down and picked up the ninja too looking at the tree with an unsure look. Sasuke snatched up his kunai and without a second thought rushed at the tree. Sasuke had taken a few steps up three before he was blown off the tree, but not before he slashed the bark. Sasuke got off of his back with a growl as he glared at the tree, as if it was a living human who had just insulted him, a rather comical sight. That is what happens when you use too much chakra Sasuke. Came Kakashi's lazy drawl which Sasuke didn't even bother to respond to. Picking himself up Sasuke attacked the tree once more this time with Kakashi's advice in mind. Sasuke's momentum carried him past his original mark, and Sasuke thought he would make it this time. That was when his feet slipped off the bark and as he plummeted down, he managed to cut the bark with the kunai before it was too late. And that is what happens when you do not put enough chakra under your feet. Again came Kakashi's advice which held both a lecturing and amused tone, seeing the Achiha fall on his head. Sasuke grunted as he righted himself and shot Sakura a glance expecting her to be in a similar state. Sasuke's black eyes widened when he saw Sakura sitting on a rather high branch up near the foliage with her tongue sticking out and looking very proud of herself. Sasuke snarled to himself and tightened the grip on the handle of the kunai. He was not happy that Sakura was ahead of him and Ichiha. That thought alone was just infuriating. How could he kill Itachi if he couldn't even beat the pink-haired Kinoichi in tree climbing, he couldn't. Kakashi had a more logical perspective from his branch. No surprise in that one. Her folder said she was incredibly smart book-wise, so this simple of a theory wouldn't be too difficult for her to grasp. It also helps that she doesn't have the largest chakra reserves. She'd make a fine medic nin. Kakashi's eyes smiled looking at Sakura, who was trying to not let Sasuke catch her giggling at his falling on his face. Kakashi leaned back against the tree he was occupying with a tranquilized smile. I should have passed a genin team long ago. This is pretty nice. Kakashi thought as he went back to reading his smut shamelessly as the two genin under his tutelage continued to work. Ishina, Naomi and Narumi had taken their training to a more suitable location down near the sea, each lost in their thoughts at the moment. The waves came and went with fluctuations in the lengths of their crests, fitting the geographic space named Nami no Kuni. The only objects providing a break in the constant waves were the supports that dove into the water, holding up what had been built of the bridge. The three Kinoichi had not even made it into the water, showing just how distracted they were from their son brother's rather sudden reappearance in their lives. Narumi was the first of the three who was able to break away from the mental trance Naruto's appearance had put them in. Narumi looking at her sister and mother smiled sadly since it seemed that they were in similar states. Coughing loudly to get their attention, Narumi gave them each a small smile. Come on Naomi-chan, Ka-san, the sooner that we get this training done the sooner we can speak with Naruto-kun. Or try to at least. Narumi decided to keep the last part to herself seeing the hopeful expressions on Kashina's and Naomi's faces so that she didn't crush their hopes. Naomi shot her sister a beaming smile, totally agreeing with her words and ready to finish their training. Naomi turned to face her smiling mother with fists clenched and eyes burning with determination. Kashina smiled proud of both her daughters, Narumi for her words and Naomi for her determination. Ishina channeled some chakra to her feet and launched into the air with the chakra enhancing her jump. Landing on the crest of a wave Kashina evenly distributed the chakra throughout the wave's falling motion, allowing her to stay stuck to the surface. Waiting for the wave to hit the bank, Kashina jumped back in between her two daughters. Now you have been taught that to stick to a calm surface, you need to channel a consistent amount of chakra to your feet however an active surface is another matter. If you try that while riding a wave you will be swallowed up by the wave. To stay atop a living wave you must apply different amounts of chakra to the soles of your feet, some places more concentrated, others not so much. Each wave is different from the last, and the only way to learn is through experience. So off you go. Kashina waved off her two students just as a large wave crashed down and created a light spray. Taking a few moments to appraise the waves rolling in towards them, the sisters looked at each other and nodded their heads and jumped onto the waves. They managed to balance themselves on the surface of the wave and for a few moments as the wave swelled down, but then the two Kinoichi sank into the wave. Ishina would have been surprised if they had managed to do it on the first try because of the difficulty of this exercise. Naomi and Narumi climbed back onto the surface and waited for the next wave to roll in. The quicker they got this done the sooner they could try to make amends. Naruto was sitting silently on the roof of the house with his eyes closed as his body sat in a meditative position. He created a few shadow clones to observe the house while he meditated in the peace he was gifted. Naruto enjoyed mediation since it gave him reprieve from the daily burdens of shinobi life. He also learned that it helped fine-tune chakra control. It was these two things that had him thanking Mifune for forcing him to meditate. He could hear everything from the animals rustling through the woods to the waves crashing down on the shores. 
that was when his attention was pulled elsewhere when he felt a small tug in his mind, curious as to why he allowed himself to be pulled into. Waiting until the tugging sensation subsided Naruto slowly opened his eyes and looked at his new surroundings. The first thing he noticed was that his feet were wet, but the first thing he saw were solid walls bathed in a faint orange light. Naruto arched his eyebrow as he looked around taking note of the large pipes that were hanging overhead. Naruto had his suspicions to where he was but knew of only one way to make sure he was right. With his goal in mind Naruto began to wander in the only direction available to him, and that was forward. Naruto continued to walk into the endless darkness, but with each step more of the way was illuminated for him, but just the space around him. Naruto thought this to be his mindscape which was a place in all living beings, yet only few utilized the space. People like Jinchuriki or even the Yamanaka who used the mindscape as a base of operation when scanning the mind for information during interrogations. The strange thing was that Itachi and Naruto had tried to access the mindscape and something prevented them from doing so, most likely the consciousness of the Kaiubi. Finally after an uncertain amount of time spent walking Naruto found himself standing in the center of a large opening where all the pipes seemed to come to an end. In front of Naruto stood a line of thick steel bars that converged on a tag that had the kanji for seal on it. Naruto looked into the darkness behind the bars with his cool blue eyes. Naruto continued waiting until a growl that rippled the water around his feet. The only effect the growl had on Naruto was that it blew his hair black hair back. Once the growl ended a figure came from the shadows. Not to his surprise Naruto was greeted by the sight of a large fox lying on his front paws, staring at him with red, slitted eyes. Naruto looked over the mass of large orange fur and took note of how the kitsune's torso was similar to that of a human, and he even had thumbs. The fox had large ears and what appeared to be whisker marks. Naruto knew this was the Kaiubi, but yet the being of Chakra didn't have nine tails, he had half of a single tail. Naruto simply stared at the legendary creature not showing the slightest ounce of fear. My jailer graces me with his presence. So to what do I owe this honor? Kaiubi's voice was deep like a baritone and reverberated off the walls, creating a dark echo. Naruto simply stared at the sarcastic with an arched brow. Certainly this creature did not take him for a fool. Naruto narrowed his eyes and glared at the beast coldly, he didn't not like being thought of as a fool. Kaiubi meanwhile was slightly surprised at the chilling gaze the human before him was displaying. By no means did it instill fear into him, but it was something to see that look in the eyes of a human. Do not play with me you will find out that I am not one for games. We both know that I do not hold any of your chakra and that you have been keeping me from entering this place. Naruto retorted unafraid of the beast said to be able to create tsunamis with a simple flick of a tail, his voice holding the slightest amount of irritation. I would be or not Naruto would not be manipulated by anyone or anything. Naruto would answer his own calls at the times he saw fit to do so. The Kaiubi just growled darkly to the human's rather flippant response to him, the Kaiubi. That is right, I remember that night very well. Your father and mother took my chakra from me and sealed them into those two girls, while leaving you with nothing but my conscience, quite the parental thing to do for their eldest son. Kaiubi snarled, showing off his glowing white fang to Naruto who stood there motionlessly, his eyes closed. Kaiubi was mentally preparing himself for Naruto to lose his cool facade and scream at him. Naruto opened his eyes revealing to the tailed beast his Sharingan blazing angrily at the beast. Kaiubi's eyes burned with rage, remembering all the times he was hypnotized by those cursed eyes. You will never call that man or that woman my parents ever again or there will be severe consequences. Do you understand Kaiubi? Naruto's voice was dark and dripping with animosity for the two people that the Kaiubi called his parents. Naruto did not care if this was the legendary Nine Tails he would not stand for such Kaiubi decided he would avoid antagonizing Naruto on that matter any further, because with his lack of chakra, he would no doubt be especially susceptible to a Jinjutsu. That didn't mean he would not continue to belittle and insult the human before his eyes. Finally you show those wretched eyes to me. Now take a few steps in so I can gouge out those eyes and crush them under my paw. The Kaiubi demanded of Naruto with an angry bellow that made the water splash up. Naruto brought his arms over his chest and crossed them staring at the Kaiubi with an impassive Sharingan gaze that reminded the Kaiubi of Madara, the Kaiubi had his tails, they would no doubt be swaying about angrily as he stared down at Naruto. Naruto of course did not listen to the Kaiubi's demands, not that he thought the Kaiubi could hurt him without his chakra. So you know of my Sharingan? I guess that would mean you would have looked into my memories. Naruto said more to himself than to the Kaiubi who must have realized it since he didn't respond. Naruto let his red eyes drift to where he could see a half-orange bushy tail resting on the floor, which gave him a question to be asked. Why are your tails missing? The question was blunt with no sign of an ulterior motive. The Kaiubi could not sense anything negative coming from the Sharingan wielder. Not greed, hatred, or even ambition it was like looking into a void. The Kaiubi of course went through the memories of the young human and was impressed with what he viewed. 
despite all of the rather cruel acts that the other humans had performed on him, Naruto had not blamed his presence for the humans' actions. Naruto thought nothing of him, there was nothing negative nor positive. There was only respect for what he was capable of, nothing more. What the Kaiubi did uncover was that Naruto had no love for most of the village his family included. Kaiubi didn't respect Naruto, not by a long shot, but he would answer the question, since the boy was able to see through the world's hatred towards him. Even someone like the Yandame Hokage who your people hail as a legend cannot completely suppress me. Only a god or the sage could have done that. I can feel the chakra slowly resonating in my consciousness. I assume it is because of your proximity to the two sources of my chakra. The Kaiubi started with a prideful tone that faded to nothing more than an informative one by the end. The Kaiubi could only speculate as to what was happening, since he had never had his yin and yang chakra sealed separately, let alone his consciousness in a third body. Naruto nodded his head taking the explanation as fact, since it did make sense that chakra as potent as the Kaiubis would somehow find its way back. Naruto knew he would need help in the future, and what better ally than the Kaiubi. Now he wasn't foolish enough to believe the being of malice and destruction would trust him right away, but he could take a step in the right direction. I see that makes sense. Is there anything I can do for you to answer my question? Naruto offered but held his hand up when he saw Kaiubi about to give in. Aside from unsealing you because then you'd fade without the correct amount of chakra to sustain yourself, and I am not sure how this seal works yet. The Kaiubi of course did not expect Naruto to be so logical when it came to his unsealing, he thought Naruto would have just yelled about how it would kill him. Showing nothing except the usual snarl, Kaiubi stared at Naruto. I grow tired of going through your memories, and I'd like to see the outside world once more. If you tear off a piece of the tag I will be able to see what you see, hear what you hear and feel what you feel to an extent. It will also create a communication channel between us. Kaiubi said while staring at the shinobi with discerning eyes trying to pick up on emotions that weren't there. Naruto stared back into the red eyes of the Kaiubi with his own red eyes, for what may have seemed like an eternity to anyone who wasn't the Kaiubi or Naruto. Naruto let his arms drop to his sides and took a few purposeful strides forward, where a cyclone of water raised him up to the seal tag. Pinching his fingers around the top, left corner of the tag with a swift pull he ripped off the edge. There was a brief flash of pain that made Naruto fall to the floor hunched over in pain. Naruto righted himself once the pain subsided looking at Kaiubi, his red eyes fading back to ice cold blue. Naruto brushed the one bang hanging over his eye away, and it just fell back to its original position over his blue eye. Naruto felt a slight propelling in his mind and assumed that his time in the mindscape was coming to an end. Thank you for the knowledge Kaiubi. I will be seeing you. Naruto waved over his shoulder as he retreated into the hallway he had come from ignoring Kaiubi's rather loud scoff. With his pseudo-container gone the Kaiubi retreated back into the darkness and let himself be claimed by sleep once more since the connection took a lot from him thanks to his lack of chakra. It had been three days since Naruto had opened up his senses to the Kaiubi and he had yet to hear from his tenant. Naruto guessed he was simply taking a nap since he seemed kind of lazy to the young shinobi. There had been a number of interesting moments that had happened over the last three days. One of those moments was when he was confronted by Team 7 seeking answers which he did not give them. Sasuke was not happy with Naruto's choice and tried to force the answers out of him, but Sasuke quickly found himself unconscious on the ground. The other incident he found amusing was when his so-called family tried to convince him to eat dinner with them. Naruto immediately declined and walked away from the group of people that gathered around the table. That was when Tsunami's Brad Inari had come downstairs and so surely proclaimed that they knew nothing of misery and pain. Naruto was sick of listening to the spoiled brat and released a wave of potent killer intent to silence the child. With that Naruto left the house and didn't return until everyone was sound asleep since he didn't want to deal with conversation. Naruto was following behind Team 7 and Tazuna as they walked towards the bridge Tazuna was creating that happened to be the source of these problems. Kakashi had insisted that Naruto follow his orders and join the formation that he had come up with. Naruto refused, reminding him that his mission was to provide combat support while their mission was to protect the bridge builder. Kakashi had not bothered him with his foolish attempts to pull rank since that altercation. Naruto took note of how the mist started to thicken as they walked closer to the bridge. That was when a rush of information hit Naruto. The shadow clone he left to guard the family since it would be logical for someone to try something against Izuna's family. Naruto's assumption proved to be true when two wanted samurai cut through the front door of the home. Naruto's clone watched from behind the samurai as they threatened Inari and moved to take Tsunami hostage. That was when his clone struck, cutting the tanned samurai's hand clean off, making the man howl in pain. The clone was feeling kind, so he retreated outside so that the woman and child would not be forced to watch two deaths. The samurai quickly followed him and the clone used his twilight and quickly drove the katana through the pale man's heart and removed the head of the tan man. 
Naruto burned to two bodies before he went to check on his hostess and her son, Tsunami, and Inari both thanked the clone and hugged him, and that was when the clone dispelled leaving them alone. What is the meaning of this? Tazuna's gruff voice cried in shock, knocking Naruto out of his momentary introspection. Naruto watched indifferently as Tazuna kneeled down by one of the injured workers who muttered something Naruto did not care to hear. Kakashi had revealed his Sharingan and Kashina and readied herself as well. The untrained Gen and all started to look around nervously while Naruto calmly readied Twilight. Naruto knew this would be a good test of his swordsmanship. A duel with any of the ninja swordsmen of the Hidden Mist would be a good test to see how far he had come. Naruto and the rest of the Konohan Inn watched as four figures came to in the mist. Arrogant fools. Naruto thought seeing their intent for a head-on collision. Well, well Sharingan no Kakashi it seems you were off about my death. Those eyes can't read the future, but I can tell you your future. That future is a death at the end of my executioner's blade. A man with no eyebrows and his mouth covered in white bandaging stated firmly pointing his huge blade at Kakashi. Naruto knew from the sword alone that this man was the demon of the hidden mist, Zabuza Mamachi. Kakashi of course did not respond to the swordsman and just stared at the man. A second figure came out of the mist standing to Zabuza's right. The man had blonde hair much like Narumi's hair, and his face was hidden by a Karigakur Hunter Shinobi mask. The man was twirling a large needle menacingly, but everyone on the bridge knew that was no simple needle. This long sword was known as the Nabari or the Sewing Needle. It was called such because of the thread in the base of the sword that was used to stitch together what the blade would pierce. Kushimaru was currently smirking as he stared at Kashina from behind his mask. I owe you for that punch you gave me last time, bitch. Kushimaru finished in a shrill laugh that made Kashina frown at the maniacal blonde swordsman. The next people to emerge were around Naruto's and the rest of the genin's age, one boy and the other a girl. The boy was at Naruto's height and had short blue hair and blue eyes placed behind a pair of glasses connected to ear protectors. He had blue pinstripes on his shirt and camouflage pants with a holster carrying a large blade. Naruto knew the blade, he made sure to know all the famous blades. That sword was known as Hiramekure, often called a twin sword because of its shape. It had two indentations at the base creating a cross guard and was also extremely heavy. The hole on top of the blade would emanate the user's chakra coating the blade, allowing the chakra to take any shape. The girl next to him did not draw any attention aside from the fact that she was in the full Kiri Hunter Nin suit. Naruto, can you handle the boy with the blue hair? Kakashi asked quietly, still staring at Zabuza who was smirking behind his bandaging. Naruto did not reply. He was too busy eyeing the blue-haired boy who was squirming under Naruto's intense gaze. Kishina was about to repeat the question when suddenly there was a burst of air that blew from where Naruto was standing. The Juro's eyes widened when he felt pain in his stomach and was launched to the far end of the bridge. No one was ready for Naruto's sudden burst of speed. Zabuza looked at Kakashi, his brow ridge raised as he looked at the haddock. Kakashi looked over behind Zabuza's shoulder where Naruto and the blue-haired boy were before they were surrounded by the mist. Kakashi focused back on his opponent, his Sharingan ready to trace any slight movements. It doesn't matter who Zabuza is. All that matters is that he is your enemy. Kakashi replied tersely as he waited for his opponent to strike. Zabuza frowned at Kakashi's answer, clearly intrigued by the kid who managed to get so close to him so quickly. Zabuza wasn't too worried since he would have his fun with the brat after he dealt with the fabled Sharingan wielder. Kashina who had to leap back to avoid having the Nabari sewed through her foot turned her attention to her genin students, seeing how on edge they were, she shot them a disarming smile. You four protect the bridge builder and we will take care of these men. Kashina's voice, though comforting, was a firm order to her students. With her piece said Kashina launched towards Kushimaru before the mist got too thick and hampered her vision, from within the mist there are numerous occasions where metal contacting metals rang out. Kashina managed to stop a few of Kushimaru's forward jabs with the standard leaf tanto. Tabuza brought his executioner's blade down on Kakashi to cleave the leaf jonin in two pieces, but only found the ground of the bridge. Haku. Zabuza barked out as Kakashi tried to put space between him and Zabuza. Not a moment later the girl who was dressed as a Kiri Hunter Nin appeared beside the shinobi. I want you to take care of those kids, then kill the bridge builder, do you understand? The young Kanoichi uttered a quick affirmative and asked Sunshine to go do battle with the genin. Kakashi wanted to help his students, but Zabuza was having none of it as he used the reach of the large cleaver to his advantage. Kakashi could feel the bridge material splinter under the force behind Zabuza's attack, making the mask shinobi glad he evaded. Copying the chain of hand seals Zabuza was going through, both shinobi launched a dragon of water at each other. The dragons were evenly matched, and when they collided they soaked Zabuza and Kakashi. Rushing forward again Zabuza charged in with his cleaver overhead and ready to strike. Fortunately Kakashi struck first by stabbing Zabuza in the heart just before the giant sword contacted his shoulder. Zabuza turned into a puddle of water upon being stabbed by Kakashi's kunai. A water clone. 
Kishina too was having a difficult time with the blonde swordsman from the village hidden in the mist. Kishina was trying to land a punch to the thin shinobi using her super strength that she learned from Tsunade, though not quite at the Sanin's level. However Kushimaru was excellent at avoiding strikes, something he needed to be able to do since his weapon provided little defense. Kishina looked to the truly evil shinobi's hands and found them empty, however, she could not think of this development because there was something digging into her shins. Looking down, the female Yuzumaki spotted a shimmer break the veil of mist that surrounded the two ninja. Chmtm nim. Earth spider sewing. Kishina created a shadow clone and had to throw her into the air, avoiding having her knees being removed from her shins. Kishina watched as Kushimaru pulled on the thread and returned the needle to his grip for his next attack. Kishina dropped down but landed on top of the thin threads that Kushimaru spread throughout the space. Man I haven't been out in the field in so long. It is a good thing that I had Minato help me with my wind ninjutsu. Kishina went through her hand seals at a very impressive pace for one who had not been on active duty for some time. Wind release. Great breakthrough. Kishina slammed into the blonde-haired swordsman and knocked him back, but also cleared up the battlefield, effectively dispersing the mist. Kakashi joined back up with Kishina, both of which were slightly winded for different reasons. Zabuza and Kushimaru also took this time to regroup with each other. Zabuza had cuts on his arms and across his torso, from a few close exchanges with Kakashi's kunai. Kushimaru's mask was chipped at the jawline, revealing the man's angular chin. The wind Kishina had used had blown some thread that was loose up and cut Kushimaru. The battle had taken its toll on each combatant. Kishina seeing a new opponent charged at the eyebrow-deficient shinobi with her fist reared back to strike. Zabuza was questioning the sanity of the red-haired woman until something told him to block the punch. Trusting his instinct the Kiri shinobi flipped his blade and blocked Kishina's chakra-enhanced strike with the flat side of his executioner's blade. Zabuza felt the impact being absorbed by his forearms and felt that his blade would crack when it started to show small spider webs like cracks. However the blade was crafted well enough to avoid being shattered, but another few strikes like that would surely destroy the blade. That was just ridiculous. If I let the blade take any more hits like that one, I won't be able to fix the blade with blood. That only works when there is a piece of the weapon connected to the handle. Pieces on the ground just won't do. Zabuza ranted in his mind as he grunted, swinging his blade at Kishina, forcing her to retreat momentarily. Creating three Mizubunshin, Zabuza gave them silent orders to attack Kishina in a triangular formation. Zabuza watched on as his three water clones each converged on Kishina simultaneously with their replicas of the executioner's blade, rose overhead and ready to strike. Water release. Spinning water. Just before the Zabuza clones could carve into her flesh, Kishina began to spin in a clockwise motion with her hand open. Not a moment later small specks of water spun with her steadily growing until the water formed a dome that was spinning and compact. The water quickly swallowed up the clones and they would be assaulted. The water continued to rotate violently until it dispersed revealing a glaring Kishina. Thank goodness that Hitomi-chan taught me the basic principles of the Katen before she passed on. Kishina thought with a sense of relief as she pulled a few kunai from the holster on her thigh and coated them with water. Chmtm nim. Falling threads. The Kashi watched as the black wire-like thread from the Nabari fell towards him with great speed while covering a great area. Kakashi went through signs with his hands and suddenly a small concentrated ball of fire spewed out from under his mask and at the incoming threading. Unfortunately the ball of fire could not burn through the chakra enhanced thread which led to the scarecrow shinobi being sliced by the wires. Kushimaru let out a high-pitched giggle, seeing the shocked look in the eyes of the Sharingan shinobi. Kushimaru's celebration was cut short as he received a strong shock. Surprised Kushimaru looked to see an electrical current traveling down the metal thread, showing that Kakashi was actually a lightning clone. A rate and cage bunshin. Kushimaru thought in surprise and clenched teeth the electrical current affecting his slender body. The strong current was making each of his muscles contract, temporarily paralyzing the blonde shinobi. Kakashi who was sticking to the underside of the bridge until his clone was destroyed. Kakashi, not wanting to waste any time, gripped his wrist and started forming his personal assassination the lightning bolt cutter, Rikiri. Walking up to the immobile man, Kakashi brought his arm back and thrusted the lightning bolt cutter forward towards the man's heart. Just before Kakashi could kill the shinobi, Kakashi had to leap back as the Nabari cut just under his Sharingan eye. Kakashi wiped the blood from under his eye as he looked at Kushimaru who was giggling like a crazy man. Kakashi saw a thread tied around his wrist and that the sewing needle was coming out of the bridge. Kakashi pieced together that he must have grounded the current and thus was allowed to move. Kakashi felt another presence appear next to him to see a slightly bleeding and winded Kishina. Zabuza joined Kushimaru repairing his blade with his own blood as Kushimaru cut the thread around his wrist with an abari. The battle had taken its toll on each of the Jounin. The four Jounin-level shinobi each looked over at the dome of ice mirrors with different expressions. 
Narumi, Naomi and Sasuke were each looking at a different mirror of eyes, but the sight was the same, a girl dressed as a hunter nin. The leaf genin could not keep up with the speed hacker showcased by transferring mirrors. Each of the leaf shinobi tried to hit the Kiri Hyoten user with their ninja tools with no success. They decided to leave Sakura out to protect Azuna since she couldn't provide much in the way of help. Naomi tried to make a break to escape the dome of mirrors so she could attack from the outside of the structure. Haku quickly transported to the mirror closest to Naomi and punched the fellow Kinoichi in the gut before tossing her back to the other genin of Team 7. There is no escape from Kanoha Shinobi. I do not wish to kill you so I request that you hand over the bridge builder and you will leave with your lives. The feminine voice seemed to come from each direction, only making the threat all the more real. Sasuke was mentally questioning how this girl was stronger than he was, he was in a chair. He silently wondered how things would change if he had awakened his Sharingan. Narumi and Naomi were wondering if they could destroy the mirrors and break through the dome. The three genin shared the same thought unknowingly and acted simultaneously facing opposite directions. High release. Grand fireball. Water release. Water javelin. Wind release. Dancing blades. In came the shouts of Sasuke, Narumi, and Naomi as they launched off their respective hopes to eliminate one of the mirrors trapping them. Sasuke's fireball nearly melted the corners of the mirror he targeted. Narumi's javelin consisting of water buried itself into the mirror across from her, but instead of the mirror shattering the javelin fell apart. The ten wind blades cut the mirror Naomi targeted, but the cuts were just superficial. The Kanoha Genin could not believe that the damage was minimal at best. More so Sasuke since he was to have melted the creation of eyes. Those levels of attacks will not break my eyes. I am sorry that I have to do this, but it is my mission and I can't fail as abuse Asama. Haku released a pulse of chakra into her technique, spreading it to the mirrors. The chakra given to each mirror instantly repaired the damage, leaving the mirrors appearing as if they were brand new. Haku went to the mirror positioned above the leaf genin's heads and pulled out ten needles coating them in ice. Crossing her arms over her chest holding a needle between each knuckle, took aim at the clueless Team 7. Hey Emo, I need you to provide the fire and I will use my wind to power it up. Got it. Naomi demanded of the Achiha glaring at one of the many reflections of Haku. Sasuke grunted slightly annoyed by the emo remark but decided it was best to focus on the threat before his eyes. Sasuke nodded and moved next to Naomi as Narumi stood behind the two, waiting for their collaboration attack to start. Haku, who was overhead, had no intentions to let this happen because a wind-enhanced fire would surely melt one of her mirrors. Ice Needles of Death The ten needles were quickly launched at the genin from above and before they could react more frozen were launched at them from the left. Turning to the left Sasuke, Narumi and Naomi were assaulted by more frozen needles from behind, this continued for the following minutes. The three genin were bleeding from cuts on their arms and legs, with more needles sticking from them like a pincushion. It was thanks to the Kaiubi chakra that Narumi and Naomi were still conscious however Sasuke was not as lucky. Just when it seemed that the Namika's Uzumaki girls were about to be defeated, a large explosion drew the attention of all on the bridge. Prior to the explosion, you're good. That was the simple statement Naruto used as he locked his blade, Twilight, against Chijuro's much larger Hiramekure. Both teams were sweating lightly since their battle up to this point was nothing but a duel of swords. Chijuro was in the worst condition however, due to the effort it took to wield the Hiramekure. Both swordsmen had small lacerations marking their clothing, but only a few of the cuts actually drew blood. Naruto eased up on his blade, causing the unsuspecting Kiri Shinobi to stumble forward, leaving him open. Naruto took advantage and lashed out with a powerful kick to the gut. Chijuro tumbled to the ground from the force of the kick. Naruto stood there silently waiting for Chijuro to stand up since he had no desire to kill someone who could test his skills in the future. D thanks, you are pretty skilled yourself Shinobi-san. Chijuro replied, wiping some blood that was dripping from the corner of his mouth. Chijuro's blade flared to life with chakra as he swung the blade at Naruto who didn't have time to avoid it and had to stop it with twilight. The blue glow from the Hiramekure was only inches from the bang of black hair over Naruto's eye and inching closer. Soon the force was too much for Naruto to take and Naruto was launched backwards into a railing. Groaning Naruto shook the feelings back into his arm and shakily readied himself once more. He is incredible. He has managed to keep up with me to this point in swordsmanship and I am one of the seven swordsmen of the hidden mist. Can I win? Just when it seemed as if the blue-haired boy's confidence was going to falter, an image of a beautiful woman with red hair and a charming smile filled his mind. With his resolve strengthened Chijuro lifted his blade up again and tried cutting Naruto down, missing by the narrowest of margins cutting through the rail. Naruto, sensing his opponent becoming more confident through his concise actions, moved back to the center of the bridge behind the other battles. He has gotten a lot more aggressive and energetic. What happened? Naruto asked himself to avoid sword strikes from Chijuro backpedaling. 
Naruto suddenly saw Chijuro preparing something and quickly tensed himself. SMTM Nin. Hiramekure Hammer. Naruto watched as Shijuro's blade changed from a twin's word into a bulkier, much wider shape to fit what Shijuro was trying to do. The chakra started off as a light blue and constantly grew and grew until the chakra became dense and heavy. It was clear that holding that much chakra was physically taxing as the sweat poured from Shijuro's forehead. Shijuro with a war cry swung his sword down, propelling the thick wall of chakra down on his black haired opponent. The sight of a huge wave of chakra would have unnerved any genin, fortunately, Naruto was already preparing for something along those lines. Hami no Kanyumai. Crossing Dimensions. Naruto who was preparing his move ever since Shijuro's blade had started to change its shape to what it was currently, Naruto acted quickly by slashing the air twice. The first time the slash left an arc of red energy floating in front of Naruto, the second slash left an arc of clear energy. The first slash felt incredibly hot as it started to compact itself into an orb, as the second slash did the same with a light humming. This technique used Naruto's elemental chakra and compacted them making their destructive qualities much more concentrated. The white orb and the fiery red orb slammed into the chakra wall, and the result was instantaneous. Boom, the wind orb compressed and created a small vacuum sphere, and the fiery red orb and combustion to the attack. Chijuro's wall of energy was also very volatile, so the result was rather impressive. A small blast of fire which no one on the bridge saw. Each battle on the bridge came to an end, and they all stared at the large cloud of smoke surrounding the point of contact. Everyone stood silent as they waited to see who would step out of the smoke if anyone did. It took a few tense minutes for the smoke to clear away and reveal Naruto and Chijuro to the others. Both were on one knee using their respective blades to keep them up. Both boys' clothes were burned in various places from their proximity to the explosion. No one moved or said a word then a sound broke the eerie silence. Clapping, Chapter 4. New players enter the game. That was the sound that pervaded the silent bridge, the sound of hands being brought together over and over. Naruto didn't bother turning his head to take in the view the rest of the shinobi on the bridge had. Naruto's empty, blue eyes could see the surprise in the eyes of the Kiri team and the confusion in the Leafs. Naruto could feel a large group of people coming closer to his back, but then they stopped a few feet short of his position. The raven-haired shinobi knew that whatever was behind him was something that was an unexpected variable to the situation. The two shinobi teams regrouped with their comrades, all of them aside from Naruto who was still relaxed in his spot. Zabuza looked downright furious as the killer intent rolled off of his muscular frame and spades. The potency of which unnerved both Haku and Shijuro as Kushimaru was looking on while twirling his sewing needle. What is the meaning of this? Zabuza demanded staring murderously at a short man dressed in a pinstripe suit with a really shabby cane in hand. This man was the shipping magnate, Gato, who had been creating a number of monopolies in maritime trading. The suited midget was surrounded by hundreds of thugs, each wearing a smug grin on their faces. Well. I realize that I am paying you Kiri Shinobi way too much for the results you are giving me, especially when the demon of the hidden mist comes back licking his wounds after a small skirmish. So I hired these fine gentlemen to finish you off after your battle, saving me quite the lump sum of cash. Edo said smugly, his nasally voice grinded against the ears of the shinobi, reminding them of nails on a chalkboard. The horde of thugs chuckled at the look of rage on Zabuza's face, believing their superior numbers would win them this battle. Before Zabuza could retort, a random thug spoke up from the front of the group. Hey guys let's hurry up and kill these idiots and take those women and have some fun. The thug exclaimed, eyeing Kishina, Narumi, Naomi and Haku lustfully. This exclamation got a round of agreeing opinions from the other men. Kishina snarled at the men as Haku, Narumi and Naomi squirmed uncomfortably. No one took note of how Naruto's eyebrow twitched after hearing the scum's words. Naruto may not have liked his family one bit however there were a few things that he hated even more, and that was rapists along with bigots. They spread unnecessary hate in the world corrupting it with their animalistic behavior. Edo took one of his hands off of his cane and held his hand up in the air, silencing the chatter coming from his hired goons. No one could see where his beady eyes were looking behind his sunglasses. Tapping his cane on the bridge, Gato gazed at Naruto's back with a frown, obviously not pleased that the boy had not even acknowledged him. First I want you to kill the brat. Edo ordered his labor force pointing his cane at Naruto who just stood up. Team 7, minus Sasuke and Sakura were ready to jump in, and Zabuza and Haku looked ready to kill the slime ball themselves. You are nothing but a group of the blind being led by the blind. For your ignorance I shall remove you from existence. Naruto's ominous statement froze everyone on the bridge dead in their tracks. Naruto looked over at the shinobi who were watching him carefully as he hoisted twilight up into the air, the metal glowing gray. Naruto quickly spun on his heels and slashed out diagonally, throwing a diagonal wave of grey-coloured chakra, with shimmers of a crimson energy embedded in the travelling slash. Each shinobi on the bridge were left wide-eyed seeing the energy slash rushing at Gato and his entourage, not believing Naruto could perform such a feat. 
Ami no, severance from the material world. The wave of grey and flickering crimson energy travelled through the mass of people, and the sight was not pretty on the eyes. Due to the angle of the attack the cuts were not clean through at the waist. Some of the men were missing arms and were cut diagonally, creating two triangular shapes that when put together would make a whole piece. The one happening that really stuck out was the explosion of blood that shot into the atmosphere. The blood fell like rain over that section of the bridge, a truly awe-inspiring yet gruesome sight. The other genin all felt the need to empty their stomachs, while Kishina and Kakashi looked indifferent to the scene of mass slaughter. Tabuza and Kushimaru, who had his mask on were smiling because it reminded them of the bloody mist period in their village. Naruto put Twilight back on the small of his back, the charm floating from its chain as Naruto walked through the piles of random body pieces that were severed from his attack. So I was not seeing things when that crimson energy mixed with my chakra during my spar back in Kanoha. I suppose I am subconsciously channeling minuscule amounts of the Kaiubi's chakra into my techniques. Naruto mused walking through the field of gore, stopping at the severed skull of the shipping magnate. With his glasses shattered Naruto could see the look of shock plastered on Gato's face just before he died. Shaking his head, Naruto kicked the man's head off the bridge and into the roaring waves below. Naruto walked towards the other end of the bridge, where his team was looking at him with awe, or at least the genin were. Naruto walked past the Kiri team to get to them and saw the Kanoichi looking at him like he was a riddle yet to be solved. As Naruto got even closer Haku blushed faintly when she got a clear look at Naruto's face which she thought to be handsome. Naruto saw the blush since Haku had taken off her mask but made no comment. As Naruto passed her he whispered something that changed Haku's entire opinion on the young man. Evil like that has no place in this world. Haku found herself nodding without even knowing she was doing it. Naruto simply stood next to Tazuna with his eyes closed and without saying a word to his temporary team. Tazuna meanwhile was staring at Naruto with a tremendous amount of respect because with one swing he had freed Nami no Kuni from its tyranny. Tazuna came to the conclusion that the Great Naruto Bridge would be a wonderful name for the bridge. Bakashi stepped forward to meet Zabuza in the middle ground between the two teams. The two air rank shinobi stared at each other wearily before Kakashi gave an eye smile and Zabuza a smirk. Zabuza stuck his hand out for a handshake. It was. Fun battling with you Kakashi Haddock however, since our employer went back on the contract and is dead, we have no reason to continue fighting each other. Zabuza said, shaking the scarecrow shinobi's hand. It was a thrill for Zabuza to cross paths with someone so skilled. Zabuza knew he was a battle-thirsty man and had no problems admitting it to himself or anyone for that matter. Bakashi who shook the man's hand was glad that the fight was over since he wouldn't call the battle fun. He just wanted to go home and rest from this C-turned A-rank mission. Bakashi we aren't letting them go are we? They are our enemies, we need to finish what we started. Sasuke voiced his opinion on the matter still seething over his defeat at the hands of the ice release Kinoichi. Sakura who usually sided with the power-hungry Ichiha did not agree with his sentiment this time. She was glad that all the fighting was over and had no desire to rekindle the conflict. The Namaka's Uzumaki girls were just wondering how this was going to play out. Naruto opted to stand silently next to the bridge builder, letting Sasuke's ignorance speak for itself. No Sasuke, they are not our enemies, not anymore. They simply accepted a mission just like we accepted the mission to protect Izuna-san. Now that their mission has been voided, we no longer have any problems with Kiri. It was Kashina who explained the situation to Sasuke who looked none too pleased with the explanation given. Though that does not mean we are on friendly terms with the Hidden Mist. It seems that reports that the rebel forces had acquired the Seven Swordsmen's help in the Civil War were true. If they are accepting missions then that must mean the war is over, and that means there will be a lot of animosity between the Leaf and Must because we did not aid them. We were lucky we ran into Zabuza and not someone more interested in politics. Bakashi nodded his head agreeing with Kishina's assessment of the situation the two teams of Shinobi found themselves in. After returning the handshake Team 7, Naruto and Tazuna walked back towards Tazuna's home, leaving the Kiri Shinobi to walk in the opposite direction. It took the following week for repairs to be made to the pre-existing infrastructure of the bridge, as well as the completion of the bridge. During that week Naruto made sure to keep himself as scarce as possible, as to avoid the conversations his so-called family would no doubt wish for however it was not something he wished to have, it would be useless. Team 7 and Naruto stood at the end of the now completed bridge, facing down the citizens of Nami no Kuni. The mood was festive and with good reason because years of tyranny under the oppressive rule of Gato had finally come to an end. Naruto who was standing on the mainland watched on as his team conversed with Tazuna and his family. Seeing the talks coming to an end Naruto turned around and began the walk towards Konoha without saying a word. Naruto did not feel the need to say anything, he was not their hero and he had no desire to be either, but he couldn't shake the weird feeling that it was too late for that. Team 7 realizing that Naruto had already gone on ahead hurried on to close the distance. Father, what are we going to name the bridge? 
Tsunami asked her father after watching Team 7 and Naruto fade from her vision. The rest of the citizens leaned in also wanting to know what the name of the bridge that would return their home to prosperity would be. We are going to name it after the kid who saved this country with a single slash of his sword. We will call it the Great Naruto Bridge. Naruto was sitting on the railing right outside of his small apartment inside of the red light district, enjoying the peace of the village when it was quiet. The sun was setting and the people were getting ready to retire and have dinner with their families. From this perspective Naruto was truly reminded of what the village was. The village hidden in the leaves was a beautiful place that just so happened to have terrible people living in it. However, that was a necessary evil for the village to maintain itself. Naruto reached behind him and angled twilight in a way, so it would reflect the orange rays of light from the setting sun. This world is equal part shadows and light, and this village is no different. Naruto found that his apartment was one of the nicest places in the village, and it was located in the heart of the red light district. Their apartment was abandoned for reasons Naruto cared not to know, and it was in complete disarray, but a few ceiling arrays solved that. Apparently no one wanted the apartment complex, and that was fine. It was thanks to that, that Naruto could find peace here. Naruto would have taken to watching the village from atop the Hokage monument, but he found it to be too close to the Namika's compound, so that was immediately off his list. Naruto sighed softly, closing his eyes, allowing the orange glow of the falling sun to bathe his seated form. The man must have picked up on this because as soon as he had Naruto's eye he was ready to speak. Hokage Sama requests that you visit him at the Namika's compound. Even though he said the request, Naruto knew that it wasn't a request, this was an order from his cage. All I need to do is think of his home, and the man requires my presence. I swear Kami you must take some sick pleasure in seeing me in misery. Naruto mentally addressed the deity of creation with a narrowed glance at the sky. Naruto stood on the railing and glanced over his shoulder to see that the Anbu operative had already taken his leave. Naruto closed his eyes, and his body soon broke into a number of crows that flew towards the Hokage monument. It only took a few moments for the crows to converge on the head of Hiruzen Suratobi and Naruto to form. Naruto took his time walking through the woods that provided the natural cover for what he once called home. Naruto walked through the forest with his hands inside of the pockets of his grey zipped-up vest and hood over his head, creating a shadow over his face. Naruto saw the gate to the compound was already open, no doubt for his arrival. Naruto walked down the path and could see that the front door was open, and there was some talking he heard from inside. Naruto was only a few steps from having to face the unfortunate music when he heard a loud snort coming from his mind. Naruto just realized that the Kaiubi had been silent during the whole time in wave after their connection was made. Hello Kaiubi. Kaiubi's eyes slowly opened up hearing his pseudo-container's voice for the first time. This told him that the connection they had created was successful and fully operational. The Kaiubi could feel the contempt rolling off of Naruto in waves and was curious as to why. It only took the Kaiubi a few moments to realize why since he picked up the signature of that despicable man who sealed him away again. What is going on? Why are we here, Ninjin? The Kaiubi just waking up was in no mood for the foolish human pleasantries and wanted to know what was happening. Naruto let out the quietest of sighs as he walked up the steps to his one-time home, listening as the voices got louder and clearer. That man has requested my presence here as the Hokage, so I have no choice. It seems like they are trying to bring me back into the family. The fools. It looks like you will get a free show Kaiubi, enjoy. Naruto went silent and walked into the house taking a few steps. Naruto was greeted by Minato and Kashina sitting on one couch with Kakashi standing behind their couch. Naomi and Narumi were also sitting on a couch looking at him hopefully. Naruto almost drowned when he realized that Jiraiya and Sanadi had positioned themselves behind him. Jiraiya of the Sanin was the fabled toad sage of Mount Mayabakizen, a man whose name alone was to strike fear into the enemies of Konoha and respect in the hearts of Konoha Shinobi. He was one of the reasons Konoha was always one step ahead of the other hidden villages, him and his extensive spy network. He was also renowned as a teacher since his student had become the most powerful shinobi in this era. The other figure behind him was Tsunade, also a member of the Sanin. She was a legendary medic as well as a Kanoichi who had saved many lives during the wars and the current head of the hospital in Kanoha. Both of these people were supposed to act as his godparents but shirked on their responsibilities. Hello, Naruto. It was Minato that spoke first trying to break the tension that had flooded the room from Naruto's arrival. Any conversation that was being had was immediately quelled when Naruto entered the compound and replaced by a silent intensity. Naruto's body language gave nothing away as he stared at Minato since he had spoken. He was ignoring the sad expressions on the faces of his so-called family. He was asked by Minato to let him do the speaking. Minato's sad smile grew a bit more seeing how his son was looking at him like nothing more than a stranger. Kashina being the more blunt and exuberant of the two could not take the silence anymore and blurted out the reason for Naruto's presence. 
Meru-kun, please come live with us so that we can become a family again. Naruto turned his head to look at the red-haired Yuzumaki, who had just uttered a desperate plea. Naruto saw how the expressions of his family lifted, probably from the thought of returning to a family. Naruto remained stoic and brought his arms over his chest, one blue eye hidden by his black hair, and the other boring into Kashina with a cold intensity. Naruto did not even need to think about how he was going to respond to his mother's question, because the answer was clear as can be to him. No. Everyone in the room stared at Naruto with different expressions on their faces, but they didn't expect a one-word answer. Any hope that the family was feeling was instantly squashed under Naruto's blank, emotionless tone. Naruto could feel the two Sanin behind him frowning deeply at his words but did not care. To Naruto no one in the building at the moment had any significant value to him. Naruto felt a sudden wave of killer intent coming from behind him and saw Jiraiya move to stand by Kakashi looking quite pale. It didn't take a genius to figure out where it was coming from. Behind Naruto stood a very angry female Senju who was trying her best to restrain herself from making Naruto a stain at the end of her fist. The brat in front of her had a family practically begging him to come back home, and he said no. Sanadi thought about how lucky Naruto had it, after losing her brother and lover in war, she was denied that chance by death, but he had a chance and said no. Listen here brat you are going to come back and live with Minato and Kishina-chan, and then you are going to give your mother a hug. Stop acting like a spoiled brat and do the right thing and live with your family. Naruto closed his eyes and took a few calming breaths, lest he let his Sharingan activate from the sheer intensity of the anger he was feeling. The Kaiubi could feel the amount of contempt that Naruto had whenever he was said to be related to what was considered the perfect family. Calming himself, Naruto opened his eyes and looked straight ahead seemingly out of nowhere. Family. The family is a group of people who love you no matter what you have done. They love you no matter what faults you may have and will always be there to protect you. That is something these people in front of me did not do. They did the opposite and threw me to the scorned wolves of Konoha who sought revenge for the lives the Kaiubi took. Night after night I was abused and spat on. Day after day I was ignored and punished by those two for seeking the attention they lavished their princesses with. Naruto almost spat out his entire speech, not bothering to glance back at Tsunade. Are you telling me to do the right thing Tsunade? Which of you were doing the right thing when the fox hunts were tearing through the streets of Konoha? My own blood ignored my pleas for help, my godparents were too busy keeping the village who were trying to kill me on a daily basis alive and well. That is the reason I curse this blood flowing through my veins, because every single day I am reminded that I am related to such trash. The only reason I am not insane is thanks to the few people who listened to a young boy screaming for help and lent a hand instead of plugging their ears and walking away like you all did. Only a few times had Naruto let his emotions slip during the truthful rant he rattled off. Kishina, Naomi and Narumi were openly weeping at what Naruto was saying. Minato, Jiraiya and Kakashi were frowning soberly since they knew Naruto was not lying. Tsunade was still livid with a disrespectful brat who she thought was just using that as an excuse. Now, Naruto surely could forgive Minato-sama and Kishina-sama for overlooking you like they did. They had a lot of things they had to deal with and were doing the best they could. You still had a home and food to come to. They still cared. Kakashi tried to help Naruto see reason and hopefully bring Naruto back since he too wanted to train who was supposed to be like a little brother to him. Kakashi was not even reading his Icha Icha book, showing just how serious the situation was. Naruto's cold blue eyes stared holes through Kakashi with a silent intensity. Yes, there was something more important than their son. I always thought a father was supposed to protect their son, while mothers were supposed to shower them with love. I received none of that, not from them. It is funny this is coming from you of all people, Scarecrow. Was it not your saying that in the ninja world, those who break the rules are trash, that's true, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than trash. Well you all abandon me. Naruto turned to look at Narumi who was looking at him with a forced smile and watery eyes. On the day I chose to make my life better was the day of our birth, yet I had no importance on that day. I left and no one noticed until they found the letter I left in my room. There was one person who made an effort even if it was late. Naruto reached behind him and pulled out Twilight and held it so that the ornament that consisted of two that crossed over each other at their tips was lying on his palm for all to see. The one kunai on the left was a pure white, while the kunai on the right was a jet black. Under the kunai was a red Yuzumaki swirl that was connected to the loops on the kunai handles. The initials UN were etched into the Yuzumaki swirl in black and white to match the above. Thought this is the reason I will talk with Narumi and publicer on missions, however, she is the only one the only one who had proven to be truly remorseful before my disappearance. This doesn't mean we are family, but this means we are something. Naruto himself wasn't sure what they could be or if they would be anything. He needed to get out of this place now and needed time to think. Turning around after fastening Twilight back in place Naruto took a step towards Tsunade, who was still in front of the door, when he felt someone gripping his shoulder. 
Naruto, this is my fault. It was thanks to me that your parents neglected you all so we could help nurture the savior of the world. The toads have told me of a prophecy long ago, and I thought it was one of your sisters who was to be the savior, yet the prophecy has changed. The toads have told me of a prophecy of a man Jiraiya was cut off as Naruto brushed his hand off of the shoulder and turned around with his eyes closed. I can see just fine with these eyes of mine, Toad, and it shows me the brutal truth that we as humans hide behind. Naruto said ominously with his eyes shut, very telling of what he was thinking of the shinobi world. Kaiubi, can you channel your chakra to my eyes just enough to alter them? Naruto calmly requested his tenant. The Kaiubi did as he asked, and Naruto opened his eyes showing the blue eyes red and slit, much like the Kaiubi's own. Jiraiya winced at the sight and released Naruto's shoulder. Naruto turned to see the stubborn female Senju still in his way. Minato who saw the anger in the bestial eyes of his son, frowned at his own failure to be a father. Bound to himself to try and make amends with Naruto at any opportunity if only so he could maybe call Naruto a friend at least, that was his hope. Minato saw Tsunade still in Naruto's path and hardened his blue eyes to match what Naruto would normally look like. Tsunade stands down. Minato ordered the Senju who looked at him definitely clearly not happy with the order, her eyes glancing over to Kashina, who was giving her the same look as Minato. I said stand down now. Minato repeated himself flaring his chakra to put an immense pressure directly on Tsunade, who began to sweat lightly. It was just a reminder why Minato Namikaze was even more feared than the Sanin. Relenting Tsunade moved aside and Naruto walked out of the house without saying a word to anyone. Everyone in the room had their own thoughts about what had just happened. The Namikaze Uzumaki family and Kakashi all saw that there was a flicker of hope for a united family. Jiraiya was pondering how Naruto referenced his eyes during their brief interaction, and that reaffirmed his belief that the prophecy spoke of Naruto. Tsunade was slowly calming down, but had a clear distaste for the eldest son of the family. Meanwhile the Kaiubi was thinking about what just happened between his container and his family. Why did I give him my chakra so freely back there? Even if it wasn't for power's sake I still gave it away. Why? HMPH, I did it to see the fear in those ninjins' faces at the sight of my eyes. That's why. Even unknown to the powerful chakra beast, he had something akin to respect for the scorned child of the Hokage. It was something the Kaiubi had never felt before since the Sage of Six Paths and had forgotten what it was, but it was there. It had been a handful of months since Naruto had returned to the village hidden in the leaves, and Naruto made himself as busy as possible. Naruto had accomplished an impressive number of D-rank missions during that time. The easiest was when he was assigned to capture the demon cat Tora, who had just jumped into Naruto's arms and got comfortable when he had approached. He had done this mission a number of times, and apparently the cat had taken a liking to Naruto, not that he minded all that much. Naruto had realized that animals just naturally drifted to him when he was called to the Inuzuka compound to assist Hana with taking care of the sick or injured ninja hounds. All the pups seemed to react to Naruto's presence, it was like the animals could see right through Naruto's outer cold facade to the warmth underneath. Naruto since he did not have a team, usually had to take the C-rank missions with the other genin teams, which were unique experiences to say the least. Naruto was assigned to teammate to travel to the land of T to deliver a message. The delivery was not a problem, but once they got to their destination they found out some unexpected news. Apparently a group of bandits had been terrorizing the countryside and requested their help. Teammate agreed to help people in need, and Naruto just didn't care one way or the other. He was no hero. Just a shinobi. Naruto was able to gather some information on each genin member of the team led by Kurenai, just by being on their team. Kiba was the second in line to become heir to the Inuzuka, second to Hana. The boy was brash, headstrong, and had a tendency to overestimate his own ability while underestimating his opponent's ability. His entire fighting style revolved around partnering with his ninja hound Akamaru, with no skill shown towards elemental ninjutsu. Hinata was the Hyuga heiress who was the opposite of Kiba, she was meek and very, very reserved. Though Naruto was able to deduce that she had a crush on Naomi which made Naruto's lips curl into a smile thinking of Naomi and a fangirl. Hinata too relied on her clan. Shino was the Aburam clan heir who too showed no talent for elemental ninjutsu like his teammates, however Shino did think much like a shinobi should, he was calm and tactical. Naruto worked with Team 10 on a simple herb and medical supply gathering mission on the request of Tsunade. The mission went on without a hitch, but that proved to be a curse in disguise for Naruto. With all of the time they had while searching Ino took it upon herself to get to know Naruto better. This of course consisted of flirting with Naruto who Ino found handsome which Naruto found annoying to say the least. When Shikamaru mentioned Sasuke Ino would snap at the lazy Nara, saying how she would always love her Sasuke-kun. Naruto knew that if he was ever to get a girlfriend, it would not be a fangirl, never. Shikamaru was one of the few people from his childhood around his age that took the time to get to know Naruto, so they were friendly enough. Shikamaru like every Nara who seemed to ever live was lazy but a genius. 
Naruto knew that when the situation called for it, Shikamaru became deadly efficient and could be counted on. Where Shikamaru was lazy and his friend and teammate, Choji was equal parts kind and hungry. Naruto also made note that out of all of the teams he had the opportunity to work with Team 10, had the best teamwork. Choji was the close quarters fighter with Shikamaru switching between long range and close range, with Ino providing support. He had not worked with Team 9 however he was aware that their sensei was the least noble green beast Mido guy. By far his least favorite team to work with was Team 7, because of the terrible dynamic the team had together. Kishina and Naomi were always trying to pull him back into their family, while Sasuke was trying to fight him. Then there was the worst aspect of the team was Sakura who had the nasty habit of screeching like a banshee. It was so bad that even the Kaiubi thought it was cruel and unusual punishment to have to listen to. Naruto was walking by the main gate of Konoha when he caught a sight that intrigued the young man. A team of shinobi and their sensei were talking to the eternal gate guards and showing them their shinobi licenses. The team was all wearing Iwa headbands which made Naruto wonder what was going on. Why is Iwa here? They wouldn't be caught dead here in Konoha unless there was a chance to tarnish the village. Oh. The right Mihik sensei did tell me about the Chunin exams. Looks like I need to have another talk with the Hokage about this, since I can't miss this chance to reveal myself on the grand stage. The Kanoichi who was walking at the front of the group was wearing a bright brown Iwa flak jacket with a right sleeve missing from the jacket. There was a cloth hanging over her leg which she covered with fishnet tights. The Iwa Kanoichi had short black hair and pink eyes that were lacking a pupil. Trailing slightly behind the Kanoichi and to the left was a rather large shinobi who was smiling dopily. His headband was over his head like a bandana where Naruto spotted black hair spiking out of. He too was dressed with an Iwa flak jacket but had a yellow scarf around his neck. To his right was another Kanoichi which Naruto was the most curious about. The Kanoichi was wearing a diver's helmet with a steel cage over the opening of the helmet. Naruto could see her grey eyes looking around the village walking silently behind her teammates. Naruto noticed how there were tubes going to each end of the helmet and Naruto could see a green substance going into the helmet which made him even more interested in the Kanoichi. Naruto could see that she was attractive with her face, and as her flak did little to hide her D-cup bust, Naruto's eyes met hers, and she smiled and winked at Naruto which only confused him. Seeing the Iwa team gone in the distance Naruto let out a dreary sigh and looked up into the sky almost pleadingly. I hope you are ready to see me suffer once more Kami. Naruto stared at the sky mentally and just then a wind blew by blowing Naruto's bang with the direction of the wind. Naruto just silently cursed the forces of nature for laughing at his plight before disappearing in a crow shunshin. Minato was sitting behind his desk reading over the details for each stage of the upcoming Chunin exams and making changes where he thought there should be changes. Finishing with the first stage Minato suddenly felt a signature entering his office, followed by a swarm of crows. Minato closed up the file he was about to go over and calmly waited for his son to finish his entrance, one he experienced a number of times since his return. Minato had a feeling he knew what this was about, but he would let Naruto say what it was he wanted to say. Naruto brought his arms up over his chest and stared at Minato intently, his deep oceanic eyes boring into Minato's lighter blue eyes. A number of Anbu were squirming in the shadows from the intensity alone between the father and son. I will be short with this. I want you to enter me into the Chunin exams. Naruto started calmly looking at the Hokage stoically with a few feathers from his crows twirling around him from the breeze coming through an open window behind Minato. Minato nodded inwardly since this was just what he expected Naruto to ask him to do. I can't do that Naruto. You are just one shinobi and you need a team to compete in these exams. Minato informed his son in the tone the Hokage would use when he was talking to a subordinate. What Naruto's file showed was a shinobi with excellent fundamentals and exceptional swordsmanship but nothing else. However Minato was not fooled. He was sure if Naruto was to compete in the exams he would learn much more about Naruto. He just didn't know how right he was and how much he would learn. Naruto simply stared at Minato with one black eyebrow arched in idle curiosity. I am a team just like Team 7 is a team. I do not recall that there were a specific number of people required to participate, and even if you are the cage of the hosting village, you have certain liberties. Naruto stated calmly his posture not once shifting from the calm and slightly imposing stature he took. Now it was not imposing for Minato, but his son did seem to have the air of a trained warrior. Minato let a smile across his face since what Naruto was saying was indeed true, there were no number requirements. He knew Naruto would make a fantastic politician. Naruto's eyes shot to the left where the door was behind him before he turned back to look at the Hokage. It seems we will be cut short. I have given you my request, and it would be in the best interest of Kanoha to grant me my request. With his piece said Naruto performed a normal body flicker and exited the Hokage's office just before the door opened up and five shinobi walked in. Those shinobi were the senseis of the rookie ninja of Kanoha. Kishina, Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurunai. 
there was also the sensei of team 9 Mido guy. You all know why I have called you here today. The Chunin exams will be coming up in a few weeks, but these are no ordinary exams. This will be the 30th international Chunin exams. I know you may think that some of your teams aren't ready, but we need them in the exams, but I still need your formal approval. Leonardo stated his jaw hidden behind his interlaced fingers, getting understanding nods from the Jounin in front of him. It was important that Kanoha put on a good showing, especially with each of the five great hidden villages attending these exams. In the name of Kashin and Amakiz Uzumaki, I nominate Team 7 for the 30th International Chunin exams. Bakashi looked up from his little orange book, feeling the eyes in the room on him, and I smiled at his former sensei. What she said. Kakashi stated before going back to his itcha itcha getting sweat drops from his fellow Jounin as well as Minato, and a rant from Guy about his hip attitude. Ikurana Yuhi nominated Team 8 for the 30th International Chunin exams. Yash. Mido Guy nominated my most youthful Team 9 for this year's opportunity to prove one springtime of youth. Asuma stepped out and blew out some smoke. I assume Asiratobi nominated Team 8 for the 30th International Chunin exams. Lenato nodded his head and leaned into his chair smiling at his wife and Jown and obviously glad there were no arguments. Alright you all need to go and tell your teams and convince them if they are hesitant. With a collective high Hokage Sama the Jown and all funneled out of the office door. Lenato turned to the window where he found his sensei sitting on the window ledge looking out into the village. What do you think about Jureya sensei? Should I let him take the exam alone? Minato asked his teacher hoping for a bit of advice on the matter, although he was already leaning in one direction. I think you should let him take the exam. He sounded very confident in himself, and this is finally the chance you have been looking for to learn the extent of his abilities. Plus it wouldn't look good if your son was to not compete in a tournament of this caliber. Jurea said seriously as he jumped into the office and took a seat across from his former student and current cage. Lenato smiled at his sensei and nodded his head, since he too was of the same mind with what could be accomplished by allowing Naruto in the exams. That is what I was thinking as well. Nico, I want you to go and inform Naruto that he will be taking the exams and inform him where he must be and by when. Minato could see Nico leaving his office and looked back at his sensei. Jureya sensei I need you to stay in the village because during the final stage of the exams the cages will be attending and I want to make sure Kanoha will remain in peace. Minato said it was more of an order than a request, but nonetheless Jureya nodded his head in agreement. The two then went into a discussion about how best to defend the village. Naruto was walking down the streets of Kanoha to get to a training ground so that he could run through a few sword stances as well as train with his clones. It had been a week since he was informed of his acceptance into the Chunin exams, and there was still another 10 days until the exams were to start. Naruto knew that his foolish father would not pass up a chance to see what he was capable of. This also gave Naruto his chance to test himself against a number of different opponents who would provide different problems. Naruto did not really care about impressing anyone, but he knew a good performance would help Kanoha, but he planned to win the exams regardless. While walking down the street, Naruto heard some loud commotion coming from the end of the street next to him. Naruto turned his vision to see what was going on that was causing such a ruckus in the public area. One of the causes of the noise was dark-skinned, flat-chested Kinoichi with long red hair and a sword on her back. She had a long-sleeved dress underneath a kumo flak jacket. The other person joining her in creating all of the noise was a shinobi from Suna, who was wearing a bodysuit that had cat ears. Despite being a boy Naruto saw he was wearing makeup and had something on his back. Naruto recognized the boy they were yelling at as Konohamaru Siratobi. There was a girl standing behind the boy wearing makeup. She had a large iron fan strapped to her back. She had a purple clothing garment that went down halfway to her thighs, and her blonde hair was fashioned into four ponytails. Behind the Kumo Kinoichi stood three people, Naruto guessed it was her team. The first was a dark-skinned shinobi about Naruto's height with short, spiky white hair. He too was dressed in the Kumo flak with a sword on his back, but was looking at Konohamaru with an apologetic look while sucking on a lollipop. Next to him was a fair-skinned Kinoichi with short, straight blonde hair. She was wearing her kumo flak around her stomach and had her outfit cut to display her sizable bust, probably to distract enemies who would fall prey to such a thing. Naruto's eyes narrowed in on the final member of the Kumo Shinobi team, there was something that seemed familiar about her. She had long, straight blonde hair that was bound using rubber bands. She was wearing a black and purple blouse with short sleeves and cloud design on the left side. She had fingerless gloves with a chain of blue beads around her left hand and arm. The black shinobi pants the Kinoichi was wearing also had the cloud design going down the left leg, though Naruto really took notice of her blue, slitted eyes that were currently filled with annoyance. What is it about that Kinoichi that makes her seem so familiar to me? Like I have known her forever. Naruto questioned himself unaware that the Kaiubi was up and listening to his container. That human carries my sister the two tails. That is why she seems so familiar to your senses. 
Naruto nodded his head and looked back at Konohimaru who looked very frightened along with two other small kids who were behind him. Naruto channeled his chakra into his ears to allow him to pick up on what they were saying, without walking into their field of awareness this way he could get their intentions without any external pressure. Listen here Kumo, the brat ran into me first, so I am the one who is going to get to teach the Konoha brat here some manners. The boy wearing the cat bodysuit told the redhead rather heatedly. Naruto could see a few veins bulging on the boy's forehead, showing just how angry he was. And Kuro just let it go. We don't need to go causing any trouble here in a foreign village. The boy's sister Tamari tried to get the Suna puppeteer to see reason and avoid an international incident. One Suna could not have, especially not with their only ally. Why would a boy even be wearing makeup, don't you have any kind of masculinity inside of you, Kurohaim? The red-headed Kinoichi from Kumo taunted Suna Shinobi while her hand went to reach for her sword, eyeing Kinohimaru. Ignoring the shout of its war paint from Kankuro, Kuro, amber eyes flickered dangerously. Now then why don't we shave off a few inches off a brat? The white-haired shinobi, Amoy, started to wave his hands around frantically trying to get Kerry's attention before she attacked the boy. Kerry, what if you hurt the boy then the third Hokage goes to Kumo and shows why he is the god of shinobi and kills Asama. The B-sensei attacks and kills the third Hokage and we go to war with Konoha and the yellow flash. Amoy finished taking a deep breath using his tongue to keep his loli from falling out of his mouth. This got sighs from his team and sweat drops from the Suna shinobi. Konohimaru was just scared by the sword being pointed at him. Well I guess it is time to strike some fear into the competition and show them why they need to behave in my village. Kaiubi, will they identify me or those other two as Jinchuriki? Naruto waited for the Kaiubi to respond as he heard what he guessed was random noises the Kaiubi was making while contemplating his question. I would say that they would see the container as you since they can only sense the chakra in the person who holds the consciousness. Naruto did his single hand sign and performed a nature-less body flicker in front of Konohimaru. You know he is right. Since you two shinobi were just planning on assaulting the third's grandson and here in Konoha nonetheless. Not to mention he is only an academy student. Naruto suddenly appeared between Kankuro, Kari and Konohimaru with his katana, Twilight Drawn. Naruto's sudden arrival put all of the foreign nin on high alert since Naruto had only just appeared and with a weapon drawn. I wouldn't do that if I were you. It would prove fatal. Naruto added on seeing that each of six shinobi were ready to try and get into a fighting stance. This confused the teams from Suna and Kumo that was until they looked. Behind each of them with a katana aimed at a vital area was an equally serious shadow clone of Naruto. There was even a shadow clone looking up into a tree while leaning against the trunk, surprising the shinobi in the tree. While they were busy with the shock of being surrounded, Naruto turned back to look at Konohimaru with a small grin on his face. Oh no, why don't you and your friends get out of here while I deal with these idiots? Konohimaru's face lit up and he nodded since only one person had ever called him that and that was Naruto who he didn't recognize till just now. Konohimaru and his friends took off in the opposite direction and Naruto turned back around to see another Suna shinobi was standing with the group. He had red hair and the kanji for love over his eye. My name is Gara Sabaku. Who are you? The redhead carrying a gourd on his back asked, wondering just who this strong shinobi in front of him was. This was a sentiment shared by the other Suna genin and the Kumo nin. Naruto stared indifferently at Gara, which made the boy's eyes narrow at Naruto, since it reminded him of his childhood. Blood, I want his blood. Gara chose to ignore his mother this time. For now at least. Maybe just who is this guy? Yujito asked her own tailed beast curiously, since it seemed like he was familiar to her. Hum I don't know kitten, but I do know he holds the Kaiubi's chakra inside of him. I believe he is suppressing it, but that is only because it is so faint. The Kaiubi grade and carry just had to go and annoy the guy. Yujito thought as she looked at Naruto much more wearily than just moments before. Naruto looked at Gara as his shadow clones disappeared in small clouds of smoke, letting the other shinobi minus Gara breathe a sigh of relief. My name is Naruto and let me give you all a saying that applies during your entire stay here in Konoha. Naruto said with a fake smile on his face as he released some of his own power that weighed down on the shoulders of each of the genin. There was no malicious intent behind the pressure, it was just pressure. Each of the genin had a bead of sweat trickle down their foreheads. I know that two of you are Jinchurikas, so I will only say this once. A tanuki cannot play dead to avoid a kitsune, and the cat cannot scratch the fox in its den. With that Naruto vanished in another shunshin, leaving the groups minus the Jinchuriki wide-eyed. Hidden, did you feel that that was just his power forcing you down, there was no sign of Kaiubi's chakra. He is quite powerful. You should take him to your hotel room and ride Nibi's lustful purring was cut off by a blushing Yujito, who was trying to hide the red in her cheeks. Nibi I won't just take him and have sex with him. I don't even know his name or anything about him. 
Brigido mentally yelled at her perverted tailed beast, finally managing to push back that annoying blush on her cheeks from the mental images of Naruto and her doing unspeakable things coming from Nibi. Tamari, Kankuro we are going to meet Baki. Gara ordered his two elder siblings who compiled without hesitation. The Kumo Shinobi all shared a glance and agreed it was best for them to avoid Naruto during the exams if they could help it. Then they two left to go and meet their eccentric sensei and inform him of the situation they found themselves in. Naruto was sitting on his bed in a meditative position with just his shinobi pants eyes closed as the room slowly grew dim from the lighting seals placed on the walls. Naruto was currently sitting in his mindscape having a conversation with his resident-tailed beast. Tell me Kaiubi, who should I look out for? Naruto asked the large kitsune's advice on the matter since it would be foolish not to use a thousand-plus-year-old resource. The Kaiubi who was resting on his front two paws looked at Naruto as if he was an insect but in the end relented. Nibi probably advised her container to avoid challenging me since she was always a smart one, unlike that fool the four tails. Anyways if I had to guess you would probably need to beat down that sand brat since Shukaku was always a bloodthirsty fool with an inferiority complex. The only place he could prove to be a true threat would be in the desert where he has tons of sand at his command. The Kaiubi told Naruto who was listening intently to the Kaiubi's informative closed his eyes and opened them up showing his three Tomo Sharingan. It turns out that in the mindscape they would activate on their own much to the Kaiubi's ire, but he eventually accepted that since Naruto proved to have no desire to control him. Alright so then Gara will most likely be using sand-based techniques. He will probably have the sand in that Gordy was carrying on his back. That means he has a fixed amount of sand at his command. Naruto said to himself just for the sake of having the information in his head in case of a conflict between him and his fellow human sacrifice. Can you tell me anything about Nibi? I mean we wouldn't want to be bested by any inferior beasts, would we? Naruto asked to play on the Kaiubi's great pride, something he shared with the Kaiubi, since he did not like to appear weak either. Kaiubi's eyes narrowed at Naruto before his large mouth opened up with a very vulpine-like grin, showing his large gleaming teeth. The one tail the Kaiubi had gotten back was flickering back and forth with amusement. Of course neither of those two is as strong as I am Ninjin. I am Kaiubi, I am the incantation of destruction. I have not done combat with Anibi in ages since she has priorities and other things, but I do remember her affinity to fire was second only to mine. Naruto nodded his head, but it seemed like the Kaiubi had one last nugget of information to add on to this discussion. I also remember hearing when I was sealed inside of that woman that the eight tails had become partners with a human from Kumo. It would make sense that he would have taught the girl to partner with Nibi. Shukaku wouldn't have paired with the Suna brat so you won't have to worry about that. Kaiubi chose not to call Kishina, Naruto's mother, remembering how volatile Naruto would get. Bad and he had no wish to test Naruto's ocular prowess in his state of frown hearing that the blonde from Kumo could possibly use her Biju's chakra to aid her, but then again Naruto had his eyes, so it might not be such a problem. Only an actual conflict would tell who would win out. Naruto slowly let his eyes open again, and instead of a sore Naruto found himself looking into his bedroom in the house in the red light district. Naruto ran his hand through his jet black hair with a sigh. Standing up, Naruto walked to the bathroom where he started his shower and looked into the mirror over the sink. Letting his Sharingan roar to life, Naruto stared intently at his own reflection. Soon very soon the whole world will know just how great of an impact I can make on this world. Taking a deep breath Naruto let his red eyes fade back to the blue eyes he was born with. Naruto took a step into the shower and let the warm water wash over his body and relax his sore muscles. Kanoha always loved the look underneath the underneath, saying so I hazard to guess that would be the first or second stage of these exams. Then after that probably a survival stage to thin the numbers down a bit before a final tournament. The tournament will allow the villages to showcase their shinobi and by extension their strength. Naruto closed his eyes for a moment to relax before finishing his shower and heading off to bed. Ten more days and then I will have a whole new set of problems to deal with, but it is a necessary evil. Naruto closed his eyes and in a few minutes Naruto drifted off to sleep. Naruto was standing in front of the Hidden Leaf Academy looking at the building impassively from under his hood. Now Naruto had not attended the academy since Mihik had come to take Naruto from Konoha the year he was to join the academy. For some reason Naruto just thought they probably taught something stupid like Konoha during times of peace, which is why none of the shinobi in the exams outside of Team 7 knew any elemental ninjutsu. Naruto shook his head since it was amazing that Konoha could remain where it was with such a weak generation of shinobi. They truly needed to pick up their training if they wanted to surpass the last generation. However that was not Naruto's problem, his only problem if it could be called that were these exams. These exams brought shinobi of all kinds from different corners of the world here to Konoha to show everyone watching what they could do. Naruto could only smile with anticipation at the number of strong opponents he may be able to fight. 
Naruto found the talent in Konoha sorely lacking and hoped the other villages could provide Genin who would pique his interest. That did not matter at the moment however, since to get there Naruto had a few other stages to run through before then. Showtime. Chapter 5. Thinning the Herd. Stages 1 and 2. Showtime. Naruto said to himself as he walked through the main entrance of the academy and looked up to see a sign posted up on the wall that pointed the Chunin hopefuls in the right direction. Naruto arched an eyebrow at the rather obvious attempt to help the contestants in the exams, but nonetheless followed the sign up the steps to the second floor. Whatever Naruto was expecting it was not a group of people staring at a door where two smug-looking shinobi were standing guard. Naruto stood there at the top step silently as he listened to shinobi from various countries complain about being denied entry. Naruto immediately recognized the two men guarding the room labeled as 301 from the number of times he had passed their booth. Sure they were transformed into what Naruto assumed was their younger forms, but Naruto knew that as Izumo and Kitetsu the village's eternal gate guards. Naruto watched as a genin from the leaf tried to force his way in only to be slugged in the jaw and kicked back towards his team, earning cries from the other shinobi, who were getting nervous about their prospects of becoming chunin. Naruto shook his head at the stupidity of the shinobi in front of him, if they could be called so. Are these people this stupid? I mean it is barely an E-rank Jinjutsu they placed over the sign above the door. That and we have only gone up one set of stairs at this point. Naruto thought incredulously as he stared at the protesting genin with a deadpan glare. Trying to save whatever brain cells he had left, Naruto forced his way through the group without saying a word and made it to the stairs to the third floor. Naruto did not spare a second glance to the converging idiots on the second floor who deserved to be eliminated from this exam. Naruto had just missed a boy with green spandex and his team entering up the stairs he had just come from. Naruto walked up to the door to the real room 301 and slid open the door and took a few steps in letting the door slide shut. A wave of killer intent immediately tried to swallow Naruto up as he walked him alone. The genin in the room thought Naruto is an easy prey to be taken in this exam however they had no idea how wrong they could be. Naruto shrugged off the weak killer intent since he had experienced much worse while training with Itachi and Mihik. Naruto walked over to a table situated on the right side of the room. Naruto turned to his left to see a familiar group of shinobi glancing over at him with small smiles and one with indifference. Naruto recognized them as the blue-haired boy who he fought on the bridge and the fake hunter Nin as well. However there was one Naruto did not recognize. The shinobi was wearing a black pinstripe dress shirt with a yellow tie, but Naruto could catch a glimpse of chain mesh underneath the guy's collar. The boy had blue hair much like Chijuro, but also had yellow streaks running across the blue hair. Chijuro bowed slightly which Naruto thought was weird. H hello again Shinobi-san it is nice to see you once again. I am afraid I forgot to get your name the last time we crossed B-Blades. Chijuro informed Naruto with a somewhat regretful tone in his voice since Naruto had provided a wonderful duel. My name is Shijuro by the way. Chijuro said while extending his hand out for Naruto to take in a handshake. Naruto took the handshake since he respected Chijuro's skills with the sword. Naruto told Chijuro and by proxy the rest of the Kirigen in his name in return. Since Naruto only used his first name they were blissfully unaware of Naruto's heritage. Naruto watched with slight amusement as Haku slid over to the bench of the table Naruto was sitting at. She kept getting closer but had yet to look at the young man in the eyes, which was only fueling said young man's amusement. Haku glanced to see Chijuro and her other teammate talking, so she turned back to face Naruto with a small smile. I was thinking about what you said on the bridge all that time ago and I agree trash like that doesn't deserve to live. I just wanted the chance to tell you that I admire your resolve. Haku tried to blurt out that last sentence as fast as she could. Naruto couldn't help but let out a small chuckle at Haku's nervous behavior around him, which only made the ice release Kinoichi a little self-conscious. Naruto turned to face Haku with a small foxy grin. It is so nice to meet a serious Kinoichi. All of the Kinoichi around here are more interested in their looks or love life. Naruto started with a frown and a blank tone with a matching deadpan expression. Haku giggled at Naruto's deadpan expression, drawing the attention of the other two Kiri Genin. Naruto just repeated what he said to Haku to the other two, getting chuckles from both Kiri Shinobi, while Naruto wondered why he didn't take the chance and go to Kiri. The boy in dress clothing looked at Naruto with a grin, almost as if he could sense Naruto's strength, or maybe he was just an idiot. My name is Kakujo. The shinobi known as Kakujo introduced himself with a suave tone. Naruto wondered why he was named after the bishop piece in Shogi, then again some people thought he was named after Raymond Topping. Then something Naruto wasn't expecting happened. Naruto watched as a hand of yellow energy came out of his hand and then he performed a small salute with the energy or aura hand. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the blatant display of Kakujo's abilities. There are only a few reasons to show your abilities so readily to an enemy shinobi. One he is an idiot or two he is extremely cocky in his ability. Judging from the gleam in his eye when he showed the ability it is the cocky option. 
What a fool it is that arrogance that will lead to an early death or the death of those around him. Naruto shot Kakujo with a grin of his own, effectively masking what he was thinking about the Kiri shinobi. Naruto continued to have a pleasant conversation with the team from Kiri, as the rest of the Kanoha rookies made their presence known in the testing room. Team 7 had just entered the testing room and were greeted by the same treatment Naruto was greeted with about 10 minutes prior. As the wave of killer intent washed over them, Naomi and Narumi showed their discomfort by clenching their hands. Sasuke felt his heartbeat pick up and Sakura tried to shield herself from the malicious intent by using Sasuke's body as a buffer. The tension was becoming too much for the Leaf Genin team and left them wishing for any kind of disturbance in the unrelenting killer intent of multiple Genin teams. Thankfully someone was feeling kind today and gave them their much-needed distraction. Sasuke-kun. Sasuke groaned hearing the familiar shout from one of his most loyal fangirls and as if on cue, felt an extra weight on his left side. Praying silently for something else, Sasuke turned his gaze to the left slightly where blonde hair filled his vision. It looks like Sasuke was not having as much luck as he would like. The room watched as Eno snuggled into the Ichiha's side with growing sweat drops on the back of their heads, wondering how she became a Kinoichi. A certain pinkette had a large twitch on her brow ridge as she watched the Amanaka heiress cozy up with her Sasuke. Eno pig. Sakura shouted at a rival and used her abnormal natural strength to pry Eno off of Sasuke like a leech. The two leaf Kinoichi, which was a stretch, were grinding their foreheads against the others and were shooting looks that could kill if such a thing was possible. Sasuke, who was hiding his embarrassment, slid away from the fangirls. The room grew a second sweat drop and wondered if all Kanoha Kinoichi were fangirls. While all of this was happening one leaf Kinoichi with a hairstyle resembling a panda was looking away in embarrassment. Haku was nodding now, completely understanding what Naruto was telling her earlier. Troublesome. It looks like you guys got roped into competing in these exams as well. Shikamaru said lazily as he and Choji, who was eating from a bag of chips, joined Team 7 and their teammate. Narumi and Naomi let out a small sigh, seeing how even in one of the most important events in the world, Shikamaru showed no enthusiasm. You know Shikamaru I think that you might actually die if you were to show some enthusiasm. Narumi said with a small smirk earning a snicker from her sister and a roll of the eyes from said Nara. Narumi did get a slight twitch when she heard Shikamaru mutter something about troublesome blondes. Hey it looks like you guys are taking the exams too. Not like you are going to win, right Akamaru? Kiba said, nearly shouting in his usual brash style of doing things earning a small yelp from his canine partner. Shino and Hinata walked up behind him in a much more subdued and quiet manner. Sasuke managed to distance himself from his arguing fangirls and smirked at the Inuzuka air. Of course we are, like I would miss a chance to beat Shinobi from all over the continent dog breath. I will also be winning this whole thing. You don't stand a chance against an Ichihamut. Sasuke challenged arrogantly, serving to irritate the young Inuzuka who wanted nothing more than to wipe away the Ichiha's signature smirk. Tiba clenched his hands around the wrists of his sweater as he restrained himself from attacking the Ichiha heir who had just insulted his pride. Hinata looked at her teammate with concern since she never really liked conflict, especially when it was between comrades. Shino was just Shino. Watch it Sasuke. It won't be like it was back in the academy, and even then you could just barely beat me. I have gotten better and your pretty little eyes just emerged meaning you still suck. Kiba retorted with a smirk of his own as he pointed out the simple fact that Sasuke had just activated his Sharingan. Back in their academy days Kiba was the only one who was able to challenge the Achiha when it came down to Tejutsu practice. Sasuke glared at Kiba letting his single Tomo Sharingan roar to life, earning a growl from the fear like Shinobi. You know being so loud usually puts a large target on your backs. That is something that is not recommended for anyone, but especially not for rookies. Oh and I am Kabuto by the way. The rookie gen and all quieted down and looked over to see a boy with glasses and silver walking towards their little group. Taking heed to his word the group of unaware genin took a look around and saw a number of shady looking genin all glaring at their group. Hanada let out an eep and hid behind Shino, while Lino and Sakura who had just stopped arguing swallowed lumps forming in their throat. Sasuke shot them a glare right back and the other genin just looked around the room. Let them glare all they want me and Akamaru are going to win this whole thing so it doesn't matter. Isn't that right boy? Kiba shouted obviously not bothered by being the center of the attention that others would avoid. Akamaru barked, supporting his master like any loyal shinobi dog would. The Buto looked at Kiba like he was the stupidest person to ever walk the elemental continent in its entirety. Kiba just ignored the look as he was too busy picturing his grand victory in the middle of an arena, surrounded by a number of fangirls screaming his name. Kabuto shook his head and turned to face the other shinobi in the group. Take it from someone who has taken these tests seven times. These exams aren't easy, even more so since all of the major hidden villages are competing. Kabuto warned them sternly, getting nods from the genin. 
except for Shikamaru who narrowed his eyes feeling like something was off about the silver-haired genin. Sasuke on the other hand scoffed at the elder leaf genin's warning since he had another opinion on the failure in front of him. They probably aren't that hard. You just suck. Sasuke started with an infuriating smirk on his lips and his arms crossed over his blue clan shirt. Kabuto, who had previously been smiling, frowned at the naive Ichiha. No, these exams are very difficult, but you'll soon learn that. Some of you the hard way. Kabuto finished that last part in an inaudible whisper, shooting a menacing smile towards the group's Ichiha. Taking the exams as many times as I have has allowed me to gain information on this year's competitors, which is quite handy really. Kabuto stated for the group to hear as he pulled out a deck of cards that were blank. Now Shikamaru was really curious about this leaf genin who he had never seen before and who had information on all of the competitors. There was just something that even he couldn't figure out. Information. Sasuke questions raising an eyebrow with a mild curiosity directed at Kabuto's deck of ninja information cards. Once he was informed that it was information on his fellow competitors, Sasuke let a grin cross his face, believing he could get some advantages on a few people in the tests. Okay then show me Rock Lee and Gara Sabaku's cards. Sasuke started remembering how Gara managed to evade his senses and how Rock Lee beat him handily, not that he'd admit that. Kabuto smiled since the plan was going along perfectly and nodded his head before he began to shuffle the cards. Placing a blank card on the floor Kabuto put his middle and pointer fingers on the card and released a small pulse of chakra onto the surface of the card. The card spun slowly until the information on Rock Lee came to the surface of the card. Rock Lee has no capabilities in Ninner Gen due to a disease that has ruined his chakra coils. His Tejutsu though is at the point where he could match a number of Jounin. Part of Kanoha's Team 9 consisting of himself, Niji Hayuga and Tenten with his sensei being Mido Guy. Team 9 has done 42 D rank and 35 C rank missions. Kabuto read the card allowing the genin to absorb the information before returning the card to his deck and shuffling. Kabuto pulled out a new card and channeled his chakra into that card as well, revealing the picture and information on Gara Sabaku. Hum I don't have that much information on him to be honest, but I can tell you that he along with his teammates and siblings Tamari and Kankuro have completed 12 D rank, 52 C rank and 1 B rank missions. The most shocking thing however is that he has never suffered an injury while in the field. Kabuto finished with a small trickle of sweat going down his brow. The Kanoha Genin all gawked at that information since they would get small cuts just from D rank missions. Shikamaru who had been looking around the room for a certain raven-haired shinobi found his gaze and gave him a small smirk. Naruto, who knew what he was about to do, just shrugged his shoulders indifferently to the idea. As troublesome as it is, can you give me information on Naruto? Shikamaru asked politely, remembering to avoid using Naruto's surname, effectively avoiding his wrath. Kabuto raised an eyebrow confused as to why he didn't use the surname, but searched through his deck. Narumi and Naomi glared at the shadow user for asking for information on their brother. Kabuto pulled out a card with Naruto's information on it. Here it is. Naruto. Naruto Namakiz Uzumaki. Kabuto froze reading the full name of the shinobi and requested everyone in the room to go silent and look at Naruto, who was sitting there with his eyes closed at a table by himself. Shaking out of his surprise Kabuto continued on reading. Naruto is the only son of the fourth Hokage and has part of his early life labeled as classified. He has shown no tojutsu but is always seen with a katana on his person. That being said, his kenjutsu skills are truly off the charts and he is said to use a style never seen before. Naruto and shown no abilities in Ninner Gen. He rotates teams when going on missions of C rank or above. Naruto has completed 28 D rank, 16 C rank, 1 B rank and 1 A rank mission. The Budo almost choked on his own saliva as he read out the last part on the card. Naruto has also only received light cuts during his missions, nothing serious. Kabuto relayed to the silent room who were all staring at Naruto like he was an extraterrestrial. Naruto sat there unmoving, completely relaxed as he let Kabuto reveal him to the room of Chunin hopefuls. All of that information is accessible in the records of Kanoha. He has either painted a target on me or convinced a few teams to avoid me. Plus he has given them expectations of my skill set which I can shatter if need be. Thanks Shikamaru you just made my job a lot easier. Naruto sat there with no discernible emotion on his face but was inwardly grinning much like a fox that had caught its prey. The leaf shinobi all stared at Naruto in shock but in Narumi and Naomi's case admiration and awe. The Kiri team who was closest to the only son of the Hokage all looked at him with respect and slight awe. Chijiro could personally attest to Naruto's skill with his sword, since he had not had a duel like that since his training back in Kiri. Haku, who was surprised that Naruto had shown no skills in the Ninner Gen fields, had a sneaking suspicion Naruto was using a shinobi's most powerful tool. Deception. Kakujo's grin threatened to split his face in two as he thought of what a great fight Naruto could provide him with, never once entertaining the thought that his earlier display would come back and haunt him. 
the team from Cloud also heard Kabuto's very thin rundown on Naruto's skills and mission history and was generally impressed. Amoy had already started to create a very elaborate but dreadful scenario where he accidentally slaughtered the son of the Yandame Hokage, leading to the destruction of the ninja system. Very scoffed believing she could handle the Prince of Konoha easily with her sword still bitter from Naruto embarrassing her over a week ago. Samui was thinking about talking to the raven-haired shinobi since he seemed to be pretty cool, not to mention he had the aura of a confident warrior. Yujido though was not as lucky to have her thoughts in private thanks to a certain perverted feline that was sharing her body with her. Did you hear that kitten hasn't even been seriously injured yet? You need to claim him before some other woman sinks her claws into him. Nibi purred her memory, still thinking about that dominating presence that Naruto produced. It was an aura that demanded you respect his power or there would be consequences which were rare for a genin to hold. Yujido cut the mental link with the two tails in favor of staring at the shinobi, who was now the center of attention. I don't know if it is because he holds the kaiubi, but he just feels so familiar. Like we have been friends for years. A plume of smoke suddenly erupted behind the podium in the center of the room, drawing everyone's attention. Out of the smoke came a man with tanned skin and one scar running down each of his cheeks at an angle. He was wearing a black trench coat and his leaf headband like a bandana. All right maggots quiet down and follow me. This was the proctor for the first exam Ibiki Marino, a renowned interrogator and head of the Hidden Leaf's torture and interrogation unit. Ibiki led the participants into another room similar to the fist but with packets of papers on each seat. Ibiki took his position at the front of the room so he could see everything. Find the packet that has your name and shinobi license number on it and sit down. Ibiki ordered his newest victims watching some of them scurry around in a panic while others calmly found where they were to be seated. A chunin is something much more than a genin. As you may find yourself leading missions where it is your role to look at everything and make swift decisions. It is up to you to be swift but correct. Some of these missions will have limits on time where you cannot just take your time and go through it at a measured pace. On some missions you can find a comrade or an informant captured and then time will be of the essence. If you are too slow then you will lose that teammate. This is what we will be simulating here. You have a hundred questions there and an hour to answer them by any means. Ibiki smirked at the look of disbelief on most of the genin's faces, believing their task was an impossible one. Oh and one more thing if you fail you will never be able to take the exams again and will be an eternal genin. On cue there were cries of protest and the questioning of his authority to do so. I can assure you that each of your senses accepted the terms of the test when they signed you up for the exam. Now if anyone wishes to leave before the test begins they can try again next year. But if one person leaves then their team will join them as well. Ibiki watched with an indifferent expression as the room fell deathly quiet. The genin were all looking towards their teammates for some form of silent guidance. Ibiki waited five minutes and in that time ten teams had left the testing room. Begin. As soon as the word began left Ibiki's lips the sound of pencils hitting paper echoed in the silent room, much to the hidden amusement of the proctor. Naruto let his eyes fall onto the piece of paper he was given. Flipping the first page over, Naruto was tempted to immediately start answering questions but decided to tackle the test calmly. Remember to always read the details before rushing in. Patience will save your life many more times than any ninjutsu. Itachi's words echoed in Naruto's mind calming down all of his apprehension towards what he was being asked. Naruto went over the directive. Directive. You have an hour to complete this portion of the exam. There are 100 questions on this exam. You are to read over each and every question before starting to answer any questions. Once you have done so then you may begin your exam. Naruto made sure to read over the directive twice more, since all of the pencils hitting the paper over and over again were having a minor effect on him. Naruto calmly read over each and every question just like the directive told them to do. When Naruto got to the final question he arched an eyebrow and did what the question asked. Turning to the back of the cover page which he assumed was blank, he channeled some chakra into the paper and watched as a single line message appeared. Naruto read over the message with a blank expression and looked over to Ibiki who was just looking down at some papers. Naruto quietly rose from his chair, making sure not to draw too much attention and possibly help the competition. Naruto was aware of a few pairs of eyes on him and the most notable of them were the eyes of Ibiki. Naruto stared at the man for a few moments before letting a small smirk come to his lips, a smirk mirrored by the proctor. Quietly shuffling over to a door where there was another proctor standing. The proctor asked him for the message which Naruto knew was the message on the back of his paper. The leaf that lies in the sun also lies in the shadows. The proctor nodded his head and opened the door he was standing in front of, motioning for Naruto to follow him into a smaller waiting and restroom. Naruto took a seat and the proctor went back to take his original position, leaving Naruto to his thoughts. I was the first one I saw. Ibiki created a high amount of tension in explaining the duties expected of a chunin. 
and to add on to that he created a false illusion of being an eternal genin to force them to rush through the test, thus making them forget what he said about looking at everything. Then there is the purpose of separating those who succeed from the common testing area. This way the others are sure if I figured it out or if I couldn't take it and just quit. Also there is no odd chance that someone says something that will reinforce the belief of the other testers. Naruto watched as a team from Kumo he had not met walked by him, no doubt also figuring out the purpose. Seeing a team joining him in the waiting room also brought another point into Naruto's thoughts. Then there is the challenge of conveying the meaning of the test to your other teammates without alerting Ibiki or the other competitors. Naruto waited for the rest of the hour as the room filled up with other teams who either solved the puzzle or stumbled upon the answer by dumb luck. Naruto saw among the teams were the Leaf Rookies, along with Team 9, the teams from Kumo, Kiri, Suna, and Iwa were also amongst the group who had passed the first stage. Naruto was glad that from his seated position, he was hidden from view of everyone minus Shikamaru who someone found him and decided to take a nap next to him. The lazy bastard knows I would help out if someone tried to attack him. Naruto thought with a ghost of a smile on his usually stoic face. It was at the 55-minute mark that the window on the other side of the room shattered putting all the genin on high alert. Well, all of them except Naruto and Shikamaru for different reasons. A moment later a Kanoichi with violet hair and wearing a tan overcoat over a chain mesh. Her choice of clothing made many Kanoichi glare at her and other shinobi, such as Kiba and Kankuro stare at her with a perverted grin. Behind her was a banner that read. The sexy and single Anko Midarashi, proctor of the second stage. Anko looked around at the number of genin still left and clicked her teeth. Looks like Ibiki is getting soft if he lets this many brats get past his test. Oh well I will have this number halved at least. Anko muttered to herself with a sadistic smile that made some of the lesser genin feel slightly uncomfortable. Alright brats you have 10 minutes to meet me at training ground 44. If you aren't there you will be disqualified. Naruto turned to look at the sleeping Nara and nudged him in the shoulder, stirring him after relaying the message. Naruto performed a shunshun to follow after the snake woman. He knew just where to find training ground 44, as did a majority of the leaf shinobi. Naruto and the rest of the genin stood in a crowd in front of a gated off forest, all with different expressions on their faces. A loud growl came from somewhere deep in the forest that made a few of the genin take a step back in fear. At the front of the group Anko watched as the final few seconds ticked away, snapping the watch closed Anko turned to face the group. Alright, that's time. Hello my little genin and welcome to my second home training ground 44 or better known around here as the forest of death. Anko projected her voice to make sure that all of the genin could hear her words. As soon as her little introduction ended there was a shrill shriek coming from the forest, as if it wanted to introduce itself to the little genin. This of course in scaring some of the genin to the point where a few thought their heart would pound right through their chest. Anko was smiling at their fear until she saw Naruto looking on unimpressed. Anko took out a kunai from her overcoat and tossed it with decent speed at Naruto, who decided if he should let it hit him. Naruto ultimately decided against it and leaned to his right slightly so that the kunai would miss him completely. Anko, who had already performed a shunshun to get behind the raven-haired shinobi, had to use another kunai to hold it at Naruto's throat. The other genin who were too distracted by the threat of the forest were looking at the proctor who looked like she was about to kill Naruto. Does my home not meet your expectations? Anko whispered into Naruto's ear only so he could hear her words. To have some fun with the cool and calm genin, Anko pressed her assets against Naruto's back, her kunai inches from cutting into his skin. Naruto simply arched an eyebrow at Anko's rather blunt actions. The female genin were glaring at Anko for her rather unladylike behavior, while the male portion of the crowd glared at Naruto with jealousy. However Naruto and Anko ignored them in favor of continuing the little game they were playing. Yes I do not believe the forest is all that threatening after all I was about five when I spent a few months there. Naruto replied in a calm whisper of his own not even bothered by Anko pressing into his back. Anko thought on his words for a few moments before she recognized the genin she was trying to tease. Glancing at Naruto from over his shoulder, Anko had to admit that the boy from all those years ago filled out rather nicely to the point where she wouldn't mind having some fun with him. A shiver ran down Kanoha's snake mistress's spine, not thinking about the possible intimate time, but because she suddenly felt cold steel against her inner thigh. Anko knew from its positioning that it was against a major artery that could kill her rather quickly. The brat is pretty good and he's level-headed. He's gonna make Chunin easily. Anko was removed from her thoughts when her danger senses went off. Letting go of Naruto she turned around to face the person who got behind her. It was Kusanin who had come up behind the two with the kunai Anko had thrown earlier in hand. The Kusa Kanoichi gave Anko a very disturbing smile and handed the proctor of the second stage. I was just returning your kunai proctor-san. Kusanin said politely before returning to stand next to her teammates. Anko and Naruto let their vision linger on the shinobi who had managed to get so close to them with a suspicious glimmer in their eyes. 
Anko put away both of her kunai and returned back to the front of the group to carry out the rest of her duties as the proctor. Listen up because I will only be saying this once. To finish this stage you need to recover two scrolls. One labeled as heaven and the other earth. Anko pulled out one of each scrolls to show the teams an example. You are not allowed to open up these scrolls until you reach the tower in the center of the forest where you will need to bring the scrolls. The teams from Kanoha and Kumo with four members will need to gather two of each scroll because of the extra member. Anko pocketed the scrolls and pointed over to a booth with a Chunin sitting there with a stack of papers. To get your scroll and gate number, you will need to sign a waiver that relieves Kanoha of any responsibility for your probable death in the forest. This got a number of unhappy grumbles from the genin who were basically called future corpses by a nonchalant Anko. Naruto strolled over to the booth and signed his waiver and was given an earth scroll as well as his gate, number 12. Naruto stood there by himself, aware of the eyes that were on him from the Omegakur team to his right and a different Kiri squad on his left. Naruto heard Anko's voice come over a speaker system, wishing the genin luck which made Naruto snort since he knew that those words were far from sincere. There was a loud buzzer that went off and simultaneously each and every gate opened up. Naruto took off towards where he knew the tower to be from his childhood, not bothering to look for a team because he knew a team would come looking for him, the lone wolf in the competition. It had been about an hour close to two when Naruto sensed someone was following him thanks to a cage bunch and that had dispelled itself. Naruto dropped down to the forest floor that was littered with a number of thick trees and shrubbery. It was not even a minute later when Naruto found himself with company on the forest floor. Naruto sighed of course it had to be an Iwa team. Each of the Iwa shinobi were glaring at the scorned son of the Hokage with an obvious hatred filling their eyes, blinding them to the truth. The truth being Naruto was not his father and should not be judged for Minato's actions during a war. Who Naruto guessed was the leader stepped forward with an arrogant grin on his face. Look, he's the son of that damned yellow flash. He killed my father and now I will be able to get my revenge by killing his son. I bet you wish you had a team now bastard just so you could run from my revenge. The team shouted with a bloodthirsty grin, a grin that both of his teammates were sporting on their own faces. Naruto sighed and shook his head at the ignorant fools in front of him that would rather kill him for the Hokage's sins than try to be diplomatic about the situation. Then again to the untrained eye Naruto would not appear to be any place to negotiate with a full team of shinobi. Naruto decided not to stain twilight with the blood of the trash in front of him and would stick to his tojutsu. Naruto usually did not rely on tojutsu since a sword was so much more efficient in killing or dispatching opponents, but the raven-haired shinobi thought this would be a good chance to sharpen his skills. Naruto spread his legs out widening his base and let his arms hang at his sides, giving the impression that he had an opening. This was the essence of the Kodohoku style that would encourage an opponent to rush in where Naruto would use sudden movements to deliver punishing but quick strikes before moving again. Earth release. Stone gauntlets the lead shinobi slammed his fists into the ground and slowly retracted them from the ground with a grin. The shinobi fell back into a boxer's stance before rushing forward to close the distance between him and the son of Iowa's greatest enemy. Naruto bobbed and weaved away from a handful of jabs that were aimed at his skull. Naruto glanced behind his shoulder and spun on his heel and gripped the sides of the stone spear that another of the Iwa shinobi had tried to stab him with. Naruto used a strength he had gained in his upper arms alone to throw one of the Iwa shinobi at the other. The Iwa shinobi ducked under his incoming teammate and closed in on Naruto before Naruto could react effectively. Bringing back his stone glove, Iwa in threw a straight punch that Naruto could not block in time. Naruto was taken back behind the strength in the punch and therefore was not prepared to be launched into the tree line back first. The Iwa Shinobi team waited for Naruto to get back to his feet before continuing the beat down. Naruto who was pulling himself from the crushed trunk of the tree he crashed through, started to evaluate himself. Looks like I need to up my speed a bit before I will be ready to face a group of shinobi on my own. Naruto crossed his fingers and created a cage bunshin, giving it silent orders to get the enemy's attention which it went to do without hesitation. Naruto's cage bunshin jumped out of the forest behind the Iwa Shinobi who had yet to attack and kicked him towards the two more eager shinobi. The other Iwa shinobi whirled around to face Naruto, but the clone had already vanished back into the trees. Naruto or his clone fell for a tree above the Iwa team landing between the three and making them scatter in opposite directions. Something Naruto planned on happening from the beginning. Naruto had the clone lunge at the two shinobi who were closest together and had the clone detonate itself with a great clone explosion, creating a cloud of dust and debris that filled the forest floor. The real Naruto slipped behind the one Iwa shinobi who he had kicked earlier and pulled him into the forest line after delivering a knife strike to the back of his neck, rendering him unconscious. That is one down. Two more to go. The temporary smoke screen cleared and the two stone-wielding shinobi looked around a little more wearily since they could not find their other teammate in the immediate area. 
Naruto came back out and revealed himself to the two shinobi from the Wagakur, getting them to tense up and rearm themselves with their stone weaponry. The shinobi with the stone spear charged forward and tried to impale Naruto who slid to the side so Naruto could pin the spear to his side, allowing Naruto to deliver a backhand to the Iwa shinobi hard enough to get him to release the spear of stone and tumble away. The shinobi with rock gloves engaged Naruto again throwing a mix of jabs and hooks at Naruto's head, who was manipulating the spear to fend off the teen's hands. The Iwa shinobi struck the spear in the perfect spot, which caused the spear to snap in half, leaving Naruto holding the two ends. Naruto took a moment and adjusted his grip so that he was holding the jagged ends of the former spear like daggers. The exchange began anew with the Iwa shinobi continued throwing jabs as he bounced on the heels of his feet. Naruto used the spears to stab the Iwa shinobi's knuckles, slowly chipping away the nin's rock gauntlets. The Iwa nin winced in pain and with a small, determined cry, threw a powerful hook to Naruto's jaw that turned his head from the impact, making Naruto spit out some blood. Shaking his head slightly to gather his bearings, Naruto examined the ends of the spear and saw that they were dulled from colliding with an in-stone coated hands. Now with a pair of clubs Naruto weaved through a series of body strikes, finally seeing the pattern behind the Wagaker Genin's attacks, making them easier to avoid. Naruto bashed the clubs on the teen's shoulders, making the boy cry out in pain and tried to react with a second wide hook. Predicting the rather generic movement, Naruto was able to block the blow with one of the stone clubs. Knee lifting the shinobi in the gut forcing him to lurch forward, Naruto dropped the club and hit the shinobi with an uppercut taking him into the air. The shinobi Naruto backhanded away, got back to his feet and glared at Naruto's back while going through a series of hand signs. Earth release. Rising impalement. A row of spikes shot from the earth below starting at the shinobi's feet and continuing onward towards Naruto's unprotected back. Naruto quickly gathered the necessary amount of chakra and performed a quick substitution with the Iwa Nin he had sent up into the air. The shinobi had no idea what happened. One moment he felt himself reach the apex of the flight and then the next he felt a wet warm sensation where his heart was. The teammate who was holding the spear had a look of terror plastered on his face when he realized it was his teammate at the end of his spear instead of Naruto. Naruto, who had taken the Iwa shinobi's position in the air, landed on his feet looking at the last of the remaining shinobi with the same blank look. Naruto had utilized a substitution with another person, a tactic not normally used due to the large amount of chakra it takes. To change places with a target a shinobi would need to have more chakra than his or her target, as well as be able to temporarily control the chakra to initiate the position change. The Iwa shinobi's eyes started to fade before he fell forward on the ground dead, leaving a traumatized backstabber to stare at his handiwork. Naruto slowly walked around the Iwa shinobi who was only staring at his one-time best friend, with tears streaming down his face in a state of disbelief. Running his hand over one of the crimson magatama on his grey zip-up vest, Naruto was rewarded with a kunai. Naruto thrusted the black steel right through the shock teen's back right through the heart, effectively ending his life. Naruto watched on stoically as the boy's body fell in line with the other body lying there. Naruto remembering the purpose of this test scavenged through the pouches both shinobi had on their person and search for the scrolls necessary to pass the test. He found what he was looking for in the second boy's shuriken pouch. Apparently they had both of the scrolls and only needed to get to the tower. Yet they let their ignorance get in the way and decided to try and avenge those who have died in war though I must thank them for showing me how much I need to work on my tojutsu. Naruto pocketed both scrolls just in case he needed them for negotiating or just so he could keep another team out of the next round. Taking a moment's rest before heading off towards the tower, Naruto caught something out of the corner of his eye. The leaves above his head were rustling and that was when a giant spider fell down trying to devour Naruto head first. Acting quickly Naruto used twilight to bisect the arachnid watching as it shrieked and its legs curled before dying. Naruto sighed as he flicked off the creature's green blood. It was just one of those days. Elsewhere in the forest teammate was having its own troubles with a team from the Wagaker. It was the team that Naruto saw entering the village. The leaf shinobi were panting softly with sweat running down their foreheads. Each and every one won their clan were just not cutting it against the opponents they were matched up against. The Nada rushed forward in her gentle fist stance and delivered a number of debilitating strikes to the much larger Iwa shinobi. Akatsuchi however just shrugged off the chakra enhanced strikes thanks to the earth armor he was sporting. Each blow just hit the armor but the chakra was not able to penetrate the armor the large man was wearing. You were pretty good with your clan lady but you just ran into the wrong opponent today. That happens sometimes. Akatsuchi said more to himself than Hinata while stroking his chin pensively earning a large sweat drop from the Hyuga princess. Shaking his head Akatsuchi moved quickly for someone his size and dropped his fist down on Hinata's head. Hinata using her natural flexibility managed to leap back at the last moment as Akatsuchi's fist made a small crater in the ground. 
Akatsuchi looked up with the same dopey smile he always wore that could easily lull an enemy into a false sense of security. I am sorry. I do not wish to harm you, but I can't lose here. I still have much to prove to someone. Hinata said resolutely in one of her rare moments of confidence that her Byakugan was active and staring intently at Akatsuchi. The Hyuga heiress quickly closed in on the large man from Iowa before stopping in front of him in a stance of the gentle fist. 8 trigrams 32 palms. Hinata cried out slamming her palms into the shinobi's chest over and over as she nailed half of the man's in hopes of shutting him down for good but not killing the Iowa nin. Akatsuchi's shoulders dropped making Hinata believe she had won the battle, but she was mistaken because the next moment she was knocked to the ground by a leg sweep. Hinata looked up in confusion seeing Akatsuchi standing there with that same smile, as if he had not been touched at all. That was a pretty tough attack there Hayuga-san. It actually broke through the armor a few times. You are plenty strong, but I think it is time we finish this. Akatsuchi said in a friendly voice as he put his palms into the earth at his feet. Hinata tried to get up but found that her ankle was twisted from the fall. Earth release. Terracotta prison. Hinata watched helplessly as walls started to rise up all around her in a rectangular formation. There was a loud crash where the walls locked together above her trapping her in the prison. Hinata felt herself getting weaker and weaker and was left wondering what was happening to her. As if he could read her mind, Akatsuchi's voice came through the walls of the prison. I always get yelled at for explaining things, but if you activate your Byakugan you will see what is happening, so I'll just tell you. The terracotta prison takes the inmate's chakra and uses it to strengthen the walls. Don't worry I made sure to make the technique end when you go unconscious. Despite her situation Hinata smiled since she would not be killed in this dreadful forest. Shino and his bugs too were having difficulty with his opponent from Iowa due to her fire that just kept melting before they could hit her. Shino was silently blaming himself for not preparing his hive more extensively for this exam as he watched Kuritsuchi burn down another wave of his beetles. Is that the best you got bug boy? You better hurry up and step it up or I will end up crushing you. The granddaughter of the Tsuchikage taunted the Aburam who under his sunglasses had a twitching brow from all of the bug-based insults. Let it be known that normally an Aburam will be logical but truly hate when people refer to them as bugs and even more so when someone speaks of killing insects. Shino raised his arms where another much larger wave of parasitic insects raced at the Iwa Kinoichi. Kuritsuchi who was too busy laughing at her own puns to avoid the bugs was soon encased in the chakra eaters. Just when Shino thought his victory was assured his insects scattered revealing a log used as a substitution to avoid being a beetle meal. Kuritsuchi appeared behind the bug user and kicked him in the spine, sending him sliding towards her original position. Hey. You just irritated me, beetle boy. Now I am going to burn you until you are a pile of ashes. Kuritsuchi said confidently while pointing a finger at the calm aburum. Shino said nothing and continued to stare at Kuritsuchi who sighed in turn. Why am I the one who always gets stuck with the silent types? They are never any fun to mess with. Do not worry I win in this is all over. Nin. Insect sphere. Kuritsuchi blinked in confusion, but then the lighting around her started to dim. Looking up the Iwa Kinoichi saw a large sphere of beetles closing in on her completely. Shino watched as she was encased by the beetles he left on the ground the moment before she kicked him away. Shino waited for his beetles to finish the job lowering his arms and waiting. That was when there was red glow of a human silhouette under the black mass of chakra eating insects. Shino moved to reinforce the sphere just in case, but it was too late. Empton. Eruption. Kuritsuchi bellowed from under the beetles angrily because this was the second time she found herself under Shino's bugs. The beetles started to launch off of the Iwagakur Kinoichi, each covered by small globs of lava, making them deadly projectiles. Shino did his best to avoid the flaming insects however he was caught a few times from the loose hanging clothing on his body. Kuritsuchi who was now free looked absolutely livid with steam coming from her shoulders from her last technique, which only added onto the any visage. Okay now I am really pissed at Aburam. It is time to finish you off so I can get away from all these damn bugs. Shino did not even notice Kuritsuchi preparing another, he was so preoccupied with dodging his insects turned missiles, the numbers obviously coming back to bite him. What a release. Water trumpet. Kuritsuchi gathered up water in her mouth and used her hand to shape the water jet, giving it the appearance of a trumpet shooting it towards Shino. Shino looked up at the last moment to see the powerful jet slam into his chest and blast him into a thick oak tree. The pressure continued pinning him to the tree, his head whip lashing back and slamming into the solid bark, knocking the bug user unconscious. Kuritsuchi searched through Shino's coat and found her desired object, the heaven scroll. Hiba, like the rest of his team, was finding he had no luck with the diver helmet wearing Kinoichi from Iowa. The Inuzuka heir looked down to see the skin on his knuckles burned quite badly, which confused him since he hadn't seen it being used. Kiba had only managed to land a few strikes on the Kinoichi, but they had done minimal to no damage. 
The ground around them was marked with craters from Kiba and Akamaru's of Jitsuga, which the Kanoichi avoided each time. Kiba looked over at his partner to see his white fur covered with dirt and scratches, but nothing too serious. Kiba shook his hands that had a continuous stinging sensation coming from them, which the young Inuzuka couldn't figure out the cause of. Looking back at the foreign Kanoichi, Kiba grinned at her despite the pain he was feeling. I don't know why you wear that helmet. It hides your pretty little face. Kiba said in what he thought was a smooth tone of voice stating what he thought to be a fact. Akamaru let out a small groan not believing his master would actually try to hit on someone in the middle of a battle. Poor little Akamaru. He probably should put Kiba on a leash. The Wagaker Kanoichi did not show any positive reaction to Kiba's words, as matter of fact she showed no reaction. The look on her beautiful face was one of complete and utter boredom. Obviously Kiba was not providing any kind of excitement for her. You're not my type. I would say sorry, but I'm really not. She said getting an angry frown from Kiba as she looked up at the sky and thought. No, there is nothing important about this mutt. Not like him. The Kanoichi thought with a longing sigh as she remembered the presence Naruto exuded. In that brief moment she knew the raven-haired son of the Hokage would be someone important. In that brief moment she knew she had to have him. What did you say you bitch? Oh stupid Kiba. You never call a woman that, ever. The Kanoichi's grey eyes suddenly had a dangerous glint in them as Kiba's words reached her just after she left her inner workings. A murderous black aura surrounded her, and Kiba thought he saw an oni mask glaring through his soul, but that was just a killer intent illusion. What did you say mutt? Both humans knew that this question was rhetorical, but Kiba couldn't find his tongue to respond. Akamaru slowly backed away and hid inside of a bush to leave his master to the fate he brought upon himself. The air around the Kanoichi started to shimmer before screams of pain echoed out in the woods. The Iwa Shinobi team all gathered back together in the place where they originally split up Lee's teammate. None of the shinobi had a mark on them, nor were they even breathing hard, they were just fine. It looks like your opponents were letdowns as well huh? Guritsuchi asked while twirling the scroll she liberated from Shino, while her teammates nodded their heads to the more confident member of the team. Alright then. Let's go find a spot to camp out for the rest of the day and night. We have plenty of time left. No need to rush. As the Iwa team went to find a suitable place to camp for the next sun and moon cycle, another presence landed on the floor. It was Kurana Yuhi, the sensei of Team 8, who had come to collect her unconscious team. The reason was she had seen how a number of large, hungry bears were nearing each of her students. Sure it would disqualify them, but it was better than them being meals for the animals of the forest. Using a Jinjutsu to knock out the bears, Kurunai took her team to the hospital for treatment and a rest period. The four-man squad from Kumagakur found themselves in a rather tight situation, as they stood surrounded by three different teams. They had found themselves in battle for the better part of half an hour with a team from Omegakur, Takigakur and Yugakur. Each time any of the shinobi from Kumo had a chance to finish off one of the nine various ninjas they were chased off by another one of the nine shinobi. Amoy and Kerry were clashing with two nin from AIM who were using an umbrella blade. Initially they thought their teamwork would win out, but the two AIM nin were quite the partnership as well, and were holding their own. Samui who at the start managed to kill one of the AIM shinobi with a sneak attack lightning, was now facing off with a shinobi team from the hidden waterfall village. Samui's tanto was broken from the water blade technique that the Kanoichi from Taki had armed herself with. Samui had managed to fend off the water element using shinobi thanks to her lightning affinity, but the numbers had kept them at a deadlock. Yet if the fight continued as it was Samui would surely lose because she was only one person therefore one source of chakra, while they had three. Yujido was the one having the most trouble however, because of the odd fighting styles each of the Yugakur shinobi had individually. One of the teens had claws made of metal blades that extended out that were very compatible with his natural quickness. The next was a Kanoichi who was wearing a large chakram like a large hoop, but with a bladed outside. The third shinobi wielded a serrated side that looked more designed to cut than stab. Even if Yujido was the Jinchuriki of the Nibi these people still defied conventional fighting methods, providing challenges that were foreign to Kumo's Hellcat. Ujido had to use the two tails chakra to lengthen her nails into claws of her own to combat the metal claws of the Yugakur shinobi. The few kunai she had tried to use were not long enough to keep up with the eccentric combat she found herself in. Ujido moved to the side avoiding a slash from the claw-wielding ninja which she responded to with a swipe of her own which he blocked with his overhand. Ujido was forced to backflip away before the chakram-wielding kunoichi bisected her at the stomach. Ujido's slitted eyes narrowed at the two shinobi, focusing on trying to find flaws. It was this focus that left the Kumo Jinchuriki open to an attack. Hidden there's one behind you. The Nibi's alarmed shout broke Yujido from her planning realizing what was about to happen, and she braced herself for the hurt. The Nibi too was trying to recall seeing such fighting styles and slacked on sensing the area around her container. Samui also shouted out a warning, but Yujido only heard Nibi's warning. 
Samui's rare voice raising got the attention of Kari and Amoy who looked at Yujito with horrified and startled expressions, seeing what Samui was seeing. The two shinobi from Yugakur shared a glance and a smug grin, seeing as they were about to take one of the pesky kumonin out. Finally I will get to sacrifice someone to Jashin-sama. The black-haired boy shouted with an insane glee, swinging his scythe down on Yujito's exposed back with his tongue hanging from the side of his mouth and eyes bright with an insane mirth. Clang. The Jashina's eyes widened when he saw his single scythe blade being held at bay by a blade that was black, white and grey. The teen looked down the blade to see a black-haired shinobi from the hidden leaf was the one who saved Yujito. The sound of metal hitting metal stopped all the fighting going on. Each and every shinobi recognized who Naruto was thanks to Kabuto's information back before the first stage. Yujito and the Kumonin were both shocked and immensely relieved by Naruto's timely intervention. And Naruto. Yujito whispered out trying to validate what she was seeing as real. Naruto who was still holding off the side with Twilight without any difficulty, turned over his shoulder and gave Yujito a small grin and a nod. Then Naruto quickly threw his katana up, bringing the side with it, leaving the team from Yugakur open up to the kick Naruto delivered to the team. With the catastrophe averted both sides regrouped staring at each other intently and some hostility. Well not Naruto he was just holding Twilight while staring at the strange chain around the Jashina's neck. It was a circle with an upside down triangle inside of it, which got Naruto to make a note to look up that term. If there is one thing I can't stand. That is weak people. It is even worse when the weak team tries to attack something they can't fight on their own. It is truly pathetic. Naruto said in a calm voice that only infuriated the minor village who saw it for what it was a metaphor for the minor and major hidden villages. The Kumo team looked at Naruto from the corner of their eyes, just in case Naruto tried something against them as well. That's right, Ninjin. There is nothing worse than a coalition of the weak. If anything they are fun to destroy and that's all. Naruto mentally nodded in agreement with the tailed beast inside of his mind, since he too shared that sentiment. You think you are so great just because you are a shinobi of one of those great shinobi villages. There is no difference between your five and us eight. One of the Taki shinobi challenged boldly. He was tired of being underestimated simply because he was born into Kigakur instead of somewhere like Kumagakur or Kanahagakur. He knew of the great shinobi like Kakuzu who could fight with someone like the first Hokage had come from his village. Yet here was a leaf run talking trash about his home and it was simply unacceptable. He needed to be shown how weak they were. Oh? You wish for a demonstration then? Naruto asked, arching the eyebrow that was hidden by his hanging bang. While he was speaking to the eight minor villages, Nin Naruto was motioning the Kumagakur squad to prepare themselves. Very well my minor village friends we shall have a display. Naruto said with no small amount of amusement as he suddenly vanished from the side of the genin, only Yujito and Samui able to see him. Not even a moment later Naruto was behind the Jashinist with Twilight ready to strike decisively. And strike decisively Twilight did because it took off the arm the Jashinist was using to wield the scythe. The team from the village hidden in hot water screamed out in pain as his arm fell to the ground with a thud. Now if he was a good little Jashinist he would be feeling euphoria instead of pain. Bad Jashinist. Amoy and Kari quickly charged at the two aim shinobi in hopes of catching them off guard, but they were able to block the swords with their umbrella blades because they were the furthest away from the now one-armed shinobi. Samui also followed her teammates by unleashing a lightning that sped across the forest floor and shocked one of Taki Nin, who was too busy gaping at the armless team from Yugakur. Yujito had taken the opportunity presented and released a ball of flames that engulfed one of the two remaining Taki shinobi, killing the shinobi. Naruto nodded in that one moment they were able to reduce their numbers 8 to 5. Shock is truly a powerful emotion. Naruto said moving away from a claw slash from one of the Yugakur shinobi moving back towards the Samui and Yujito who were reading for the next exchange. The Kanoichi using the chakram was busy trying to bandage the major wound her teammate suffered from Naruto's demonstration. The one responsible merely shook his head because without the mystic palm technique the team would die from blood loss, bandages just wouldn't cut it. Naruto glanced to his right and saw Samui was staring at the Taki Kanoichi, and Yujito was looking at the boy wearing claws. Looks like they have chosen their opponents. Ninten. Raining grass shower. The two Omegakur shinobi threw their umbrellas into the air where they began to spin like a top. Picking up speed the umbrellas began to throw off hundreds of little grass that all came down upon Amoy and Kari who looked at each other and nodded their heads. Cloud style. Ultimate beheading. The two tan ninja from Kumo shouted in unison as they slashed their swords hundreds of times in the span of the few moments it would have taken for the needles to fall. Soon the needles were all diced and cut into thin sections that fell harmlessly onto the ground. Before the aim nin could catch their umbrella blades Amoy and Kari raced forward and delivered a slash to their midsections, cutting them open and making them drop to their knees. Samui had her opponent on the back foot as well, thanks to the elemental advantage lightning had over water. 
before with her two teammates the Kanoichi managed to hold off the lightning user from Kumo, but now without the numbers the Takinin knew she was in a losing battle. Samui performed a number of hand signs and held her fingers like a sight, a sight that took aim at the enemy Kanoichi. Lightning release. Shock cannon. A blast of electricity flew from Samui's outstretched hand and coursed through the Takinin, making her body spasm before it shut down on her. Ijido was clashing over and over with the shinobi from Utica, using her own chakra-infused nails as claws to combat the metal claws of the teen. Taking a slash Ujido was forced back as the man used his slightly longer arms to keep the Kumo Jinchuriki at bay. The longer the confrontation stretched on the more irritated Ujido was getting. Having enough of the game of cat and mouse Ujido channeled some of the Nibi's chakra into her legs and vanished from the man's sight. Reappearing behind Ujido clawed up his back and neck, cutting his skin deep, before slamming her heel into the back of his head. The Kumo team regrouped and looked over to where Naruto was only to find the other two shinobi from Yugakur lying on top each other one dead and the other unconscious, with an earth scroll sitting on top of the bodies. Samui looked at her teammates and shrugged since it saved them some work. Cool. Chapter 6. One month reprieve. Naruto had just taken his leave from the Kumo team and his second battle in the forest of death when the central tower came into his view. Naruto let a satisfied smile come to his face at the sight of his goal. Naruto was only a few steps from the tower when something from the depths of the forest caught his attention. It was a sudden burst of energy that was cold and dark in its nature, so much so that it made Naruto falter in mid-stride, so he could let his vision linger in the general area that the energy came from. Naruto briefly entertained the idea of investigating this negative energy's origins, but ultimately decided against it. Not my problem, but if it becomes my problem then I will deal with it. Naruto assured himself before entering the tower and walking into the room that was coupled with his gate number. Naruto calmly walked into the room that was empty for the most part, except for an inscription on the far wall. The inscription told of the ideas of heaven and earth as related to the body, yet there were sections from each part missing. Naruto glanced momentarily at the heaven and earth scrolls resting in his grip and tossed them to the floor, letting the scrolls unravel. Naruto saw the formula for a summoning on the scrolls before the room was filled with a cloud of smoke. Naruto acting on instinct reached behind him and drew twilight treating whatever that had been called as hostile. Naruto held his sword arm steady as he calmly waited for the smoke to clear away and the visibility to return. Eventually the smoke cleared when Naruto found himself looking at a leaf nin who was wearing sunglasses with red rims. The man was looking down at the tip of Naruto's katana, which was right at his Adam's apple. Naruto slowly lowered his katana before placing it where it was on his back. This earned Naruto a sigh of relief from the older leaf shinobi. Aoba-san what are you doing here? Naruto asked politely with his arms crossed over the front of his chest. The only sign of curiosity coming from the teen was the single arched eyebrow, while his eyes bore into Aoba with a natural intensity. I am here to explain to you this inscription. You see if your body is lacking physical strength, speed or endurance, then you will not succeed as a chunin. Earth refers to your body. However, that doesn't mean that a strong body is all you need. As a chunin you will also need to make use of your mind, your mental capability that is heaven. Aoba filled in the blanks that were on the wall which had Naruto nodding his head slowly, since what the older shinobi was saying made perfect sense. An idiot with power was just as useless as a genius with no strength. Though since I personally have seen your skills in both of those fields, I don't feel the need to tell you what you already know. You are the third team to make it here, and you will find a rest area behind the door to the left. Aoba informed his charge. Naruto bowed slightly to the man in thanks for his words as well as his explanation. Naruto watched as Aoba took his leave before taking his own leave from the room, leaving the scrolls crossed on the floor. Naruto calmly strolled through the common resting area towards the stairs that took the participants to the bedrooms. Naruto slowly walked past two of the shinobi hailing from Sunagakur, ignoring the boy in the cat bodysuit who looked as pale as a bedsheet and the girl with a fan who was currently muttering into her hand, probably insulting her brother. Naruto deduced that the problems were revolving around their jinchuriki of a brother. Naruto was glad that he was not mentally unstable, or else he would be sorely tempted to test the controlling abilities of the Sharingan. Maybe the spirit of the desert has an inferiority complex due to him being the fewest of the tailed beast. That is actually quite hysterical. Naruto wondered why Kaiubi did not respond to his cynical comment which the fox seemed to like. Naruto just assumed that the large kitsune was asleep, which seemed to be his second favorite activity behind destroying Ichiha. Maybe one day we can have a spar in Kaiubi. My eyes versus your legendary power. It will be the match of the century. Naruto's blood started to pump just thinking of fighting something as powerful as the Kaiubi, but the young Ichiha knew that would be much further down the road. Believing he could fight the strongest of the tailed beasts as he was would be just downright foolish. Naruto was a few steps from the base of the stairs when two boys came down from the stairs talking to each other rather happily. 
The boy on the left had short messy black hair that just covered the top of his Takigakur headband. His brown eyes were trained on the boy to his right, and aside from the red scarf hanging from his neck, there was nothing special about the team. The other Takigakur shinobi had darker skin than his teammate and had a shaved haircut and green eyes. The only thing really different about this team was the blue scarf he had wrapped around his neck. That demon bitch thinks she can call the shots on our team? What a joke she was lucky we let her use that curse of hers to gather the scroll we needed. Red said cruelly while trying not to laugh at the thought of the demon being in charge. The boy with the blue scarf nodded his head, but unlike the shinobi wearing red he was laughing openly. Naruto catching their words stopped at the bottom of the steps as they continued to descend from the second floor. The word demon always made Naruto go to a place few had seen from the raven-haired teen. Yeah like that would ever happen. Did you see the look on her face when she thought we had accepted her? Oh I think I saw the tears following behind her as she ran to the training ground. What a ride. Blue said with a smirk of his own as he looked down the hallway at the far end of the large room. The shinobi with the red scarf just chuckled at the blue scarf's words as if they were the first joke ever invented. Naruto took one moment to check the area and made sure they were alone as the two Taki nin made it off of the staircase. Naruto threw the two Taki shinobi against a wall so hard that it created a spiderweb-like crack in the stone structure and drew the breath from their lungs. The two scarf-wearing teens looked up in disbelief and bewilderment, wondering what just hit them. In that moment they really wished they hadn't because they were gazing right into the red slitted eyes of Naruto. Do you care to repeat just what you said? Naruto's voice was dark to the point where it was almost feral in nature. To make matters worse for the taxi in Naruto's body began to release a murderous black aura that shrouded his body. The two waterfall village shinobi began to shake like a leaf that was fluttering freely in a strong wind. Normally Naruto would find such cowardice entertaining after hearing their bold words, but when the word demon was attached to another being Naruto was not one for games. The boy with the red scarf could not find enough resolve to answer Naruto who looked like the Shinigami in human form. Fortunately for him the boy with the blue scarf was too blinded by his bigotry to swallow his tongue. W why do you care about that demon? She is the reason I lost my parents and causes the problems in our village. The boy shouted angrily at Naruto, not understanding the difference between the human sacrifice and the tailed beast. Naruto was slowly losing the very thin amount of patience he had for the two foreign shinobi he had at his mercy. Answer. My. Question filth. Naruto's voice deepened even more, making the boy in the red scarf truly believe it was his time to visit oblivion. The black aura around Naruto started to wave violently and sporadically slowly threatening to consume the two bigots. The shinobi with the red scarf in an effort to try and save his skin quickly answered Naruto before his teammate could infuriate the hidden leaf demon further. As she ran off to the training ground to be alone. T that's all we know I promise. Just don't kill us please. The teen begged as Naruto's slitted eyes pierced through his very soul in an attempt to discern any lie or deceit. Naruto, deeming the boy was telling the truth, called back his murderous intent, but it caused an aftershock that rendered both Takigakur shinobi unconscious against the wall. Naruto's eyes turned back to the calm blue they normally took as he made his way towards the training ground provided for the teams who had completed their task. It only took the Hokage's son a few moments to step into the open training ground. Naruto heard sobbing echoing in the room, all of which were coming from a green-haired Kinoichi who had her legs in front of her and her arms wrapped around them in a protective way. Her shinobi gear consisted of a white top that ended midriff with a fishnet armor underneath of it. Her forearms were covered by white sections of the same clothing and a red cylinder-shaped object on her back. Naruto immediately picked out the Taki forehead protector on her right arm. Naruto took a few calming breaths before he tried to talk to the distraught container because the last thing he wanted was to come off threateningly. Naruto slowly walked over to where the green-haired girl was crying and slowly lowered himself so he was sitting next to her. The girl had yet to realize Naruto was sitting there due to her emotional state, something which Naruto took notice of. To gain her attention Naruto coughed once which got her to pause her crying, but not to look up from her knees. Go away. I'm not even doing anything to bother you. All I'm doing is being alone like the world seems to like it. The girl screamed at Naruto, though her voice was hoarse from all of the sobbing she was doing at the moment. Why would I want to leave you all alone? It looks like you could use some company for me. Naruto said calmly in the softest voice he could manage as he looked ahead. The girl's body tensed at hearing an unfamiliar voice so close to her. Looking up, curious as to who was so close to her, she saw Naruto's face and his blue eyes that were looking straight ahead. Naruto turned his head and his blue eyes locked with her orange eyes, where he flashed a small smile to the girl whose eyes were red from crying. I'm sure you know who I am by now, so may I ask for your name, then miss. The green hair girl simply stared at the teen who she knew was the son of the fourth Hokage, which would basically make him like a prince in Konoha. Why is he even speaking to someone like me? The girl asked herself as she remembered the brief moment her eyes met Naruto's where she saw so much. 
the most people Naruto's eyes were cold and uncaring, but to her someone who had been scorned her entire life, they were so warm and accepting. There was no malice in those blue eyes, it was those eyes that made her feel something she had long forsaken. Hope. And my name is Fu, but you shouldn't be talking to someone like me. I mean you are the son of the fourth Hokage and all. Fu's voice was so low that if Naruto was not as close as he was, he would not have been able to hear Fu introduce herself to him. His hand did twitch slightly when Fu called him Minato's son, but he would let it slide, seeing how depressed the Kinoichi was. Why wouldn't I want to talk to someone I can empathize with so deeply? Naruto asked rhetorically as he looked out over the training ground with a faraway look in his azure eyes. Naruto's faraway gaze was due to the rush of memories of how terrible his childhood was. How he had people who were meant to protect him yet they abandoned him. Life as a Jinchuriki was hell that much was true. The look of unmistakable sorrow in Fu's orange eyes quickly morphed into a look of uncontainable fury. How could this well-off guy even think he could possibly relate to my pain? Fu's fists clenched as her teeth ground against each other as she tried to rein in her rage caused by Naruto's words. How could you even think you know anything about the life that was forced onto me? You know nothing. Fu challenged Naruto's words not believing someone as important as he could possibly be hated. The truth is that ever since Mihik had taken Naruto away the hate-filled populace of Konoha had forgotten about its pariah. Naruto scoffed not at Fu, but at the idea of being loved by the parasites that had infested the hidden leaf. That was something Naruto had blamed on Minato, but also on the Nidame Hokage for creating the civilian council. Naruto always wondered what a militant leader like Taburama Senju was thinking when he passed that doctrine. Foolish Senju. Naruto's inner Ichiha perked up at the chance to insult their blood rivals. Naruto looked back at Fu allowing her to see the bitter look in his eyes. At first Fu thought it was directed at her, but upon closer examination, she could tell it was something else that caused the raven-haired boy next to her so much pain. This village will never accept me. No nothing here will change until the older generation is wiped away and the new generation takes its place, clean of useless hate. I will tell you the story of my life Fu and then you can make the decision if our lives are comparable. On October 10, Kaiubi attacked Kanoha. Naruto ignored Kaiubi's indignant grunt from the back of his mind. The fourth Hokage then battled with the Kaiubi, and with the assistance of his wife's special binding chakra chains, managed to temporarily subdue the Kaiubi. The fourth then did something to ensure the balance of power in our shinobi world, he created two Jinchurikis. The two Jinchuriki were his daughters, and each had a part of the Kaiubi's chakra sealed into them, one with yin and the other yang. This left the nine tails with just a consciousness which he needed to seal as well to prevent the Kaiubi from reforming in the future. He sealed that consciousness into me. It does not end there however. No then next he revealed to the villagers just what he had done to the Kaiubi. After his small speech the village hailed the two girls as heroines and princesses. I was scorned however, as people believed me to be the Kaiubi wearing human skin coming back to kill more of their loved ones. Not even the great Yandame's name could save me from the hate and the beatings. Naruto then went into detail on a number of beatings he had received from the civilians and shinobi of the village. Some of the things that Naruto told her made her stomach twist and turn, and before she knew it her cheeks were moist and eyes were misty. I was given the hatred of a Jinchuriki, but none of the power that accompanies that deep endless sorrow. To make things worse I had a family who was plenty capable of keeping me safe from the mountain of hatred that was crushing me. Eventually though people saw my struggle and slowly removed that burden from my shoulders and accelerated my growth to make me what I am today. Naruto ended his tale with a small smile as he pictured the faces of his precious people lingering in front of him. Fu was looking at Naruto in admiration, wondering how he could be so strong under such dire circumstances. He is not lying to you Fu girl. I can definitely sense the Kaiubi coming from the boy. He is like you. Chimei the seven-tailed beetle spoke up for the first time since Naruto had shown up at the training ground. Fu and Chimei had one of the more friendly relationships out of the Jinchuriki and tailed beasts. Chimei felt an incredible guilt at what his presence had done to Fu who was such a sweet girl. Chimei, why are humans such a bunch of irrational fools? Fu asked sadly as she continued to stare at Naruto, who was sitting there with his eyes closed. Now that my child is something even I do not know the answer to. Naruto calming his tumultuous emotions opened his eyes and turned to look at the green-haired Kinoichi sitting next to him. Now then Fu-chan, will you tell me your story? Naruto asked with a small smile. Fu's tan cheek sported a small blush at having been addressed in such a way, a way that was foreign to her. Never had a boy her age called her that since their favorites were demon or demon whore. The only person to call her that was Shibuki, the village leader who was like an elder brother to her. Managing to kill the blush, Fu gave a small nod in response to Naruto's inquiry. Unlike Kanahagakur, Takigakur is always in a battle to continue to fund things such as development and research units due to our minor village status. For that reason they trained me to become their weapon, to protect the citizens of the village. The very same citizens who would rather watch me burn than try to help me. 
My elder brother, Shibuki can only do so much, since he does not have that much political sway, since he only recently took over as head of the village. Fu gave Naruto a small rundown of the domestic state of Taki, to which Naruto nodded slightly, since the information seemed accurate enough. Since we don't have a large shinobi roster like the other hidden villages, the civilian side of the council agreed to have me try and master the Seven Tails Chakra. To keep me in check they usually keep a seal collar around my neck. I am forced to live in the great tree located at the center of the village away from the villagers. I live on a stipend I get from Shibuki that I can only spend at a few stores that don't have the sign of the beetle hanging from their doors. Fu's voice took a small hint of anger at the mention of the villagers of Taki, not that Naruto would admonish her for that. They then assigned me to a team for these Chunin exams, since it would be a good way to show off some of Taki's strength and hopefully draw in more business. I guess I foolishly thought that my team would accept me, but I see how wrong I was. Fu could feel the tears welling up in her eyes again and moved to hug her legs again when she felt something warm around her. Fu then realized that it was Naruto who was hugging her tightly, the action alone making her eyes widen in shock. Never before had anyone been so caring towards her, and here was the boy she literally met maybe an hour ago hugging her. It will be alright, you just need to keep on being strong Fu-chan. Naruto whispered into her ear consolingly breaking Fu's emotional dam. Fu let her head drop onto Naruto's shoulder where she began to cry. Naruto just struck her back as he felt the fabric on his shoulder dampen from the mint hair Jinchuriki's tears. Naruto held Fu for around 10 minutes until Fu managed to gain back control over her tear ducts. Naruto pulled back from the hug, making Fu miss the contact of his body. Say Fu-chan, would you like to leave Taki and stay here in Kanoha with me? Naruto asked seemingly out of left field which made Fu recoil in surprise. W what I don't think the council would let their most powerful asset go just like Naruto kun. Fu said honestly but secretly liked the idea of joining Naruto and living in Kanoha and away from the village that she currently resided in. Jamei was also listening intently since this seemed like the perfect opportunity to get his container away from that cesspit of a village. Naruto's smile slowly changed into a devious grin that spread across his face. To Fu it reminded her of a fox, to Jamei it reminded him of when the Kaiubi would actually indulge his prankster side. To both container and tailed beast, they could only wonder what Naruto was planning in that head of his. Now don't you worry you'll find out soon enough Fu-chan. All in time. Naruto stood at the far end of the line of Chunin hopefuls that were all staring at one man, and that man was the fourth Hokage of the village hidden in the leaves. All of them except for Naruto who was more entertained with the single bang hanging over his eye. Rather than look at the man who was meant to be his father, Naruto pushed the bang from his face, showing his hidden leaf headband. I wish to congratulate all of you for making it through our forest of death while also being able to accomplish your objective. It is now that we will determine the draw for the final stage of the Chunin exams. A few of the more intelligent genin picked up the fact that the yellow flash had used a word draw to describe the final stage and pieced together what he meant. Normally we would have a round of preliminaries to lessen the number of combatants in the tournament, but considering the magnitude of these exams, all of the cage have agreed to hold the tournament over a three-day time span, where each cage from the major villages as well as the daimyos would attend to witness this generation's best.The fourth Hokage ended getting wide eyes from the genin who just realized how many powerful shinobi would be gathering in Kanoha, aside from Naruto that is who just appeared bored. Anko walked up beside Minato holding a box with a hole in the lid big enough for a hand to fit through. When you are called you will come forth and draw a number that will slate you in a position for the tourney. The Hokage turned to Anko who nodded her head showing she was ready to begin. Minato called out to each genin who drew a number that Anko would relay to a man behind a monitor who was typing away furiously. Naruto slowly walked up when called and Minato gave him a smile just like he had Narumi and Naomi, but when they returned the gesture Naruto just walked past him and picked his number. Another handful of genin later and the bracket was filled out, Minato nodded his head telling the typist to reveal the tourney. Bracket 1, Niji Hayuga vs Akatsuchi, Intao vs Yujido Nai, Brock Lee vs Kuritsuchi, Ara Sabaku vs Akura Haruno, Bracket 2, Ferry vs Kankuro Sabaku, Ten Ten vs Naomi Namikaze Uzumaki, Ku vs Dosu Kanuda, Hintsuchi vs Yuninara, A1 Intermission, Bracket 3, Zaku Abumi vs Narumi Namikaze Uzumaki, Henry vs Choji Akamichi, Ino Yamanaka vs Hakuyuki, The Kujo vs Samui, Bracket 4, Dejuro vs Amoi, Damari Sabaku vs Shikamaranara, Shiku vs Terra, Naruto Namikaze Uzumaki vs Sasuke Cha. The genin all searched the giant monitor board for their name and who their opponent would be, and once they did the genin all tried to identify who that opponent was. Sasuke found Naruto's apathetic gaze and smirked confidently at the Hokage's scorned son who just looked on impassively. Hey Kaiubi, do you want to see me mess with an Achiha? Naruto asked full well knowing the answer he would get from the massive chakra. Ninjin, there is nothing more that I like than seeing the suffering of an Achiha. 
Kairubi was just about to take a nap, but he was now wide awake, not wanting to miss a chance to see Ichiha's pain. Naruto nodded and closed his eyes and slowly opened them in a perfect replica of a look Itachi would always give him. Sasuke recognized the look from the face of his traitorous brother and growled as the curse on his neck spread slowly. Before Sasuke could attempt to harm his opponent, Kakashi appeared behind his pupil and placed a hand on his shoulder before body flickering away to seal off the curse mark. Naruto and the Kaiubi wore identical, amused grins that showcased their fangs quite menacingly. Chijuro who at that moment spared a glance at Naruto, shivered as he mentally imaged one of his senseis grinning at him like that. Minato still had more to say coughed loudly to grab back control of the room, as well as to quell the quiet ruckus that had sprang to life. This tournament will begin here in Konoha in exactly one month's time. This will give you time to hone some of your skills, as well as give the cages and daimyos proper time to travel. You may stay here to train or return to your home village, but know that if you are late you are automatically disqualified, no matter how much potential you may have. Timing is essential in the shinobi world. Good luck to you all. With that Minato had vanished in a yellow flash, leaving the genin who had not seen the technique in awe. He did that on purpose. Naruto groaned silently and walked away clearly not impressed like the other genin that were not blood relatives of him. Naruto was aware of the few pairs of eyes that were on him as he left, but he paid them no mind. He was tired of being around so many people. He needed his solitude. Narumi and Naomi planned to follow them, but were quickly confronted by Shikamaru, Ino and Choji who asked them if they wanted to go and try to find teammate. The sisters looked over to where Naruto was walking and found nothing sighing as they nodded their heads. Naruto walked down the streets with his hands buried inside the pockets of his zip-up vest, quickly closing in on his apartment. That was when a wonderful aroma invaded his nostrils that forced the young Ichiha to halt mid-stride. Turning to his left, Naruto looked upon one of his most favorite places in Konoha, Ichiraku Ramen. Naruto paused his journey and started to slowly approach the ramen restaurant. I guess I can treat myself before diving into the deep end with my training. Naruto walked past the hanging cloth that gave the stand some privacy and silently sat there as Tucci started to make some ramen. Naruto cleared his throat, gaining the ramen maker's attention. Tucci paused the making of his next batch of ramen and turned around his polite smile already in place for the customer to feel more welcomed. Hello, how may? Oh Naruto my boy how are you doing? The old man asked his favorite customer who he hadn't seen in a while, to which Naruto gave him an apologetic smile. Well I have been very busy as of late. Naruto started off only to have a bowl of Maizo Raymond slid across the counter. Naruto blinked and looked up questioningly where he met Tucci already motioning for him to start eating. Naruto nodded with a grateful smile on his usually stoic face. Breaking open the chopsticks Naruto uttered a quick thank you before he dug into his hot food. Naruto sighed in pleasure as he swallowed his first bite. So good. Ad, did I hear you say Naruto? A more feminine voice asked from in the kitchen section of the Raymond stand. Soon the owner of the voice am, the Raymond maker's daughter emerged from the kitchen. Her face lit up upon seeing Naruto sitting there in the stool. Wasting no time she took off at a speed that would leave a tune in green with envy and lock Naruto in a warm embrace. Thankfully Naruto emptied his first bowl, so am's rather sudden action only rattled the empty bowl. Naruto let out a small grunt, but managed to keep himself perched atop the small stool, despite AM's weight crashing against him. AM eventually released a young Yuzumaki from her exuberant hug and stared at him expectantly. Where have you been, mister? Naruto's whole body screamed danger as he gulped down the lump in his throat. AM had a hand on her hip and a ladle in her other hand that accompanied with a stern look on her face, reminded him of the older sister he saw her as. Naruto thought about escaping, but knew that would only make the civilian girl even angrier than she was now. Naruto decided to bite the bullet and tell them the truth of what he had been doing. Naruto then went on to explain how he had been placed on his own team and had to take an influx of missions to fulfill the requirements needed to participate in the Chunin exams. Naruto then told them of what he had experienced during his last trip into the forest of death. Tucci nodded his head since he had heard many things about a shinobi's way of life from idle chatter at his establishment. AM still looked doubtful, but in the end relented, only giving Naruto a warning about what she would do if he disappeared ever again. By the end of the talk Naruto had a newfound fear of cast iron pots. Two days after stage 2, Kanoha. Look at all these insignificant worms smiling at me. Just their looks make me want to empty my stomach. Naruto said to himself as he ignored the smiling elders who would walk by him and the few times they waved Naruto directly frowned at them, to which they shrugged it off as a young man having a bad day. You should let me destroy them then Ninjin. I won't devour them because they will leave a bad taste but destroy. That I can do. Kaiubi voiced his opinion no doubt with a very menacing smirk on his face. Naruto thought about it for a few moments before sighing and shaking his head negatively. I can't do that otherwise I'd have the Hokage and the council on my head. Don't worry once your chakra returns you shall be allowed to stretch your legs Kaiubi. 
Naruto assured his tailed beast as he continued to walk calmly down the street. Naruto's forward progress was stopped when a shadow overtook his body, making Naruto look up to see what it was that was stopping him. The man in front of him was dark-skinned and had a muscular build that could make him seem very imposing. The man's right shoulder contained the kanji for iron and a bull's horn was tattooed on his left cheek. The man wore oval-shaped sunglasses and a typical kumo flak jacket, but this one only went over one shoulder. The man had a red rope belt around his waist and a white scarf around his neck. The man carried seven swords with him, and Naruto could tell by his presence that the man was no joke. Hachibi. And now it all made sense because in front of him stood the Jinchuriki of the eight-tailed octopus ox or an Ushioni. This was the man who had managed to gain perfect control of his tailed beast to the point where he could transform willingly into the Hachibi while still remaining in control. These feats were what earned him the title of the perfect Jinchuriki and one of the world's most dangerous shinobi. Naruto was curious as to why this man stopped him for no reason it would seem. How may I help you Kumo Shinobi? Naruto asked blankly as he took a step back to put some space between him and his fellow container for safety's purposes. No, no, that won't do mister. Nine, you have to call me Hachibi-sama and we will be all fine. Killer B sang in a horrendous rap that made a few bystanders who heard it face plant due to the sheer terribleness. Naruto's eyes narrowed at the larger man for his annoying speaking pattern and silently hoped that it was a one-time thing. I can't believe this. You are an idiot B. Not only did you give out the fact that we are Jinchuriki, but you also made yourself look like an idiot, which makes me look like an idiot. The eight-tailed Ushioni shouted in anger and disbelief at his aspiring rapper of a container. Hachibi why you gotta hate, my rapping skill is of the highest rate. That's not going to happen. Naruto stated plainly as he looked into B's sunglasses with an impassive gaze. I take back my thoughts from earlier. Sure he may be powerful, but he is also a joke. Naruto mused to himself while silently thanking Kami for not putting him around the eccentric foreigner, in some off chance he had found Naruto while off on a mission or something like that. Ninja and I have never been more happy than I am now that I was sealed into you instead of that idiot. Kaiubi could only imagine what his brother had to go through having to listen to that incessant form of speech each and every moment. Pool you better respect my rapping skills so mean before I knock your head off clean. Then you won't be so preen. Killer B took a more aggressive tone of voice as it always did when someone outside of his brother or the Hachibi insulted his passion. Naruto quickly discerned the threat in the man's idiot speak and tensed himself in case the larger tan man tried to attack him. B what are you doing threatening this boy? He is the Hokage's son and any fight will draw all of Konoha's forces down on you. My help or not you can't beat them on your own. Pillar B's eyes widened behind his glasses when he realized what that meant and if he did not die then his brother would surely give him his iron claw. B managed to keep a grimace from flooding his face at the phantom pain of his brother's cloth pain. B looked back at Naruto who was prepared to fight if need be, then B started to laugh which confused Naruto leading him to question Kumo Nin's sanity. Sorry about that yo, I am just going to go. B said quickly before hurrying past Naruto muttering a few things Naruto didn't quite catch. Naruto slowly turned around to make sure that the Kumagakur Jinchuriki was actually going to leave and not attack him from behind. Naruto watched as he spoke aloud while waving his hands around in weird gestures. The people on the street cleared to one of the sides hoping to avoid catching whatever was wrong with the rapping man. Naruto resisted the urge to palm his face when he saw the man pull out a book labeled Rhymes and began to write in the book. Naruto released a breath in an attempt to forget the strange encounter with Kumo's killer bee. Ninjin, if you ever begin speaking like that I will personally rip this seal away and slowly skewer you with each and every one of my claws. Kaiubi warned Naruto as he glared at the space killer B once occupied trying to forget what he just heard. Naruto nodded his head since that would be something Naruto would fully support. You have nothing to fear Kaiubi for if I ever begin to rhyme my words purposefully, then I will gladly present my Sharingan to you to crush. Naruto promised to never be such an idiot and if he was then he would gladly visit the Shinigami. Now that is over I need to begin my training for the Chunin exam finals. It is best to use the Shunshin there to avoid any more useless confrontations. Naruto held a single hand sign, and soon his body exploded in black crow feathers, shocking the civilians who were passing by. Naruto reformed from a murder of crows inside of the study inside of the apartment complex he had come to own in the red light district. I don't see why you feel the need to train more just for the runs in these exams of yours. The Kaiubi had not had to train in something for centuries, so the idea of training was out of his realm of understanding. Naruto sighed as he sat behind his desk pulling out a book and putting it on the desk. I am not training for the other participants per se. I am continuing to train so I will not be overtaken by any unforeseen threat that may come this way. Getting no response from the massive chakra sealed inside of him, Naruto looked at the book that he placed on the desk. The book's bindings were a deep crimson color, with a purple Yuzumaki swirl emblazoned on the front cover. 
Naruto had meant to take a look at the book ever since he had claimed it, but with all of the work he had on his plate never got the chance. The first hundred pages or so were a general history, as well as some first-hand accounts of a few events in history. There was something that made Naruto glance down at himself, but he mentally pushed that back in favor of reading more of his book. Naruto skimmed through another 50 or so pages until something caught his interest so much so that he had momentarily let go of the book to try and comprehend what he had just read. Taking a deep breath Naruto read over the information once again and found that he was not mistaken in what he had read. Something like that even possible. Naruto questioned more to the air than anything else. The Kaiubi who was reading through Naruto's eyes was also quite surprised by what he had read. It seems unlikely, but with things like that you never know until you try. Kaiubi admitted with some amount of respect for what was accomplished in some of the things done in the book. Naruto nodded his head and began to read with a new sense of purpose in his azure eyes. Near the borders of the land of fire and earth, what are we going to do about this sensei? A man with charcoal black eyes asked while staring down at the piece of paper that was resting on the counter between the two cloaked figures. If the information on the paper was accurate then what may happen could be very disconcerting to say the least. I know you wanted to visit the Chunin exams to check on our students, but these reports, if true, are quite concerning. A sharp voice said before taking a sip from his cup of tea, getting a nod from the person next to him. The man's yellow eyes stared ahead at the road which was now muddy with the rain. I agree with Sensei. As much as I would like to see his progress since he has left our tutelage, we need to check on these rumors. A softer yet equally serious voice replied as the owner looked up into the dark sky from under the small travel station they were resting at. These two men who were sipping tea were two of Naruto's three senseis, Dracula Mehek and Itachi Ichiha. Both men were making their way back to Konoha with all intent on checking up on Naruto, but a certain piece of information altered those plans. The report from one of Mehek's informants read of two men who were wearing black cloaks adorned by red clouds. While not as large as Jiraiya's spy network, Mehek's was just as effective when he needed to know something. What bothered the hawk-eyed swordsman was who was underneath those cloaks. From the report they were given, Itachi and Mihik had only just missed the two shinobi who were in the center of the report. It seems that we will need to visit Tsuchi no Kuni once more, Itachi. Are you ready to go? Mihik asked seemingly not even bothered by the seasonal downpour that was currently soaking the area. Itachi nodded his head slightly, and with that the two traveling shinobi paid for their drinks and walked out into the rain wearing white cloaks with a deep green stripe bisecting the cloak. One week after stage 2, Kanoha, Naruto was sitting in the center of training ground 7, having just finished going through the katas for his sword style. It was something Mifune had instilled into the young swordsman's head. Mifune would always say that to keep one's blade as sharp as their mind, practice was always needed or else the skills attained would deteriorate. Naruto knew the katas could only take him so far, so he asked Niko if she could spar with him once a week. Yugao agreed since with the finals right around the corner, all Anbu who were not on long-term missions were given leave so they could keep the village's safety uncompromised. They had already been spared once and Naruto could see how happy Yugao was to actually have a duel with someone. Naruto and Yugao both knew that the number of skilled swordsmen in Konoha could be counted on one hand. Naruto knew of only one proficient with a blade besides Yugao and his name was Hei Jeko. Naruto recalled that when he mentioned that name Yugao would tense momentarily but Naruto did not pry. Naruto had been forced to train in his basement while working on his ninjutsu due to the prying eyes of the village. Naruto was thankful Mihik had taught him how to use reinforcement seals, otherwise the whole complex would have collapsed down on him during his first training session. Naruto opened his eyes feeling five new presences on the training ground that was just empty aside from him. Naruto's blank eyes found themselves staring at Minato, Kishina, Narumi, Naomi and Jiraiya. Naruto slowly reached for Twilight which was lying on the grass next to him before standing up. What is it? Naruto already knew the answer, but decided it was best to be civil with a man who could control his entire shinobi career. Kishina sighed sadly at her son's distant behavior which deep down she knew herself to be the cause of. Naruto looked at the group waiting for any of them to answer his question. Kishina was the first to act and pointed at the large man with white hair who was holding an equally large scroll in one arm. The pervert and the rest of us would like for you to sign the toad contract. Kishina said hopeful this could be a chance for her to finally start to make amends with her wayward son. That was the sentiment shared by each person in their little group, yet sadly Naruto still wouldn't even smile at them. He looked at them like he was looking at an enemy, and to him they may as well be. Gireya scoffed at the redhead's words, and some weird music began to play confusing everyone minus Minato and Naruto. I am no mere pervert Kishina. I am the world's greatest pervert. I am a super pervert. The music came to a climax with a loud trumpet sound, and then the field was deathly quiet, with each person looking at the toad sage. Minato had just face palmed at his sensei's less than desirable behavior. Kishina and her daughters were glaring bloody murder at the self-proclaimed world's greatest pervert. 
Naruto just stared at the toad like he would any other time they had encountered each other. Naomi spoke before Naruto could even manage to respond with a reply of his own. Yen Ai san you should sign the Aero Idiots contract so that we can all train together. The excitable redhead said with a shimmer of hope in her eyes at the thought of having her big brother back. Narumi smiled at her sister already knowing her wish was the same as Naomi's wish, though Narumi just couldn't see Naruto as a brother anymore it didn't feel right. Naruto was something else to her, he was like an engine that wouldn't stop, and that belief was only furthered when she read that letter all those years ago. Naruto's impassive blue eyes softened for a moment as he looked at his sister who looked back imploringly. Back when he was a child Naruto would easily blame his sister for his suffering, but as he grew he realized that her actions were not meant to hurt him. She was just acting like any child who would want attention from their parents. I can't sign the toad contract for I have already signed a contract with the crows and their leader. Naruto replied easily since it was the truth and he had no desire to break the gift given to him by Itachi. Minato smiled at his son since he already knew that and had come up with a plan just in case Naruto had said that. That's fine Naruto. We already spoke with Gamabunta and he said he had no problem if you signed the contract to go along with yours. All you have to do is clear it with the head of the crows. The rest of the group nodded since it was not easy to get the prideful toad to agree to share a summoner with a species he saw as inferior, not that they would tell Naruto he said that. I still must decline for I have already discussed this with the leader of the crows and he has agreed, but only with the summon animal I am naturally aligned with, which I have yet to discover what it is. Naruto explained calmly as he looked up into the sky and saw a shadow flicker over the sun briefly, but showed no visible reaction to the anomaly. Ashina nodded in understanding since she realized pushing Naruto only made him push back much harder. The four holders of the toad contract however, were showing varying levels of disappointment with Naruto's decision to decline the contract. Iraya and all his pride could not believe that Naruto could turn down a chance to align himself with the toads, but also by proxy turn down being trained by the fabled toad sage. Kid there are a million people who would kill to be offered what I just offered you. This is your chance to train under my wing and become something feared. Ureya explained seriously as he stared into Naruto's glacial eyes with a questioning glint in his eyes. Naruto just stared right back with the only notable facial reaction was the slight downward twitch of his lips. Perhaps you are right however I am not one of those so-called millions. I can achieve what I need to without your help. That goes for you as well Kishina, Minato. You have nothing I wish to learn. Not the Rasengan or even the Horatian. Now if you will excuse me I have something that needs my attention. Naruto then disappeared beneath a shroud of falling crow feathers, leaving the five shinobi there speechless. With good reason too since it was not every day that someone refused to learn some of the most feared in the world. But Naruto was far from normal. Gurahain Forest. Naruto opened his now Sharingan red eyes as he looked around the area he found himself transported to. Naruto knew this place to be Kurahain Forest, which was the home of the crow summons. This place was only known to the crows as well as Naruto. Not even Itachi knew of this place because he had declined to train further with his summons, content with using them solely for his illusions. On Naruto's first visit he questioned the crow patriarch why he was unable to deactivate his. The head crow informed Naruto that the spiritual energy in the forest was so great that Naruto would find it impossible to deactivate his Sharingan. Naruto gazed out at the boundary that separated the forest of the crows and another forest, and the difference couldn't be any more prominent. The forest Naruto was looking at was lush and vibrant and overall bustling with life. Kurahane on the other hand looked like a desolate land rather than a forest, but that was by design. The trees were nothing more than decaying bark structures devoid of life, while the dirt was a dark grey with no nutrients to support the trees. This marked the land and told other species to stay away. Naruto knew that the areas adjacent to Kurahane forest were what fed the crows. Naruto walked calmly deeper into the dead forest as the moon that always shone down on the forest illuminated his path. Another curious thing about the forest was that there was no daytime, just night. The moon was infused with more spiritual energy than was the sun, so it always illuminated the forest. Thanks to the great amounts of spiritual energy saturating the air, the forest was also kept warm by the essence of the energy. Basically over time the forest adapted itself to have no need for the sun, something Naruto found fascinating. Naruto finally found what he was looking for, living trees in the dead woods. These trees were where the crows lived in the forest because unlike the other trees they were alive and certainly thriving. The crows were not a very large clan in comparison to the other summons, but they were extremely close-knit to each other and their summoner. That was what Naruto valued the most was their loyalty, something he had been deprived of during his childhood. There were a total of 20 living trees clustered in one area of Kurahane Forest, each of which were unique thanks to the pigmentation of their leaves. These trees were not normal however, each tree was the size of Konoha's Hokage Monument in both height and width. Naruto continued on towards the great tree that was in the center of the 20-tree cluster that was specialized thanks to its gray leaves. 
Naruto waved to a few of the smaller crows, who had yet to learn how to speak, while giving a few of the older crows a respectful nod. Naruto walked into the tree that was hollowed out with stairs created for this very purpose. Naruto climbed up to the top where a rather large crow was perched high above the forest floor. The crow was wearing samurai armor from the Edo period that covered his wings and body. The armor was a deep blue almost purple. This was the head of all crows, Shikei. You have called for me Shikei-san. Naruto asked his boss to calmly refuse to bow like he did every time he had visited the head of the murder. At first this led to a very tense situation, but Naruto cleared that up by saying being submissive did not equal respect it showed fear. After that Naruto had earned the large crow's respect and was never asked to bow before him again. The crow opened his void black eyes and stared down his summoner who to his credit showed no sign of discomfort from being examined so crucially. The crow flapped his wings once and let out an ear-rattling caw. Yes I have Naruto. I believe this is the right time for you to bond yourself with one of the young crows so that they may become your familiar in the future. The old crow's voice was a tad on the shrill side yet still held a tremendous amount of power behind it. Naruto let his eyes widen momentarily in surprise but nodded his head. The first time Naruto was told of this process, Naruto questioned when he could perform it but was told that all would work itself out in time. For every year a human grows, we shinobi crows grow too, so your new partner will soon be able to assist you. Now there are a number of suitable candidates you may choose fr. Shikei was cut off when the leaves above their heads started to rustle violently and a few weak caws were heard. Not a moment later a small crow came crashing in through the grey leaves, heading straight for a painful collision. Naruto Sharingan quickly deciphered the path the crow was going to take and quickly leapt up and caught the crow against his torso. Shikei looked irritated at being interrupted by one of the young ones, but that look was erased by the look on Naruto's face. What is Naruto? The old crow's natural protective instinct soon took over the irritation. There is quite a deep gash on this young one's underbelly. Naruto said and without looking up at Shikei, Naruto activated the mystic palm technique and began to close up the wound. Now while not being a veterinarian, Naruto was able to close up wounds like this one without much of a problem it just took longer than a trained professional. The crow opened its eyes when the pain subsided and looked up to see Naruto smiling at her. There you are, little one, all better now. Naruto said smiling as he gave the crow her chance to fly off, but to Naruto's surprise, she just hopped onto his head and sat there in his black locks. Naruto looked up with a smile and gently ran one of his fingers along the top of the crow's head, gently earning a happy cough from her. I think I have found the one I would like to create a bond with. Naruto informed Shikei with a smile as the crow jumped down and perched herself on Naruto's left shoulder. Shikei nodded with a small smile as he looked at the two interacting with each other. Shikei recognized the red stripe on the young crow's bottom beak as the mark of one of the great warrior clans. Her father was the last of the subsection of the clan that retired from the active army and settled down with a non-combative crow. This was their daughter who Shikei knew would reach great places with the right partner and hopefully Naruto was that partner. Okay Naruto that is fine. To complete the soul link the young one on your arm must ingest a drop of your blood. The spiritual essence in your blood will then link your two souls. The bond will only break in the event that one of you should perish. Naruto nodded his head and bit down on his thumb hard enough to break his skin. Naruto positioned his thumb over the crow's mouth allowing her to drink his blood. The Kaiubi quickly healed the wound and Naruto felt the tip of one of Shikei's wing on his head and the tip of the other and the young crow. Secret crow art. Soul link. Naruto felt that something inside of him was reaching out for something to connect to and when he thought it wouldn't work, he felt a surge go through his body. So this is what it feels like to be linked. Naruto heard a feminine voice from his side and turned to look at the crow with a raised eyebrow. The crow looked right back at Naruto with her own black eyes before Naruto finally spoke. Can you talk? Naruto asked curiously since only moments ago all he could hear from her was like any other crow. His question seemed to amuse his new familiar if her giggling was any indication. Of course I can. I have always been able to, but only other crows and those we have been linked with can understand us. My name is Susei by the way Naruto. Naruto was about to reply when he saw something that made him pause in his tracks. Susei's previously empty black eyes changed to a burning red and slowly three Tomo filled each eye. Naruto blinked a few times as did Susei who saw her eyes reflected in Naruto's headband. Needless to say neither Naruto nor Susei knew what was going on or why she now had the Sharingan. Ah so it seems like the blood from your body has changed Susei as well, how interesting. Since Itachi had never linked with a crow this is the first time a link had been formed at all, especially with a shinobi with a Naruto paused and analyzed the situation as well, and that was the best and only explanation that even made sense. Now then why don't you two go back to Konoha and get acquainted with each other? Off you go Shu. Then came the simultaneous reply of Naruto and Susei. Stupid bag of feathers. As they were brought back to Konoha the old crow broke into a fit of laughter. They are perfect for each other. 
Translations, Gurahane Blackwing, Chikay Executioner, Susay Comet. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video, turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.